A happy good morning, good morning to one and all present here. I welcome you all to the day two of the International Conference on Dentistry and Oral Health on 7th and 8th December 2022. Virtual mode of conference organized by Asia Pacific Association for Dental and Oral Health. Associated with Saraswati Dental College and Hospital Lucknow, India, Savita Dental College and Hospital, India, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute, India. I would like to welcome all our honorable dignitaries. I would like to welcome our keynote speakers, Dr. Samuel Olivan, Director of Periodontics and Implant Program, Lasley University, Professor, University San Pablo, CEU, Marait, Spain. Our second keynote speaker, Dr. El Sheikh Yazar Mohammad, Professor of Plastic and Carniomaxillofacial Surgery, Faculty of Medicine and Menofia University, Egypt. Dr. David Guzman Abru, Professor, Director of Kapil Dental Academy, Mexico, ICOI Promoter, Mexico. Dr. G. Karthik Ayan, Professor, Savita Dental College and Hospital, Tamil Nadu, India. Dr. Jamie Kapil, Co-Director, Kapil Dental Academy, Pri Private Practice in Aesthetic Dentistry and Oral Spain. Dr. Roberto Caridu, Clinical Supervisor, Department of Endodontics, Trinity College, Dublin, Ireland. Dr. Mohammad Hamad Abad Allah Ghazi, Professor and Chairman of Fixer Prostodontics Department, Faculty of Dentistry, University of Mansoura, Mansoura, Egypt. I would like to welcome our guest speakers. Dr. Manish Kumar, Professor, Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute, Rajasthan, India. Dr. Karpagavalli Shanmugachundaram, Professor and Head Department of Oral Medicine and Radiology, Seema Dental College and Hospital, HNB, Garval University, Jammu and Kashmir, India. 
ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಶ್ರೀಶಕ್ತಿ ಡಿ ಅಸೋಸಿಯೇಟ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಪಬ್ಲಿಕ್ ಹೆಲ್ತ್ ಡೆಂಟಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಸವಿತಾ ಡೆಂಟಲ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ನೌ ಐ ವುಡ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಟು ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಅವರ್ ಸೆಷನ್ ಚೇರ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಡೇ ಟು ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಸಂದೀಪ್ ಕುಮಾರ್ ಡೈರೆಕ್ಟರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಪ್ರಿನ್ಸಿಪಲ್ ಸುರೇಂದ್ರ ಡೆಂಟಲ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಅಂಡ್ ರಿಸರ್ಚ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಟ್ ರಾಜಸ್ಥಾನ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ರಾಜನೀಶ್ ಅಹರ್ವಾಲ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಪ್ರಾಸ್ಥೆಡಾನಿಟಿಕ್ಸ್ ಸುರೇಂದ್ರ ಡೆಂಟಲ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಅಂಡ್ ರಿಸರ್ಚ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಟ್ ರಾಜಸ್ಥಾನ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಸುರುಚಿ ಜುನೇಹ ಸುಕೀಜಾ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಹೆಡ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಪೀಡಿಯೋಟಾನಿಟಿಕ್ಸ್ ಪ್ರಿವೆಂಟಿವ್ ಡೆಂಟಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಸುರೇಂದ್ರ ಡೆಂಟಲ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಅಂಡ್ ರಿಸರ್ಚ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಟ್ ರಾಜಸ್ಥಾನ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಎ ವಸಂತ ಕುಮಾರಿ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹೆಡ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಪೀಡಿಯೋಟಾನಿಟಿಕ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಪೆನೆಟ್ರೇಟಿವ್ ಡೆಂಟಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಆದಿಪರಾಶಕ್ತಿ ಡೆಂಟಲ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹಾಸ್ಪಿಟಲ್ ತಮಿಳುನಾಡು ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಮನ್ನು ಬತ್ರ ಅಸೋಸಿಯೇಟ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಪ್ರಿವೆಂಟಿವ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಕಮ್ಯುನಿಟಿ ಡೆಂಟಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಸುರೇಂದ್ರ ಡೆಂಟಲ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಅಂಡ್ ರಿಸರ್ಚ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಟ್ ರಾಜಸ್ಥಾನ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ರಜನಿ ಅಹರ್ವಾಲ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹೆಡ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಪೀರಿಯೋಡಾನಿಟಿಕ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಇಂಪ್ಲಾಂಟಾಲಜಿ ಸುರೇಂದ್ರ ಡೆಂಟಲ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಅಂಡ್ ರಿಸರ್ಚ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಟ್ ರಾಜಸ್ಥಾನ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಈನಲ್ ಭಾಮ್ರಿ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಆರ್ಥೋಡಾನಿಟಿಕ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಡೆಂಟೋಫಿಷಿಯಲ್ ಆರ್ಥೋಪೆಡಿಕ್ಸ್ ಸುರೇಂದ್ರ ಡೆಂಟಲ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಅಂಡ್ ರಿಸರ್ಚ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಟ್ ರಾಜಸ್ಥಾನ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಮರೀನಾ ಲೆಕ್ಚರರ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಪ್ರೋಸ್ಥೋಡಾನಿಟಿಕ್ಸ್ ಸವಿತಾ ಡೆಂಟಲ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹಾಸ್ಪಿಟಲ್ ತಮಿಳುನಾಡು ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಕಾರ್ತಿಕ್ ರಾಜ್ ಎಸ್ ಎಂ ಲೆಕ್ಚರರ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಪೀರಿಯೋಡಾನಿಟಿಕ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಇಂಪ್ಲಾಂಟಾಲಜಿ ಸವಿತಾ ಡೆಂಟಲ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹಾಸ್ಪಿಟಲ್ ತಮಿಳುನಾಡು ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಲಾವಣ್ಯ ಪ್ರತಾಪ್ ಅಸೋಸಿಯೇಟ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಅನಟಾಮಿ ಸವಿತಾ ಡೆಂಟಲ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹಾಸ್ಪಿಟಲ್ ತಮಿಳುನಾಡು ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಆರ್ ಗಾಯತ್ರಿ ದೇವಿ ಅಸೋಸಿಯೇಟ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಸೈಕಾಲಜಿ ಸವಿತಾ ಡೆಂಟಲ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹಾಸ್ಪಿಟಲ್ ತಮಿಳುನಾಡು ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಕವಿಯರಸಿ ರೇಣು ಲೆಕ್ಚರರ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಬಯೋಕೆಮಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಸವಿತಾ ಡೆಂಟಲ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹಾಸ್ಪಿಟಲ್ ತಮಿಳುನಾಡು ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಶಂಕರ್ ಗಣೇಶ್ ಲೆಕ್ಚರರ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಮೈಕ್ರೋಬಯಾಲಜಿ ಸವಿತಾ ಡೆಂಟಲ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹಾಸ್ಪಿಟಲ್ ತಮಿಳುನಾಡು ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಆರ್ತಿ ಬಾಲಸುಬ್ರಹ್ಮಣ್ಯಂ ರೀಡರ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಪಬ್ಲಿಕ್ ಹೆಲ್ತ್ ಡೆಂಟಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಸವಿತಾ ಡೆಂಟಲ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹಾಸ್ಪಿಟಲ್ ತಮಿಳುನಾಡು ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಮೇಬಿನ್ ಜಾರ್ಜ್ ಮ್ಯಾಥ್ಯೂ ಲೆಕ್ಚರರ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಪೀಡಿಯಾಟ್ರಿಕ್ ಡೆಂಟಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಸವಿತಾ ಡೆಂಟಲ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹಾಸ್ಪಿಟಲ್ ತಮಿಳುನಾಡು ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ರವೀಂದ್ರ ಕುಮಾರ್ ಜೈನ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹೆಡ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಆರ್ಥೋಡಾನಿಟಿಕ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಡೆಂಟೋಫಿಷಿಯಲ್ ಆರ್ಥೋಪೆಡಿಕ್ಸ್ ಸವಿತಾ ಡೆಂಟಲ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹಾಸ್ಪಿಟಲ್ ತಮಿಳುನಾಡು ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ನವನೀತ್ ಕೌರ್ ರೀಡರ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಪೀರಿಯೋಡಾನಿಟಿಕ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಓರಲ್ ಇಂಪ್ಲಾಂಟಾಲಜಿ ನ್ಯಾಷನಲ್ ಡೆಂಟಲ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹಾಸ್ಪಿಟಲ್ ದೇರಾಬೇಸಿ ಮೊಹ ಮೊಹಲಿ ಪಂಜಾಬ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ತಾರುಲತಾ ಶಯ ಶಯಗಲಿ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಆರ್ಥೋಡಾನಿಟಿಕ್ಸ್ ಡೆಂಟೋಫಿಷಿಯಲ್ ಆರ್ಥೋಪೆಡಿಕ್ಸ್ ಎಂ ಆರ್ ಅಂಬೇಡ್ಕರ್ ಡೆಂಟಲ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹಾಸ್ಪಿಟಲ್ ಕರ್ನಾಟಕ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ next we move on to the keynote presentation now i would like to welcome our keynote speaker dr samuel alivan director of periodontics and implant program lasley university
of the patient. Harmony and stability in our treatments means our relations between what we call pink and white aesthetics. It is tissue and dental prothesis. Tissue managed is one of the most important factor, of course, in contemporary dentistry. And we will talk about tissue manager. Uh, we have hard tissue, soft tissues, and they must be in combination and they must be working all together, hard tissue, soft tissue, and the prothesis. In our treatment, we always need to achieve some objectives. These are hard tissue stability and soft tissue stability. It will give us long-term aesthetic and functional success. I want to show you the, the case of this patient. He comes into my office for a consultation because he, he has a, 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 a tooth. Uh, it, it's hard when, when he chews. And this is what we find when we did a CBCT x-ray. This is the situation. The patient has two endodontic molar that are filing. And that molar require extraction. But if we see the x-ray, we see he also had the third molar included. And it is in a very compromised position. So we carry out the, the removal of the three molar. And this is the situation we found, a huge bone defect. So here at that point, we must consider how to maintain the volume of the bone crest. But what we know about the abolar crest? We know that in a period of the six to 12 months, the horizontal reduction of the crest is five to seven millimeters. That means that could be the 50% uh, of the initial width. Most of these things uh, occur by the fourth month. And this horizontal loss is accompanied by a vertical resorption of the two to four millimeter. And the literature says that the vertical chains are greater if the multiple extractions are made in a section than in a single extraction. The resorption results in a reduction of, in the alveolar bone. So, the bone has decreased significantly in the, in the orifacial width. And this is in conflict with the fundamental requirement in surgery that the implants have to be placed in the correct position, the terminally protesically. Because we know that prerequisites for a successful treatment is the implant have to be placed with a primary stability and successfully integrates into the bone in a position determined by the prothesis. So at that point, grafting process to augment the bone are often necessary to ensure the implants are completely covered with, uh, with the bone. So it was the situation where we were in, where we did all the, all the extractions, or the, the extraction of the three molars. And this is the situation we would like to be in where we are all, all done. So let's see how we, we could do it and how we have managed all the, all the situation. We know to do a guide bone regeneration, it requires uh, a space for a blood clot and that, that, that space has to be protected, has to be established, organized and replaced. And it is based on the placement of a membrane to create that space. This space will promote the renovation of the new tissue, favoring the colonization of the clot by bone cells, and avoiding the participation of the epithelium and the connective cells. Here, the biomaterials uh, we have used as the space maintainers were autologous bone and xenograph. So we fill up all, all the alveolar crest with all biomaterials with autologous bone and mixes with xenograph. 
And now we have to place an, a barrier and what we know about the bar as barriers. The barriers, classically, they have been classified as rest variables and no rest variable membranes. TV membranes or PTTVF membranes, we know they are more complicated to use. And in the other hand, we have two collagen membranes, but the collagen membranes, the reception time, might, maybe it's not enough to, to do large, large to, to carry out the uh, large regeneration, big regenerations. Our normal collagen me membrane, standard collagen membranes, enough for cases like that with, with absorption time of the three months? Probably not. So in these cases, we used to, to work with non resonant membranes, with uh, PTF or, or T membranes. As I told you before, that they are much more difficult to handle, and they give have more complication in the in the surgeries, and the, or, or more problems after the surgery. We have we we, we have to work careful with uh, with the flaps. We have to uh, we are very careful with uh, with the tension, and it, it, it's more complicated what with, with this type of, of membranes. So it's in this point where the new age of, of, of membranes of the, that we call the new survival membranes arise. They were developed to prolong the duration of the barrier effect. Here in this photo, we can see a, a, a case where we carry out a bone regeneration. And six months later, at the time of the second surgery membrane, as you can see here, the, the, the membrane still remains on, on the bone. It's in these cases, like our case, with uh, such large bone defects, the slow reservoir membranes are an appropriate choice since they will maintain the barrier function long enough for all the biomaterials to transform into the bone. And this, we know these membranes combine the property of non resolvable membranes and resolvable membranes. Here, you know how we manage the, the, the flaps. Evidently, we know, it's to, we, we know that the primary closure is essential, and therefore it is essential to know how to handle the flaps to obtain this, this closure by, by virus intention. And here we have the healing six months after the first surgery at the time of the placing of the implant. We, we have a nice GPR, nice regeneration. Another, another picture from the crucial view and we can see the regeneration, the new bone, how, how it's bleeding. So it's, it's this type of bone is what we like to, to see after a, a, a big regeneration. So we consider now it's, it's, it's the time to, to place the implant and the implant have an, enough insertion torque. So it's, 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 that, that's what's great. And three months later, here the picture, how we are working in the second surgery. And here we can observe the complete restitution of the alveolar right. The, that's mean all the bone have been recovered and who, how we managed to reconstruct the, the entire alveolar press and the soft tissues. Here, we have the complete case from the initial to the final outcome and how we did working with this kind of, of new age of the mem membranes without T membranes or, or PTFF membranes working with a slow result of membranes. The result, it it's, looks great. Now I want to, to show you another, another case. Um, in which, as seen here in the CBCT, we have a lower premolar and it has an, an endodontic with a large apical lesion and with loss with loss of supporting supporting bone. Sorry. 
So we we'll start to see the, the video. We see the buccal probing and the loss of the bone. So we did extraction and we can see that the two have a vertical fracture. So we begin to clean all the, all the sockets, all the valves, and eliminates the, all the granulation tissue. We have to be careful to um, take our time to eliminate all the granulation tissue. And in order to see the, the bone defect perfectly, we, we open the flap with this vertical release here. A vertical chair in the measure. And we raise the flap to, to pull the legs. So it's in this way we can see all the bone, all the bone defect and all the regeneration area. At this point, we decide to place the implant in always in sockets like this. We we only place the implant if we can if we can place or 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 implant in a good position and it has a good primary stabilization. So I start to drill, it's the initial drill and the standard drilling protocol for this implant. And then we place the implant is, of course, uh, uh, a large implant, it's 13 millimeters, in order to achieve good, good stability as a factor we call it. Here, we see that the implant is in a good position, a greedy position, and we have a favorable bone defect for regeneration. In this case, we use a particular sonograph to fill the, the socket, the alveolus, until the, the defect is completely filled. This is a, a sonograph. So we fill completely the, the, the defect. And it's in this moment where I have measured um, and prepared my, my lower cerebral membrane. And I'm going to place it covering all the buccal plate. I like the membrane with a bigger than the defect, two millimeter bigger than the, the defect. And I put it through the lingual flap. And when it's com completely cover the, the defect, I'm, it's the time to make an incision to release the tension from the flaps in order to, to close it. Here, periodical incision. the tip of the blade, yeah. And now we have to fix the membrane. And to fix the membrane, we, we did, did this, this type of shooter. It's called periostical shooter that fix the membrane and adapts perfectly to the alveolar crest. That's where we go to the lingual flap. And then I bite the, the buccal flap, doing this cross. And when I close my shooter, it's at that perfect the membrane to the crest. Here, placing my membrane and closing the shooter. Mm. This is a a reservable shooter. Uh, 
and here the result with the adaptation in the membrane covering of the all the defect. Of course, we must be able to close the flaps without tension and make it this primary closure. And this is the radiographic after four months of healing, where we see the bone is regenerating and the implant now it's well integrated. Where here we see the bone is regenerating well and the implant it's 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 surrounded by by all or new new bone. And here I show you this picture when we did the second surgery and we can see the implant is completely surrounded by a new bone. It looks nice and healthy. So we are really happy with the result. We still can see the rest of the, the membrane on top of the, the bone. So it's it means that the this barrier keeps keeps stable for more than six months. And after we see the GVR, the bone reconstruction, another very, very, very important factor in, in, in our outcomes, in our treatments, another important factor to achieve a good and, and predictable lasting result are the soft tissue, the peri-implant tissues. They, they, they have a, a, a key role in, in, in aesthetics and they maintain on our long-term treatment. In terms of graph material selection, we have a lot of options, like connective tissue graph from the palate, done at the same time of the, of the implant place, like in this case. We have also rolling flaps. There are uh, pedicles from connective, they are coming from the palate and rotated. Or like this free general graph taken from the tuberosity done in the second surgery when with the halion caps are connected. And you can see here the result after it's three weeks after the, the, the first surgery. But we know many times we we have this typically situation. We have a helix seat, and we are able to to place the, the implant. When you open the flap, the the bone situation is, is perfect. You can place the implant without any any problem. But we have to do something to improve the the implant contours. Of course, we can go to one of the options we I've told you before the, the, the graph we can here in this situation we do on a rolling flap coming that comes from the palatal and it's in rotated to the vocal but it's in these situations but the possibility of substituting this type of connective tissue graph or other type of of, of of membranes that the collagen matrix is being studied. In the university, we are carrying out something studies in this way, and studies like, like this one of the of the group of the Italian group in which they perform a CBCT before their placement a, a, a collagen matrix and after healing, and they have these nice results. They they gain four or five millimeters, just placing the, the membrane with, with with any tissue graph. So there are uh, very nice results. This study, with, this with other studies, carry out such of the Stefanini group or the Smith or the of the group research of uh, Smith, where we see the same good results using this type of, of matrix. In, in soft tissue gains in, as, um, between two and four millimeter of gain that's placing the, the membrane. This is the way we are doing this, this, this type of, of treatment. 
here in this case, we see how we are using this matrix in case of horizontal defects or small fenestration instead of performing bone regenerations, big pressures, or using out oligos graph from, from the tuberosity or from the palata for patient. We prefer take this matrix and the matrix is folded and insert it between the flap and the bone. The flap is closed without tension and try that is not, not exposed. And here, finally, you have the, the result, how the perimplant contour are coming up and, uh, and they are gross and the result one year and three years after the, the surgery. Another case with the same protocol, doing exactly the, the same. Instead of performing regeneration with membranes on xenograph, we prefer take this matrix, this is a low resolver matrix. We, we, we insert between, we fold the, the matrix and insert between the flap and the and the bone. Do the the we shoot her without tension and and the result three months after we have a nice contours and peri implant contours and the gum looks looks nice. So I show you how we are working with with bone and to to do the, um, the GBR, uh, this the big regeneration, how we are working with this type of matrix instead of the using T methods or PFT methods. So they, they are more simple. We are trying to simplify as much as possible for pressures. Um, and yeah. And how we are working with uh, with the membranes in the soft tissue. So this is all. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you like it. Um, Regret from Spain. So here you have my Instagram. You can send me messages or whatever you want. And I'm happy to receive it. Thank you for your attention. Bye bye. Thank you so much, sir, for your informative presentation. Next, I would like to welcome Dr. David Guzman Abru, Professor, Director of Kapil Dental Academy, Mexico, ICOI Promoter, Mexico. We welcome you, sir. Over to you. Thank you. And hi to Samuel. Nice seeing you. Great presentation. Uh, I think I will have to share my screen. Okay. And okay, the today topics that I would like to uh, share with you is the guided surgery, a path to success. And I would like to pinpoint what is for me the the keys or the what we have to be really uh, careful when we choose and when we start uh, a guided surgery procedure. First of all, I would like to thank Apadento for inviting me, for having me here talking to you. Today is for me is, is uh, 9 p.m. a day before. So first, I would like to thank my family for always supporting me and being with me all the time, all the group of friends that we have been doing all, of all these years, um, training and sharing with uh, you uh, around the world. And of course, last but not least, my good friend, uh, Dr. Koppel from Spain, who is a really good uh, mentor and my dear friend. 
Let me see. Okay. As a quick brief, uh, the the I would like to tell what is the what we need to make a surgical guide. The first thing that we need to make a surgical guide it is a CBCT or a CT scan. It is preferable to have a CBCT, less radiation, and basically is what we are needing on these days. The second thing that we need is a digital impression. Impression can be made uh, intraoral, or we can send the mold, the cast mold to the lab, and they can digitalize our impression. The other thing that we need is a planning software, a software who allows to make uh, planning the implant and the position. And of course, we are going to be able to proceed and the fourth thing that I always mention, it is the 3D printer uh, that we're going to be able to print uh, our surgical guide. What are the, the pinpoints or what is the uh, things that we need to be aware when we are taking our DICOM, which is the file that we're gonna get from the CVCT? We need to capture all the teeth and all the anatomical structures. Um, the, the image has to be with an open bite. We need to remove all the metal items, all the metal items that are removable, of course. The patient should not move during the, the, the image taking and only when it's needed. And if the software uh, tells us to have a radiographic template. And this is what we are seeking for uh, regarding to the uh, CVCT, that we need to see all the structures. It is uh, really important to have. Uh, an open bite and we will see briefly how, what is the reason why is the reason they have an open bite we need to see all the anatomical structure especially where we're going to work uh, and that's how basically i asked for my cbct and why is that uh, the reason that we need to have all the anatomical structure that we're going to see a little bit later is Sometimes we get caught on the x-rays and the teeth are not fully uh, impressed or fully captured on the image. Also, we can see here on the jawbone that it was caught and tracing the nerve on this type of case is going to be really difficult. Also, difficult or uh, this case was impossible to capture, to trace the 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 nerve and uh the other thing that we need to be sure is that uh has the open bite uh therefore uh when we match the next step which is the uh, digital impression the sdl file the computer our our system will not have to think or overthink and we don't have to work more to have a match this is pretty much where, where a good uh, CVCT scan uh, looks, a DICOM file. And this is when the patient moves. I don't know if you can see on your screens that how you can trace uh, like uh, bright uh, parts from here that it tells me, and we need to identify when is the patient move or when we have a lot of that we call uh, artifacts or noises, that uh, is all the metals that we cannot remove, especially from the crowns. And this is the difference between uh, a good taking uh, CBCT and one that has the patient move during the take of the CBCT. So we have to uh, know the difference and be sure if we can make it better or is going to be taken as it is. This is one of the reasons that we have to 
have all the teeth and anatomical structure during the taking of the CBCT. And one of the reasons is that if you can see here, the teeth didn't come up uh, completely. And we were trying to match the SDL file to the, uh, the DICOM. It will not look, it will start showing uh, errors from the software. It, it can, you can see here, all the green uh, teeth on this software tells me that it's accurate and it's well matched. But when it starts changing color, it tells me that something has been wrong on the matching. And you can see here the outline. This is how it's cut from the taking it. And you can see that one, the few teeth are good, but not all of them. And all these uh, yellow, it depends on the color. You can see here the, the color table. And you can tell uh, which one is, is uh, accuracy match and which one are really off match. And what happened <clears throat> on this uh, situation is basically that uh, the, 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 the computer start to overthinking or to work more and we will need uh, more potential uh, computers to work on these cases. Then we can double check on a, on a sagittal cross um, cut and it is off. Even though the uh, impression is uh, uh, perfect, it is excellent, but once uh, we try to match the, the files, uh, it will not be set uh, properly. I think this is the time to abort and start over and diagnose or be sure where was the problem. If it is the SDL file, but in this case, we were sure it, was, it wasn't the SDL file, it was the DICOM. Uh, for the SDL file, which is the second part, the digital impression that I call, it is preferable to use. We can do it two ways, extraoral or intraoral. Um, we can uh, use, uh, preferable, I suggest to use uh, uh, any type of silicones, low distortion uh, material, and always cover at least three quarters of the arch. And I will tell you once that we go on the final uh, part of the, of the surgical guide, uh, why is the reason that I tell to impress at least three quarter of the arch? Uh, even if it is uh, extraoral or intraoral, there's not much uh, uh, things to talk about the, the impression. Uh, is that basically is that simple, but we need to be sure that we are having a good and an accurate uh, impression. On the SDL, we can see, and we have to be sure, some of the time we will see that it's not matching properly, but actually it does. We can, uh, sh we can see uh, some of the restoration that tells me that it's not uh, matching perfectly with uh, this outline, that is the blue line is the SDL. But uh, once that we pass over all around the, the matching, it shows that everything looks perfect. And I will show you in a minute uh, which one doesn't, when we have a problem, which one, how it looks when we have a problem. This is a case that it was, uh, the impression was taken uh, extra orally. And you can see all the red line is the STL file and everything is matching close to perfect except for this tooth. And we can say, oh, it's okay. It's the, the cross section that it doesn't allow, uh, allow us to see the line sitting perfectly. But when we double check and we will go uh, uh, space by space, we can see that everything is matching perfectly that is sitting uh, really accurate, except for one tooth, which is 
the last molar, the second molar in this case, and is part of where it's going to be sitting down our impression. The good thing is our colleague told me that he thought that uh, that the impression material got rid out of the, the impression tray. And that was the error that what is marking. And we were, we were able to take another impression and start over the trimming plan. Planning. Planning, there's plenty of software these days to do uh, uh, implant planning. Uh, some of them they have more uh, they have more uh, they're more easy to work with. Uh, it depends on 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 the company, but basically uh, they all can do the restoration planning. Uh, they have uh, many features or all the library of the different brands of implant. So. On these days, it doesn't really matter what part of the world, world that you are. Um, and the brands of the implants that you can get, uh, as long as you have a complete surgical guide for uh, a complete surgical guide kit for doing the surgery. Uh, there's some software they ask you to plan the the virtual crown first. There's some software that you can actually meal that crown. So I like to start uh, doing first my restoration, which is the crown, and then placing the implant. In this case, uh, it was is when I started doing uh, implant. This is a case a little bit old, and um, we just start planning the implant, and then. At the end, we we'll just plan to do uh, our crown. Now and day, I tell you to start planning the crown and then plan to place the implant. And uh, so you can see what is the best option that you have for placing the implant. But basically all the software has the same uh, uh, features and uh, you should, you should get a really good outcome planning a, uh, the crown before planning the placement of the implant. You can reduce the diameter of the implant, the length. There's many, many things that you can do. Uh, this is the one of the reasons uh, that, uh, that I suggest to, to, to have at least three quarters of the arch of uh, for planning the of the SDL file for the impression, because this way the guide it will be seated without uh, an extra hand or without uh, having uh, with more stability. That's the word. The more stability, and uh, this is one of the reasons that I tell the longest the the, the surgical guide it is uh, designed the best. Of course, we have to design more uh, verification windows that we call, which is all these uh, uh, holes that we are making on the, on the guide. And, but it's really simple and it's really uh, necessary to have uh, all this window to see if the, the guide is implant, uh, the guide is sitting uh, perfectly. I uh, would like to invite you all to our fourth uh, international meeting. It's going to be a live webinar. Uh, it will take place on the December the 16th. Uh, Dr. Corpel is uh, the, the head director of the, of the uh, uh, event. And if you can see here, you can see Dr. Olivan, uh, Dr. Piccini, who talked yesterday. So we've been lecturing and traveling for a while. So if you want to get more information, you can send us an email uh, to administracion at 
coupledental.com or you can find me on Facebook or Instagram as well. Uh, I would like to present this case. Um, I always like to uh, measure the tissue. There's two ways to do guided surgery. One that we have, uh, uh, one that we can have a, uh, an excisional incision, which means with a tissue punch, we remove the part of the tissue where the implant is going to be placed, or we can release a small flap. It also, it always depends on the amount of tissue that we have and what we're going to be needing at the end. I recommend always, as a pinpoint as well, to measure before you start, uh, before you make the decision uh, if you're going to make an excisional, uh, excisional incision with a tissue punch or you're just going to release a small flap. If the measurement is less than three millimeters, I suggest to open and release a flap. So in this case, we just open a flap and I always design my guys with this um, extra material in the area of the implant. So it helps me to hold my, um, my uh, flap just in case that I need to release a flap. A flap. Otherwise, it's going to be only a small hole here. And this helped me a lot during the surgery. Careful, when we have an extra uh, tool to do guided surgery, be uh, careful and be aware that the, this attachment is well seated before you start drilling. In this case, we make this small mistake and it wasn't directly, directly uh, to, the, to the sleeve, the, the metal sleeve. Therefore, the drilling was a little bit crooked. It could be one or two millimeters, but if we have a uh, limit uh, with the teeth next to it, we can damage a root. So we have to be really worried, I mean, really careful and be aware that, uh, that all the, uh, the, uh, the uh, tools are well seated and well placed. Also, this is another, um, another uh, window, verification window. I always suggest to have it uh, covering three sides of the teeth so we can be sure that is, the guide is sitting properly. And this is how the implants go. Uh, guided surgery, I always recommend to place the implant uh, through the guy, not freehand, because you can deviate at the end the implant, especially this type of implant uh, that is a self-cutting implant. You can deviate the final position of the implant and everything that we have done before, uh, you lose it at the end. You lose it once that you place the implant if it's not completely guided. This will be a fully guided uh, implant placement. Uh, in this case, the, the guide is not well seated because it was, it will release it to take the picture, but this guide was seated uh, properly when the implant was going in. For me, there's no limitation for doing uh, guided surgery. Uh, I can tell that this is another case that we do uh, uh, post extraction and immediate placement. So basically, we have no limitations to do uh, guided uh, surgery. I don't find the excuse up to today not to do guided if we have all the tools and everything in hand. It is, we know. Uh, can you silent the microphone, please? Thank you. Uh, we all know that there's a uh, plenty of uh, cases and um, 
and uh, we can always use a surgical guide to save us time and save and and leave us with more confidence at the end of the treatment. In this case, we plan to do uh, the guided surgery. I also leave this because I wasn't sure if we're going to release a flap. This is a, a, a fully guided case that we are uh, writing an article about it because this patient wants to have some veneers and, and it was uh, a multidisciplinary uh, treatment. So in this case, we also have this little uh, extra on the guide in case that we have to release a flap and you be able to hold it. And um, again, the guide that wasn't, doesn't look that it was uh, placed all together because we release it to take the picture. The implant is placed. And what I was telling, this is a type of Maryland that we pre-meal before we go ahead to do the surgery because we were planning to do immediate loading. I always uh, suggest to have a Maryland in case that we don't get the primary stability on the implant and we are able to, to uh, fix it to the teeth next to it and not load the implant. In this case, we're able, we start shaping our, our temporary, what was needed, and start to making the, the gum profile. And uh, we put the temporaries for what will, what will be the, um, the uh, veneers at the end. In conclusion, uh, I would like to tell that we need to understand what the software tells us. We need to understand that this line is not placed just to have a better color on the on the on the planning. Is the safe zone that we need uh, in order to place, place an implant. This uh, safe line can be uh, moved or can be. Uh, can be uh, positioned to your preference. I normally have it 1.5 up to two millimeters. So I know that I have enough bone on the buckle, on the palatal and all around uh, my implant. Not because they take it away. This, is, this uh, case was sent to me from a friend and told me, oh, do you think that this implant fits here? Well, it doesn't feel by uh, the biologically, biologically width is not good enough to receive this size of implant. So I will go with a smaller implant, but not because the safe zone was taken off, it's not necessary that is, that is not there. We need to add two millimeters and one where we add the two millimeters, it will not be bone to receive. Also, on this point, if we are doing our planning, we can change the size of the implants because we can tell, okay, this is a 4.2, we can uh, put a five millimeters. It depends on all our preference, but uh, be aware that the, uh, this is a radiographic, radiographic template and it was well seated. Everything we have to be careful and learn how to read our planning, uh, learn what our software is telling us. Learn like when the safe zone overpass the uh, grafting that we might going to have to open a flap, doing that graph as Dr. Uh, Olivan was telling us or uh, bone expansion. There's many ways that we can do on surgical guide. It is not necessary that we have to go fully guided and, and leave. We know here that we might have to um, add some bone, uh, graft some bone, some soft tissue. It depends on your preference. We need to understand also, and we need to know that uh, the density of the bone, the colors has a density. And he says, well, here will not be a good 
uh, primary stability to, to the bone. And that uh, position we can say we do uh, modifications or we do an extra thing to trying to gain. I like to use a lot, uh, I like to use the, the uh, compression kit to make a little bit more density of the bone, create more, uh, compact the bone so I can create more uh, primary stability for my implants. Uh, I don't know the timing. I don't know if I talk too fast, but I had only 20 minutes. So I was trying to tell you everything in that time. So thank you. And, um, and I think is that for me all. If you have any questions, Is there any questions to ask, doctor? Okay, thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful presentation. Um, next, I would like to welcome our next keynote speaker, Dr. G. Karthikeyan, professor and head academicians, Department of Periodontics, Savita Dental College and Hospital, Tamil Nadu, India. We welcome you, sir. Over to you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, recent protocols in the management of perimplantitis. As we all know, perimplantitis is a pathological condition occurring in tissues around dental implants characterized by inflammation in the perimplant mucosa and progressive loss of the supporting bone. So the prevalence of perimplantitis to be in the order of 20% uh, of all Hello. Yes, doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, please so, continue, doctor. So, the prevalence of perimplantitis to be in the order of 20% of all implant related patients and 10% of all implants. It is estimated that more than 12 million implants are installed annually on a global basis. So this uh, indicates that uh, the incidence of uh, peri-implantitis also will increase each year. So we are placing more implants and globally more than 400 implant companies are uh, selling their products. So each year the placement of implant, uh, number of implants placed in patients is increasing. So the Peri-implantitis is a major uh, concern and a major area where uh, we require uh, protocols, strict protocols to be followed. So uh, how we can diagnose, how to record uh, peri-implantitis? So first thing is clinical documentation, that is uh, record clinical measurements, probing depths, uh, presence of or absence of bleeding and suppuration on probing at four or more sites per implant using a standardized periodontal probe at baseline and follow up. So this is very mandatory. You have to document a periodontal charting at the time of placement and at the time of loading baseline and at each follow up time we have to compare. And standardized intraoral radiographs should be made at baseline and follow up. In partially dented patients, it is recommended to record a full mouth uh, baseline and follow up periodontal charting. So the adjacent tooth, the opposing tooth, the periodontal condition should be uh, recorded at baseline and follow up. So in cases, in the case, in the absence of a previous uh, charting or uh, examination, Diagnosis of peri-implantitis can be based on the presence of bleeding on probing or suppuration. If uh, 
the implant site there is a suppuration on slight bleeding on probing that indicates there is an active uh, disease is occurring and probing depths of at least 6 mm and radiographic bone levels at least 3 mm epical of the most coronal point of the intraosseous part of the implant so these criteria we can use uh, uh, ultimately we need a baseline radiograph and the periodontal charting if it's not there if uh, suppuration or bleeding with uh, more than 6 mm probing depth and uh, 3 mm of radiographic attachment loss the diagnosis of periimplantitis can be made so what are the factors uh, that determine the periimplant health and uh, when the disease will uh, initiate or uh, progress these are the implant factors periimplant tissues and uh, the implant placement factors and the biotype and the local and general <laughs> factors. So implant uh, factors like the design color or diameter or surface and the three-dimensional placement of the implant position and the type of abutment, whether it's temporary or fi final, type of restoration, whether it is a cement retained restoration or a screw retained and the peri-implant mucosal thickness and the width of keratinized tissue surrounding the implant and the general risk factors like smoking, diabetes, uh, immunocompromised conditions, uh, all this will determine the uh, whether the tissue will be in a peri-implant tissue will be in a health or in a disease state. So what is the etiology for this peri-implantitis? In general, uh, if the probing depth exceeds 4 mm, there is a pathology and uh, it, threshold of two more than or equal to 2 mm of vertical bone loss from a standardized uh, implant part, that is the implant crest or platform. We have to see more than 2 mm of vertical bone loss. Uh, Post-installation remodeling has been suggested in recent consensus report. It is a polymicrobial anaerobic infection. So the similar to periodontitis, peri-implantitis is a polymicrobial anaerobic infection. So the Staphylococcus aureus appears to play a predominant role in the development of peri-implantitis. This bacterium shows a high affinity to titanium. So the other species like Staphylococcus aureus, epidermis, Canada species have also been identified in peri-implantitis sites. So, a recent article by Andrea Butera has uh, in depth uh, analyzed the species uh, isolated from periimplantitis sites and the in health and in periodontitis sites. So this uh, diagram explains the, uh, the organisms which are uh, common in both periodontitis and periimplantitis sites belongs to Fusobacterium species, Filifactor allosis, Chiponima denticola, Tanarella forsythia, oralis, and all. The organisms which are very specific to peri-implantitis sites belong to uh, Campylobacter sputrum, uh, Aneroglobus germinatus, or uh, Porphyromanus endervantalis, Porphyromanus nigrescens, Staphylococcus aureus, and Campylobacter species. So we can see which is more common in both peri-implant healthy sites periodontitis and peri-implantitis sites, fusobacterium nucleatum or streptococcus or streptococcus sanguis and all. So we, this diagram clearly explains so how the organisms differ, even though it is a polymicrobial infection uh, uh, like uh, periodontitis, the organisms, the species, there is a different species involved in the initiation and progression of uh, peri-implantitis. So, the factors which uh, initiates the bacterial adhesion or bacterial growth on the implant or titanium surface is uh, when it is getting upgraded uh, with the, uh, this thing when the metal part is exposed or uh, uh, improper the cement extrusion into the uh, sulcus area or uh, all this leads to the initial uh, biofilm formation. The bacterial growth on implant via transfer from dental and extra extracurricular communities. So the titanium dissolution products leads to the opportunistic increase in relative abundance of metal resistance stains. So the air powder abrasive or uh, the any solutions we are using to clean titanium that leads to the extrusion of titanium ions, which leads to an opportunistic increase in the 
metal resistant stain and a drug resistant biofilm. So this uh, poses a severe threat in treating the uh, perimplantitis or in dislodging the uh, biofilm with antimicrobial therapy. So this is one area it's of a major concern now at present. So the other risk factors for peri-implantitis includes smoking, the previous history of periodontitis, lack of compliance and limited oral hygiene, systemic diseases like maladjusted uh, diabetes mellitus, uh, or soft tissue defects like uh, poor quality of soft tissue or history of one or more failures of implants. So the presence of periodontitis or cigarette smoking increased the risk for periimplantitis up to 4.7 fold as reported by Wellowings. So the rough implant surfaces of more than two microns seem to future better osseointegration than smooth or moderate surfaces. So uh, the basic manual treatment of uh, periimplant uh, Maintenance can be done with Teflon or carbon plastic or titanium curates. Other than this, uh, stainless steel or any metal is used. This leads to uh, erosion of these titanium ions into the uh, peri-implant tissues. So the defects of peri-implantitis can be classified as many classifications are there. The simple one by Squartz et al. Uh, so the based on the number of walls available whether uh, it is a circumferential or a trough like defect with the four walls, the picture one shows. And uh, you can, in the second diagram, you can see there is only two walls, the mesial and distal wall. And uh, in uh, three, you can see a uh, three walls or one wall. So it's a very simple way you can uh, classify it. So like this, the diagrams you can see how the walls remaining walls you can classify peri-implantitis defects. So how will you manage this? So we are, the main topic is recent protocol in the management of peri-implantitis. So either surgical or surface decontamination or surgical treatment. So the non-surgical methods or mechanical methods, uh, antiseptics or antibiotics, surface decontamination, the implant surface decontamination can be done with the chemical methods like uh, citric acid, ethylene diamine, tetracetic acid, hydrogen peroxide or saline and lasers. And surgically, air powder abrasive, resective uh, surgery like implantoplasty and resective osseous surgery and regenerative surgeries with uh, bone grafting, membrane and uh, uh, platelet rich concentrate. So by all this way, the peri-implant uh, disease can be managed. So the acute protocol for by Lang et al. suggests that when the probing depth is less than 3 mm at the baseline and the follow-up, there is no need for any therapy. If probing depth is less than 3 mm, but there is an accumulation of plaque or slight inflammation is there in the surrounding tissues, then mechanically cleaning, polishing, and oral hygiene, reinforcing the oral hygiene maintenance with the flossing uh, and internal brushes advised. If the probing depth is 4 to 5 mm and radiologically, but there is no bone loss, uh, more than uh, 2 or 3 mm, particularly from the horizontal, uh, the component of uh, crystal component, then you have to do a mechanical cleaning, polishing, again, oral hygiene instructions. If radiologically there is a bone loss, then we have to do a microbiological analysis and uh, local antiseptic uh, treatment with uh, irrigation in the sulcus and uh, lasers can be used non-surgically. And if there is more than 5 mm pocket with radiologically severe bone loss, then you have to plan for surgical, uh, surgical management with resective or uh, regenerative surgery. So the implant surface decontamination is a critical component of surgical treatment. So various techniques have been proposed for implant surface decontamination after surgical exposure. So the mechanical, chemical, laser, photodynamic, or a combination of this. So in all these ways, we can do an implant surface decontamination. Uh, mechanically, we can use uh, curates like titanium curates or carbon curates or uh, plastic curates. And chemically, you can use ethylene diamine as tetracetic acid or uh, uh, solutions you can use to uh, decontaminate yeah. the process or lasers can be used. Yeah. And the reason this thing is photodynamic therapy with the dye injected and activating the dye with the lasers, you can uh, decontaminate. So 
these are the different uh, uh, ways of uh, uh, decontaminating the implant surface. So the lasers can be used, diode lasers, erbium YAG or erbium chromium OSGG and photodynamic therapy or radiation, air powder abrasives or anodizing treatment. So the air powder uh, systems, air polishing systems to clean the implant surface are depending on the used medium and are significantly better in the following order. That is uh, hydroxyapatite tricalcium phosphate is superior then uh, compared to hydroxyapatite or glycine, then titanium dioxide or phosphoric acid. So this is this order, it is better. We can do an air powder polishing for implant surface. So what is the major concern nowadays is whenever you are doing a mechanical or a chemical, uh, this thing, the, the reason leach of titanium ions or uh, from the titanium implant surface into the peri-implant tissues. So previously, or uh, the concept was uh, titanium is a bio inert and it is a biocompatible material and it is not doing any corrosion is not there and there is no uh, side effects. But uh, the recent uh, literature is showing uh, the titanium particles have been isolated from a distant organs like uh, uh, lungs, liver, or uh, renal system. So these titanium ions are leaching from the implant surface. Uh, either with uh, biobacterial adhesion or uh, biofilm formation or uh, block formation adhering to the implant surface or uh, the mechanical or chemical debridement what we are doing uh, to treat peri-implantitis or peri-implant distinct that also leads to the leaching of uh, titanium ions into the tissues. So what this titanium ions, when, as I told the mechanical viewer or acetic liquid or uh, fluid, fluoride or ethylene diamond tetrastic acid or the bacterial adhesion, all this leads to the leaching of titanium particles into the peri-implant tissues. So what is the drawback? Why these titanium ions we are more concerned uh, is this, uh, this titanium ions leads to the sift of this macrophage phenotype. The macrophage phenotype shifts from M2 to M1, and this leads to peri-implantitis. So this uh, leads to the secretion of more pro-inflammatory mediators like interleukin-1 and TNF-alpha. This leads to osteoclast differentiation and resorption of the bone. So this macrophage shift or phenotype shift is a major concern with the titanium ions. So this is a titanium ion leaching into the peri-implant tissues. When you trim the titanium abutment surface or uh, uh, the implant surface slightly fibrated, some ions will be leached into the peri-implant soft tissues or into the uh, so bone surface. This leads to resorption of bone and the onset of uh, peri-implantitis. So I don't so, so, what then what we have to do so the mechanical debridement or the chemical debridement to decontaminate lasers uh, uh, implant surface is a uh, disadvantage this leading to the leaching of titanium ion so the major uh, repair protocol consists of three phases pre-surgical surgical and post-surgical using a laser so lasers or uh, boon in treating the peri-implantitis so either diode or uh, Erbium lasers can be used. Diode laser, the problem is um, it has to be used in a non-contact and um, uh, the, the heat the heat generated might melt the uh, so titanium surface. So we can't uh, be very this thing uh, sure of 100% decontamination. So the erbium YAG or erbium chromium OSGG, the mid infrared lasers are really a boon so that uh, helps in decontamination of the implant surfaces uh, in a very uh, effective way so the so, uh, steps in uh, ma managing periplantitis with uh, erbium lasers are uh, using uh, different tips like radial firing tip or uh, side firing tip and the uh, mz6 tip in contaminating the implant surface so first we can use a normal uh, RFPT 5 tip with a power setting of 1.5 watt and the air per water ratio of 40% and 50% and 30 hertz of frequency. 
you can deutilize the if 6 mm pocket means the 6 mm of uh, gingival epithelium can be deutilized with uh, that's called the gingival sealing can be done and uh, gingivectomy should only be performed if pseudo pocketing is present that is above the uh, crust of the implant platform if tissue is there you have to do otherwise be no need for doing gingivectomy uh, then the epithelium and the granulation tissue should be removed uh, using a radial firing tip of 1.5 watt power and uh, 50 hertz pulse rate in a H mode we can't uh, remove and um, similarly the osseous defects or uh, the uh, thread exposed uh, epically can be uh, uh, decontaminated using a side firing tip of uh, 8 with a 1.5 watt and uh, 30 hertz pulse. So the final decartization or uh, the contouring of osseous defect can be done using an MG6 tip with 2.4 watt and 70 to 80 percent wire water ratio we can do a bone contouring using that so everything we can do with the erbium lasers for the soft tissue correction granulation removal and the implant surface decontamination osseous contouring everything can be done with this um uh, erbium lasers so the final debridement can be done with the same power settings and followed by that, if uh, regeneration like uh, two, two, three wall or uh, four walls or two walls re remaining, we can plan for some regeneration using a bone graft and a PRF or IPRF sticky bone uh, and membranes can be used. So uh, patient has to be instructed, uh, gently clean the area using an interproximal breast and uh, so this is a case uh, where uh, perimplantitis uh, managed uh, with uh, uh, erbium lasers. So this is a radial firing tip uh, that is uh, cleaning uh, without touching or without uh, damaging the implant surface with uh, sufficient power, uh, air and water uh, relief, which pulls the tissues. At the same time, there is no harm to the titanium surface. So with this firing, we can clean the defect entirely, decontaminate the implant surface, then uh, regeneration can be uh, done with a bone graft and GTR membrane. So I can show you some of the cases where uh, you can see lower two implants placed and later uh, we found out a circumferential defect in this implant. So as a um, uh, erbium laser, after reflecting a flap, uh, an erbium laser is used to uh, clean the granulation tissue on the implant surface. And uh, you can see the defect nicely um, on a four two region, the implant placed in the four two region. So then the uh, uh, site is grafted with an osteograft and a sticky bone and uh, covered with the resorbable uh, membrane and closed. Sutured back, and you can see the radiographs uh, six months post operatively. And uh, if in presence taken, and uh, final process is delivered. Uh, so, this is a pre of the radiograph, is a little bit not clear. And post op, you can see the bone regeneration. Uh, similar case, another case, you can see uh, the YSGG laser has been used to clean, debride the perimplant defect and then also a bio has been used to pack that area and uh, covered with the membrane. So you can see the defect nicely. So the laser completely debrides and uh, without any damage to the uh, implant surface. You are not touching implant surface with any hand instruments or anything. And uh, so different uh, biomaterials can be used like uh, osix or mapograft or fibrogate for the uh, soft tissue augmentation around uh, the peri-implant defects and the soft tissue defects. So the various uh, studies in vitro analysis uh, favoring the erbium chromium YSGG and erbium log laser, the management of uh, peri-implantitis. So the titanium surfaces after an implant irradiation helps in osteoblast adhesion and a new form bone formation. 
So the in vitro attachment of osteoblast on contaminated rough titanium surface treated by erbium yaw glazes. So these are the various studies, uh, recent studies uh, showing the evidence that uh, after a laser debridement, laser decontamination, the regenerati regenerative uh, possibility is more. Um, so this is uh, uh, the most recent evidence, network meta-analysis of the treatment efficacy of different lasers for periimplantitis. So what this, uh, st this is uh, different systematic reviews have been uh, analyzed. And what is the reason network meta-analysis showing that uh, the laser uh, diode laser is used uh, yeah, that definitely um, uh, decontaminates implant surface, but uh, the erbium yog or erbium yog laser is more effective in uh, completely debriding the uh, perimplant uh, uh, defects as well as uh, decontamination of implant surface. So erbium yog followed by a regenerative therapy with uh, bone graft and membrane shows a promising result in the management of uh, peri-implantitis rather than the air powder abrasive or mechanical debridement or uh, uh, resective uh, osseous surgery or implantoplasty. Yeah, this protocol, erbium yog followed by a uh, regenerative surgery um, is a promising result uh, in the management of uh, peri-implantitis. So, Prevention is better than two. So perimplantitis before uh, its onset, we have to prevent it. So for that, for implant site requires a thick uh, phenotype of more than two millimeter, a wide band of keratinized mucosa and free of infection and implant design 0.5 to one mm of smooth color, moderately rough implant surface, platform switch if possible and uh, proper three-dimensional placement of implant, prosthetically driven implant placement or guided surgical implant placement. And whenever possible, screw retained restorations and natural emergence profile and light occlusal contacts, patient disease control, a good flock control, regular maintenance, smoking cessation and diabetes control. So these are the factors we have to make sure. A three-dimensional placement, surgical guided placement of implant with the screw retained prosthesis whenever possible because the cement extrusion from the cement retained prosthesis is one of the uh, risk factor for uh, the onset of perimplantitis and a thick tissue phenotype with a wide keratinized tissue surrounding implant and the regular maintenance and diabetes smoking cessation is uh, can prevent uh, perimplantitis so if the perimplantitis sets in we have to manage it non-surgically with laser. And if it is deep with circumferential two or three wall defects, you uh, have to debride it properly with the laser if it's available and uh, as traumatically as possible. Don't uh, damage the titanium surface and uh, regenerate with the bone grafts and membrane. So the take home message is, the documentation, charting, and radiographs at baseline and follow-up is required. Prevention is better than cure. And uh, inconclusive results with the evidence regarding non-surgical management, lasers or a light source, but to treat perimplantitis is a beam of hope. And regenerative surgery along with lasers is a promising result. That's what the current uh, evidence is showing, especially RPM yarn or erbium chromium OSGG laser of uh, uh, mid-infrared that is a promising result in the management of uh, peri-implantitis. Thank you. Any questions? Is there any questions? Thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful presentation. I request all the keynote speakers and guest speakers kindly stick to your timings. Yeah. Okay, next I would like to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Karpagavalli Shanmugachundram, professor and head department of oral medicine and radiology, Seema Dental College and Hospital, HNB, Garwal University, Jammu and Kashmir, India. 
we welcome you ma'am over to you yes. one minute doctor okay Can you just help me in how to put the background screen? You can find that uh, share screen option, right? So you can click there and you can share your screen. I have the background screen, but... Sorry, doctor. I have the background screen. Okay. Yes. yes. Uh, what is uh, okay, I got it. I got it. No problem. Okay. Background screen visible? Is my background screen visible? One second, ma'am. Is my video visible? No, ma'am. Yes, Your video is not visible. No? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. One this, second. This is in the background screen coming. Yes, ma'am. Now uh, the video is uh, showing. And the background is coming? No, na? No, ma'am. It's okay, ma'am. You can uh, start Fine. the presentation. Yeah, okay. It's no problem. Yeah, ma'am. I'll just share the screen. Okay. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, audible. Okay, I'm clear, isn't it? I can start the presentation. Yes, ma'am. Please start, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. And sorry for the technical glitch. No issues, ma'am. Yeah. Good morning, one and all. Warm greetings from Dev Mumi Rishikesh and Seema Dental College and Hospital. Myself, Dr. S. Kadpagavalli, Professor and Head, Department of Oral Medicine and Radiology, Seema Dental College and Hospital Rishikesh, is here to present on the topic. CBCT, a third eye for dentist in the diagnosis and treatment planning. CBCT or cone bean computed tomography is an extra oral imaging system specifically designed for three-dimensional imaging of the oral and maxillofacial structures.
CBCT produces clear images with high resolution at a reduced radiation and lower cost when compared to the medical computer tomography. It is more compact, faster, and safer version of the medical CT. Going back to the history of CBCT, in the late 1970s by Biodynamics Research Unit at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, USA, they developed a separate C arm to CT, which was an early volumetric predecessor of CBCT. Initial interest of the CBCT was primarily focused on angiography. Later on in 1994, new, uh, two Newton engineers, Giordano Ronca and Daniel Godi, performed the first complete CBCT scan on an, art, um, on an anthropo Morphic skull. The first CBCT system became commercially available for oromaxillofacial imaging in 2001 by Newton, and it was the uh, quantitative radiology from Italy. The components of a CBCT imaging or a CBCT machine usually includes an X ray tube, a gantry, a detector, and a CBCT software. Come, going on to the principles of CBCT, CBCT imaging is accomplished by using a roti rotating gantry to which an X-ray source, that is a cone-shaped X-ray bundle and a detector are fixed, it, which this detector causes image intensifier or is a flat panel detector. The divergent pyramidal or the cone-shaped source of ionizing radiation is directed through the middle of the area, a point of field of interest that is known as the uh, FOV or the region of interest of interested of the patient onto an area of X-ray detector on the opposite side. So here you can see this is the X-ray tube and the patient is lies down in the gantry and this is a 2D detector array and then this goes around in a 360 direction around the patient based on the FOV. So this, since this is the scan volume, this is the FOV in this patient. So this is a small video in which the In CBCT imaging, the X-ray source and image detector rotate 360 degrees around the patient's head. Depending on the clinical site of interest. Are you able to hear the video, Doctor? Uh, yes, ma'am. Slightly increase the venom, ma'am. It will be fantastic. Okay. Should I remove it from the headphone? Are you able to hear the volume? One. So we are probably meeting them. Abhay rukhiye, bula do. Meeting side you. In CBCT imaging, the X-ray source and image detector rotate 360 degrees around the patient's head. Depending on the clinical site of interest, a region of the patient's head is exposed to the X-ray beam. As the rotation occurs, a series of two-dimensional basis projections, also known as frames, is captured by the image detector. The complete series of these frames then comprise a three-dimensional anatomic volume. As seen in this video, the region is the whole head. In CBCT imaging, the X-ray source and image detect. So thus, that was a small video which showed you how the CBCT uh, imaging takes place. That it shows how it went around uh, uh, around the patient as in the gantry in a 360 degrees, and later on each sections are taken out and it is all compiled together. So CBCT can be taken in three positions. You can see the machines either in a standing position or in a sitting position or in a supine position as well. After patient positioning, the process of image acquisition starts. The four components of the CBCT image acquisition are the X-ray generation, the image detector, the image reconstruction, and finally, the image display. So first is the image uh, generation. So during the scan rotation, each projection image is made by sequential single image cap of attenuated X-ray beams by the detector, so which was shown in that uh, video. And the patient is exposed using a constant beam of radiation during the rotation and allow the X-ray detector to sample the attenuated beam in its trajectory. Uh, 
Then pulse X-ray beam exposure is a major reason for considerable, considerable variation in the reported cone beam unit dosimetry. So going on to the field of view or the FOV. So the CBCT systems can be categorized according to the available FOV or selected scan volume height as follows. So basically we have the localized region that is approximately five centimeter or less. We have four by four or even five by five, which is for the dentoalveolar and the temporomandibular joint segments. Then you have for the single large, which is usually five by seven for maxilla or mandible. Sometimes we have it even eight by eight. You have the interarch, uh, which is around 7 centimeter to 10 centimeter. Ex uh, example for the mandible and superiorly to include the inferior concha. Then you also have for the maxillofacial regions like 10 by 15 or 16 by 17. You have bigger ones or 10 by 12 also we have, which usually extends from the mandible up to the extending up to the nasion. And then you have the craniofacial, which includes the entire head. Uh, or uh, which is around 17 by 18 or even in you have around 18 into 21 also, which is greater than 15. Usually it starts from the lower border of the mandible up to the vertex of the head. Then you have uh, a flat panel detector. So here you can see that the focal spot is there. So you have a narrow FOV and a wide FOV. So what is the difference that you get if it is a narrow FOV, then the focal spot is a smaller focal spot and the image quality is better, acquisition quality is better. But you should remember that it covers only a smaller region. So when you have a wide uh, uh, FOV, so when there is a wide FOV, you can see that the flat uh, the, uh, in, in the aspect of the flat panel, Okay, the focal spot uh, direction to the flat panel is widened out and hence the quality of the image gets uh, reduced. Going on, this is the image acquisition. So later on, now you go on to the image reconstruction. So on the once the basis projection frames have been acquired, the data must be processed to create the volumetric data set. This process is called reconstruction. The number of individual projection frames may be from 100 to more than 600, each with more than 1 million pixels with 12 to 16 bits of data assigned to each pixel. Reconstruction times vary depending on the acquisition parameters, the voxel size, the FOV, the number of projections, and also the hardware, that is the processing speed of the uh, machine that we have, the data uh, throughput from acquisition to workstation computer, and finally, the software that we are using, that is the reconstruction algorithm. The reconstruction process consists of two stages, each composed of numerous steps. So this is the acquisition stage where you saw the image collection. Then it goes to the detector or the pre-processing. You have the offset correction, the gain calibration, the defect interpolation, and you have the temporal artifact correction. So after the image ac acquisition stage is done, it go, goes on to the reconstruction stage. In the re reconstruction stage, you have the sinogram formation. That is the sinogram conversion takes place, then correction takes place. Then you have the reconstruction, that is the FTK algorithm uh, happens here, We're weighting the projection data, filtering the weight, weighted data, and back projection of the weighted data. So now in the acquisition stage, you can say this is how the data goes, and finally this is how it keeps coming out. Okay, so you can see that the data, the dark image offset, that is the detector output signal without any extra exposure, and then its spatial variations are mainly caused by the varying dark current of the photodiodes. Gain variations are caused by the varying sensitivity of the photodiodes. The sequence of the required calibration steps is, re is referred to as the detector uh, processing, and the calibration requires the acquisition of additional image sequences. So here you can see the data collection goes off into the offset correction, and then you have the linear uh, gain calibration. After the linear gain calibration, you have the defect interpolation and the temporal artifact correction. Here again, you, what was explained in the reconstruction stage, uh, it is ex uh, how the cyanogram takes place and then the corrected cyanogram happens. So once the images are corrected, they must be related to each other and assembled. So one method involves constructing a cyanogram, a composite image, relating each row of each projection image. Once all the slices have been reconstructed, they can be combined into a single volume for visualization. The next is the image display. 
So the volumetric data set is a compilation of all available voxels and for most CBCT devices, it is presented to the clinician on screen as a secondary reconstructed images in three or orthogonal panels. So usually this is what we get once it is all this happens through the machine and comes onto the image. So you see an axial image, a sagittal image and a coronal image with a 3D image, usually at a thickness defaulted to the native resolution. So if you keep 1mm thick thickness or 2mm thickness, according to that, we will be able to see it. So this is the axial and this is the coronal image and here you can see the sagittal image and this is the 3D. So the, this is how the image gets displaced, displayed to the uh, 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 to the uh, person who is taking the CBCT. Then now going on to the stages in the volumetric data display. So first reorient the data, optimize the data, then view the data and finally formatting the data. So reorienting the data. It is the first stage of volumetric data display where the volumetric data set can be reoriented in all three planes. I already told you the axial, coronal and the sagittal using the PC-based software according to patient's anatomic features, which are then realigned symmetrically or according to a reference plane. So usually you have reference plane given in the uh, software. Then next thing is the optimizing the data. So optimizing data, great variability can exist in the overall density and the contrast of the orthogonal images. So you can see there is difference in the contrast between the CBCT units. So every machine can have different uh, quality of the contrast or density or the quality of the image. So between the CBCT units and within the same unit, depending on patient images and scan parameters selected. Therefore, you have to optimize the image presentation and facilitate diagnosis. It is often necessary to adjust the contrast that is the window and the brightness level parameters to favor the bony structures. So we have to adjust the uh, contrast and the brightness according to the image of the which is displayed. Next, you go on to viewing the data. As there are numerous component orthogonal images seen in each plane, it is impractical to display all the slices on one display format. So therefore, it is necessary to review each series dynamically. We have to, as a radiologist, we have to uh, review each and every series so that we don't miss out any pathologies. So each series dynamically has to be reviewed by scrolling through the consecutive orthogonal image stack. This is referred to as a sign or a paging mode. After that, we format the data. So CBCT software provides many formatting op options. There are three basic format options. Normally, we use the M MPR, that is the multiplanar reform reformation. You have the ray sun and then the volume rendering. So here you can see the MPR, that is the multiplanar uh, reformatting. So here, we once the uh, image is caught, we do the MPR and then you can see the linear oblique images of the, this is the TM joint. And then you do serial trans, trans uh, axial images can be done from this. So we do see the various trans uh, axial images. Then you also get something like a uh, OPG or a, uh, a panoramic radiograph. So we go on from the linear oblique, we make a curved oblique image as well. Then from the ray, through the ray sum, we do the, we do increasing the thickness slices we get the entire uh, like an OPG image. And then you go on to the orthogonal projections and then you do a volume rendering. Through the volume rendering, again, you can get an IV, IVR and a DVR. That is, this is a, a 3D imaging and this is a uh, non-3D imaging. So this is the multiplanar reconstruction. This is the MPR, which we con uh, commonly do in the CBCT practice. So here we place the you are, here you can see the axial. So the axial slices usually come in a, from the top to the bottom of the skull. So this is how it goes from the upper to the lower or you can do the head to the foot. So in this way, we start visualizing the axial images. Then we do a sagittal cut, which usually is from the left to the right or from the right to the left of the patient's skull. Then we do a coronal slicing, which is usually anterior, posterior or posterior anterior. That is from the front to the back or from the back to the front. We start slicing and start imaging the uh, patients. And finally, we can do a, which is usually an adjusted sagittal, we call it, or arbitrary direction based on how we want to see the three-dimensional view. So this can be customized. So now this, you can see the selections in the MPR. So this is the coronal image where we had gone from the uh, anterior to the posterior. And this is the 
uh, we can say this as the sagittal view or let somewhat uh, rot rotated sagittal because here you are able to see the mandible as it is as it's a parabolic structure and this is the axial image which goes from the top to the down and this is the 3d image so going on to artifacts so every image uh, every uh, uh, instrument has some imaging modality, has some artifacts, starting from the simple IOPAs or the OPGs. So CBCT also has its own artifacts. So these artifacts are of three kinds. One is the artifacts, then you have the image noise and the poor soft tissue contrast. So it usually gives only a good contrast of the heart tissues. So coming to the artifacts, you have beam related artifacts, you have patient related artifacts, you have scanner related artifacts, and finally foreign body, uh, foreign objects or foreign body artifacts. Beam related artifacts, normally we have beam hardenings, which is using usually due to the cupping effect and stick or uh, banding effects, which is usually seen in the images. Then you have the cone shaped beam related artifacts or the faults, which is you can have a partial volume uh, rendering or a partial volume averaging. Then you can have undersampling where some image, some aspect of the anatomy is not seen. Then you can have cone beam effect. Then you can have exponential edge gradient uh, effects, photon deprivation, full mouth restoration, or because of the metal artifacts. Then patients related artifacts, you can have unsharpness, you can have double images because of the patient movement. Then because of uh, scanner related artifacts, you call something called ring artifacts can be seen because of the scanner. Then finally, you also have the foreign body or artifacts. What are the advantages of a CBCT over the uh, computer CT or the computerized photograph? So this, uh, there are, the one thing is the x ray beam is limited. The limitation of the x ray beam, like in a CT, you can have a wide x ray uh, imaging area, whereas here it is a limited x ray area the another thing is the image accuracy you have a rapid uh, scan time the scan time is very fast not like the cbct then the dose reduction is less as compared to the ct the display modes are unique to maxillofacial region especially for head, uh, dentist and head and neck uh, uh, physicians this is the best imaging modality and also you have reduced image artifacts because the area imaged is less the applications of CBCT in dentistry, if you see it as its role in all the aspects of dentistry, starting from oral and maxillofacial surgery, orthodontics and pedodontics, periodontics, TMJ imaging, the dental implants, it has played a way, uh, 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 implant radiology, CBCT is a must. And it also has its ENT applications. You can have the volume, uh, the airway analysis, volumetric analysis of the airway, then in forensic dentistry, in uh, age estimations and other uh, radiological, uh, forensic uh, radiological investigations, in research, in general dentistry and endodontics, and oral and max, uh, maxillofacial medicine. So this is the CBCT, the volume is acquired, and then you are reconstructing, reconstructing it from the volume. So this is like a bread slice. You can see you get the volume and then you can't start slicing it. And from there you do the rendering. So what every imaging, when it has an advantage is it, it does have a limitation. So what are the limitations of the CBCT? The image noise is due to large volume being irradiated during CBCT scanning, resulting in heavy interactions with tissues producing scattered radiation, which in turn leads to nonlinear attenuation by the detectors. This additional x ray detection is called noise and contributes to image degradation. Then you also, as I told you, you have poor soft tissue contrast. Only the hard tissues are seen well in a CBCT. And already I have discussed in detail about the various artifacts like beam hardening, patient-related artifacts, scanner-related artifacts, and comb beam related artifacts. Going on to the drawbacks and the methods, how to minimize them. So if when you have a beam related artifact, so beam hardening artifact, you can reduce the FOV and modify the arch selection. So this will give a better uh, scanning image. So this will avoid scanning regions of susceptible to beam hardening. Cone shaped beam related are errors. You can select the smallest acquisition voxel to reduce the partial volume average error. Patient related artifact, this has to be corrected by shorter scan time so that the patient doesn't uh, have any movement and proper patient counseling is a must. Foreign body ob objects, always ask the patient to remove all the heavy metal jewelries during the scanning. Noise and scatter artifacts, you, you have a lot of sophisticated and back, uh, back projection techniques by which this can be avoided. 
Now, going on to the users, I would like to display a few of the images and the cases which have been uh, reported to our institution and which we have reported in this past one year. So this is some of the few uh, images which I could display in short of time. We cannot discuss on everything in detail. But these are the major uses of CBCT in dentistry. So going on to its use in oral medicine and radiology and maxillofacial surgery. You can see this is a case of patient which came with a radical assist, but it had a, it was a huge radical assist. So we are we were able to do a analysis of the volume of the defect. So we can give a vertical uh, and a and in a uh, transverse direction, and we can also see the three D defect of the patient. So this was a patient who was presented with a radicular cyst. And this is a patient who presented with a huge growth of the gingiva. So we suspect the patient to have a peripheral ossifying fibroma or the giant cell uh, granuloma. But it had it finally came out as a peripheral ossifying fibroma radiologically because when we subjected for a CBCT, you can see in this, along with the growth, you are able to see specks of radio opacities. So this confirmed our uh, clinical diagnosis that it is a peripheral ossifying fibroma. And this was the defect seen in the 3D imaging. Then this was a patient who uh, present to, to us which were with chronic separative osteomyelitis. So you can see that there is a irregular moth eaten appearance or a uh, 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 osteolytic lesion. And this is most important because we were able to analyze the uh, amount of destruction to the inferior allular canal as well. So here you can see that the, inferior, the nerve has been pushed down and there is a irregular radiolucency giving a moth eaten appearance and it was confirmed as a chronic separative osteomyelitis. I request all participants to kindly mute yourself, please. And going on next is, uh, this is a case where the patient, we suspected it to be a carcinoma case. And when we did a, a CBCT, it was an intraosseous carcinoma. Though uh, clinically, the patient did not have a very huge growth or anything. It was a carcinoma which was arising from the intra intraalveolar region. And the patient had, you can see that there is a pathological fracture as well. So was there's a ragged bone appearance. There was a diffuse osteolytic lesion. And this is another case which came a huge patient which came with a huge swelling of the mandible and it was suspected to be of amyloblastoma and there was an impacted tooth. So you can see that one of the premolars is impacted and you have the multilocular appearances. And here you can we were able to measure the 3D aspect of the uh, tumor and we can also see the uh, we can also see its uh, uh, closeness to the inferior allular nerve canal. And also we, we are able to see that the lower board of the mandible is highly thinned out. So in all the three dimensions, we were able to analyze this, which is helpful for the, uh, for the surgeons. Next, these are a few of the cases which have been referred from the oral surgery department. So regularly they send to us for the evaluation of the uh, uh, impacted third molars, especially for the player to see the inferior alveolar canal and its uh, correlation with the impacted tooth. So here you can see the canal is placed on the buccal aspect and the tooth is lying closer to the lingual uh, uh, border of the mandible. And you can see the uh, position of the uh, tooth. And also this is a case to, which was uh, sent to us. Actually, it was uh, thought to be a cyst. And later on, uh, when we took the CBCT, we could see that there was an odentome in the patient and it was associated with a cyst. And this patient was referred from an, actually an orthodontic department for this impacted tooth. Actually, it has been referred to oral surgery for uh, uh, removal of this impacted tooth for orthodontists. But later on, when we did, we accidentally found multiple small tooth-like structures. And it was multiple odentomes in relation to the impacted tooth. So there was an impacted central incisor. Along with that, you can see multiple small impacted tooth. So normally when we do impacted tooth, we not, not only give the entire length of the impacted tooth, we also see the uh, level of the impacted tooth from the occlusal plane, the distance from the midline. We also give the distance. So I, this is another image. Uh, There's another image where we can see the orthodontic one, where you can see the impacted tooth. So we normally give the distance of the impacted tooth from the midline. We also give its level from the occlusal plane. And we also tell the, give the value, uh, angulation of the impacted tooth from the midline. So angle of the impacted tooth. Then this is a very important thing or a very, uh, CBCT plays a very important role in implantology or implant planning. So this is how the implant imaging that we usually give to the uh, uh, surgeons or to the prosthodontist and the periodontist or the implantologist. So we always do a multiplanar MPR and we also trace the, if it's a mandible, we also trace the inferior allular nerve. 
and we given various slicing. Here you can see the number of the slicing is always given here. And in the same image, you can correlate the, when we give a sagittal image, this is a sagittal image. You can see the, we always give the length, height of the bone available. And we also give the width at three levels, one at the crystal, basal, and in the middle, and from the uh, one end of the cortex to the other cortex. And in mandible, it is usually referred up to the level of the inferior alveolar canal. And in maxilla, this is a patient who came with an edentulous area. Again, we give the MPR and we give the various slicing with the numbers. So we again measure the height up to the nasal uh, uh, bridge, nasal floor, or sometimes max maxillary sinus, depending on whichever tooth. We also give a coronal and also we say the edentulous span width. So we have a proper uh, implant reporting format also. So these are some of a few, few cases from the orthodontics. All the cleft palate patients are usually regularly referred to us for the uh, imaging of CBCT. So you can see the cleft here. We also give a volumetric analysis of the cleft. We give the defect, the, we measure the defect in two dimensional as well as in the three dimensional aspect. We give the width, the breadth and the depth of the defect as well. And uh, the impacted tooth, I had already told you, we commonly, uh, regularly we get the impacted tooth from the of the canine and premolars from the orthodontic department. And this is something which I would like to highlight upon, which is something called a gubernacular tract, which is a histological presence of actually the crypt of the tooth. And as the tooth erupts, you get a tract, which is seen, seen radiographically. This tract is known as a gubernacular tract. If this tract is visualized in a uh, CBCT, and if it is seen, then we know that this uh, tooth is going to erupt normally. In case where the uh, eruptions is uh, delayed or if there is going to be some pathology with related to the eruption, the, there will be yeah, this okay. gubernacular tract will be missing or it will be destroyed. We are not able to visualize. Usually it is associated with pathologies associated with impacted tooth or if there is going to be some uh, delayed or disruption in the eruption. Finally, going on to the role of CBCT in endodontics. In endodontics, also CBCT plays a very important role, especially in foreign body evaluation. This was the patient who had constant sinusitis. And then when we did a uh, CBCT, we could see a foreign body in, into the sinus. This is a metal pin. Somebody has done an endodontic treatment for this patient and the pin has entered into the sinus. So this is a foreign body. And we can also see it in the axial. This is a rotated, this is a coronal and this is the rotated uh, sagittal. And this is the 3D image as well. And then the other thing is for the detection of canals, we can see the MB, uh, mesiobuccal 1 and mesiobuccal 2 canals for detection of multiple canals. Usually we get it. And this is a radio, uh, pathology associated with a uh, endoperio lesion. So we can see the periapical lesion as well as the, we can see the defect. So this is an endoperio lesion. I'm rushing through in because of the shortage of time. And this is some of the cases where it, we had a calcified canal. So you can see this is the axial images. We are not able to see the root canal clearly at the level of the root apex. And here in the coron uh, coronal image, we are very clearly not able to see the, uh, the calcified root canal is seen. And this is also the sagittal image. And this was a patient of fracture of the root. So this is a radiolucency in the axial image. And the, here very clearly the coronal image, we are able to see the uh, radiolucent line or the fracture line. So we are able to measure the frac fracture root fractured uh, segment as well. And we also give the 3D image also. So uh, going on to the analysis of the CBCT images, after we get these images, we need to analyze and interpret it. Interpretation involves a sequence of cognitive steps, description of the image characteristics, identification of patterns of bony involvement and associated disease process, categorization into groups providing radiological differential diagnosis known as radiological pattern recognition. You have to collect all available diagnostic information. Step-by-step -step analysis of abnormal radiographic findings has to be given. Collect as much as information as possible available in various image results. <laughs> Look for the yeah. abnormality like changes in appearance of known tissues and structures, changes in bone density, asymmetry in bilateral structures. Always compare left to the right the, so that you are able to rule out artifacts. Determine the location of the abnormality like tooth bearing areas of the jaws, the, whether it's of odontogenic origin, non tooth bearing areas of the jaw, like non odontogenic origin, and see for the epicenter of the lesion whenever you go for any uh, pathologies of the jaws. Finally, I would like to conclude that it is very essential for any clinician to remain in touch with the latest innovations in the field of dentistry and apply that for the benefit of patient care and be ready to accept new trends. CBCT is an inevitable tool in the field of dentistry, which one should learn and, apt and adapt to clinical practice. These are my references.
I would like to thank the organizing team of the fifth ICT OH, especially Dr. Rajeshwari as well, for giving me this opportunity and for patient and to all the audience for the patient listening. I would like to acknowledge my postgraduates from the Department of Oral Medicine and Radiology, Seema Dental College and Hospital for helping me in this presentation. Thank you all for patient listening. I'm open for questions. Thank you, Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, next, I would like to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Sri Shakti D, Associate Professor, Public Health Dentistry, Savita Dental College. We welcome you, ma'am. Over to you. Thank you for the opportunity to deliver the guest lecture today. I'm Dr. Shakti, professor uh, in the Department of Public Health Industry, Savitra Dental College. I will be talking on clinical epidemiology today. Uh, go with the presentation. Repetition with the Ready? Repetition. Huh? Repetition with the One minute. I uh, hope the slides are visible. Yes, ma'am. Visible, ma'am. Thank you. We're going to start with clinical epidemiology. Uh, as with the conference, which focuses on innovation and prevention, there is always room in our life to think bigger, push the limits, and imagine the impossible. So the contents of the seminar would be types of clinical research, basic principles, abnormality diagnosis frequency, and risk and prognosis. For want of time, I would be rushing through the same. And if any of the registrants uh, have any doubt, you, can, you are free to mail and ask the same. So if we see the origin of epidemiology, uh, we would say it blossomed as a speciality during World War II, but its seeds were so one much, much, much before. People like Hippocrates, John Snow, John Brandt did a phenomenal work. And we all know the pump handle experiment done by John Snow. And it took a humongous effort by him to prove that it was caused by Vibrio cholerae due to the contaminated water. So it was not easy like these days where we readily know Vibrio cholerae is going to cause cholera and the source is contaminated water. It was a time when epidemiology took its roots. So if we see what is clinical epidemiology in simple terms, we can say it is a basic science of preventive medicine. So all the more, it is apt for the conference team. So it is going to bridge the gap between the people and technology, that is people who require treatment and the technological aspects. So how do we see clinical research or clinical epidemiology? There are four major types, diagnostic, etiologic, prognostic, and intervention. So causal and descriptive, how will we differentiate? Descriptive is a basic form of epidemiological study, but for it to be causal, you have to relate one factor, be a one independent factor to the dependent factor. The association should be proved both clinically and statistically. Then diagnostic research is one other form of clinical epidemiology where this diagnosis term doesn't limit to the laboratory test. Right from the patient enters the operatory till the final uh, diagnostic highest sophisticated test, which lets us to treat the patient comes under diagnostic research. Again, the data would be through sampling or it is mostly an observational research and the outcome is dichotomous, whether the disease is present or not. Then etiological research, again, the name itself suggests this type of clinical epidemiology deals with causes for the health outcome. Again, whenever you say cause, we can prove it. That is causal association. Association is different. Causation, causation is different. This causation can be strengthened and proven by using Bradford Hill criteria. We have around nine criteria. These can be used to prove through clinical epidemiological studies. So then there is something called as prognostic research. Again, right from the patient has entered the treatment phase, each and every clinical symptom and sign, radiographic improvement or improvement through histopathological evidence can be considered for this type of study. Then the last one, the gold standard, is the intervention research. 
it is the highest level of strength of evidence compared to other design so we are going to have a clinical trial so this clinical trial will have randomized control trials but always in field we cannot rely on randomized control trials so we have other study designs like non randomized trials quasi trials intention to treat and explanatory trials these might not have the level or strength of evidence as compared to the randomized control trials but then in reality situations we have to rely on all these types of trials for evidence based decision making so what would be the basic principles in clinical epidemiology we'll see it one by one clinical issues and questions these are very 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 important so abnormality how do you check abnormality is the patient sick or well with the dichotomized answer to uh, decide whether the patient is abnormal or not then again diagnosis it is about the accuracy of tests used we're going to see on frequency which covers both prevalence and incidence risk prognosis treatment and prevention everything we're going to see one by one then finally the cost so what is variable variable is an important factor one of the important principle it can be an independent extraneous or a dependent variable independent variable is often um let's say a uh, independent variable is a separate entity which does not have anything to do with the disease but dependent variable causes any change in the independent variable is going to cause a change in the dependent variable an extraneous variable is considered like a third wheel for example if you can consider dental caries and diet i'm sorry dental caries and microorganism to be the independent and dependent variable then an extraneous variable could be the intake of carbonated drinks which is not even in the primary scope of the study but as a part of diet it could play an important role in increasing the risk of acquiring caries for example amount of water is an independent variable whereas the size of plant number of leaves whether the plant lives or dies are dependent variable okay so the cattle grazing a field could be an extraneous variable which decides on the survival of the plant okay then when we come off to health outcomes as clinicians we are always always worried about the health outcomes we always try to understand predict interpret and when caring for our patients but health outcome is not always a textbook textbook example where the patient this is stress റേഞ്ച് in clinical epidemiology it is about numbers and probability let's say see uh, in in clinical practice it is all your gut instinct or what your seniors have taught you but even then we need some objective measurements for example numbers and probability this is uh, in relation to a survey done in uk between 2010 and 12 in this if we see by numbers the probability of gum Uh, carcinomas occurring is by 370 whereas in tongue it is way higher 2140 so numbers and probability also play a very important role so you have to we should know what is population and size in even in clinical epidemiology we are not worried about a population which is at risk of disease but as an epidemiology we are not going to consider the whole population but we would be considering people sample who exhibit clinical features or symptoms and signs we take only them and go ahead with the studies so again we we know what is number and frequency we know what are all the variables even then knowing our basics right we can commit some errors that is called as bias most mostly three types of bias occur in this type of studies selection measurement and confounding so let's say laparoscopic surgery versus open method we're going to ask we're going to do laparoscopic surgery in very young crowd 
and they're going to go ask the post operative outcome in that crowd even if we do an open mouth uh, open method or a laparoscopic surgery they're going to be they're going to heal faster and come back faster the type of people we select for questioning is biased and the outcome will also be for the laparoscopic surgery than the open method the same kind can happen when we are checking the risk factors for deep vein thrombosis the kind of population we select will have varying degrees of risk for the same disease next is folic acid supplement in colon cancer if we take a folic acid supplement for example we might not get colon cancer but if we compare the people who are taking folic acid alone with people who are taking multivitamins and a good physical activity again there is a chance for bias so what is chance even though we avoid bias in lot of situations some error can happen due to chance so see if we toss a coin why does it happen that it is only probability is that 50% we are going to get head and 50% we are going to get tail but it does not happen always the change which might which might happen is called as a chance for example if we see the bias is the difference see intra arterial cannula is going to give a definitive blood pressure but spigmo manometer is the realistic principle which we can use in day to day practice the difference in diastolic bp between intra arterial cannula measure and spigmo, spigmo manometer is your bias the values which revolve around the spigmo manometer reading is your chance you can eliminate bias but you can only reduce chance by reducing the limits of standard deviation within which you want to consider the results next moving on to abnormality for example what when will you say a patient is having hypertension in three consecutive readings if he is going to have a bp when will we say the patient is having diabetes mellitus it is dependent on fasting and postprandial range and now hba1c like that we can add on examples so going on to data you have nominal ordinal and interval as we all know so what was we going to check with this data in clinical epidemiology is validity validity is the degree to which an instrument measure what it intends to measure how accurate it is there are so many types of validity it is content validity suppose you have a questionnaire you can check the content you can check the construct validity that is the content face validity for example whether the test appears to test what it it is related to we have other things called predictive concurrent and criterion related probably if time is there i would go more in detail i'm very sorry so any abnormality should be unusual it should be associated with the disease and it must be treatable and again as i told you it should be two standard deviations within the mean value within the 95 percent there this is how we see uh, we see how accurate it is with data but then statistical un unusualness is there extreme data is always beneficial for example a person with low bp has a low risk towards cardiovascular disease which is which doesn't fall under the normal value and again when they have high calcium bone density in old days the fracture risk is very less so abnormal again should be treatable in diagnosis we are worried about four terms mainly i'm sorry i'm rushing through one is sensitivity whether it is able to detect a person with a disease correctly sensitivity whether it is able to detect a person without the disease correctly then there are predictive values positive predictive value and negative predictive value we always go in for sensitive test high sensitive test when it is a life threatening situation like hiv we always go for a highly specific test when we want to avoid disease burden or patient burden on healthcare system in our country so what is roc curve to put it simple anything below this curve tells you how sensitive is your test or whether if the test predicts the disease is there in the person the disease is there so what about the predictive values a highly sensitive test will have good negative predictive value and vice versa okay then what is probability and likelihood ratio like when i told you predictive value is about high sensitivity likelihood ratio is a ratio which even decides how the probability differs between true positive in patients with disease and 
false negative in patients without disease. To avoid all these bias due to sensitivity issues, specificity issues, clinicians do parallel testing in ambulatory patients. That is, they do many tests at a stretch in a hospital so that if one test is low in sensitivity, the other test will cope up with the value and we'll get a accurate result. And the next is serial testing. Serial testing, when the patient is not ambulatory, very cooperative, he can come for a series of visits. We do this type of testing to rule out um, rule out accuracy issues in diagnosis. Okay, frequency is all about prevalence and incidence. Cumulative incidence is one term which we are worried about in clinical epidemiology. For example, a group of people travel in crews and they get infected by some kind of uh, stom uh, flu, stomach flu or something. Mm -hmm. That is called as cumulative incidence. Then risk, we have four types of risk, absolute, attributable, relative and population risk. We are also worried about prognosis, but you must always remember one key point. The factors for risk and prognosis are different. Okay, two keywords, zero time and hazard ratio is what we are worried about in clinical epidemiology. Then again, treatment. Treatment can be intervention, randomized control trials, animal studies, in vitro trials, which can be used to again bridge the gap between people and the people and the technology we use. All three levels of prevention, we can take up clinical epidemiological studies. Thank you very much. I'm very sorry that I've rushed up because of want of time. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your wonderful presentation. Next, I would like to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Jamie Kapil, co-director, Kapil Dental Academy, private practice in aesthetic dentistry and ortho, Spain. We welcome you, sir. Over to you. Hello? Yes, sir. Is everything, is everything okay? Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. Okay. Audible. Perfect. Thank you, Matt. For, thank you very, nice, uh, very much for your nice presentation. Um, well, today we're living in a society that um, in which everything tries to move faster and faster, and we need um, to look for answers uh, like tissue healing uh, to speed uh, implant integration, to move teeth faster. Um, we are looking to fight against uh, biology and, um, and as there's, there was no limit. So my, my experience mostly is in Invisalign. I do multidisciplinary mm -hmm. treatments since uh, 2002. I work with my brother Antonio. He does the surgery and I um, these patients uh, with Invisalign looking for the best aesthetics. And um, before um, we talk about accelerating, we have to know how quickly how tooth movement is. So when we do some pores on a um, tooth, uh, uh, there's a ligament com periodontal compression. This affects uh, the start. The tooth starts moving because the periodontal fibril stretch and new bone is formed after this procedure. In, during this procedure, we will have um, activation and reabsorption, that's the catabolic process, and activation and formation, that's uh, the anabolic process of bone formation. We will also have inflammatory processes, and uh, these inflammatory processes will induce pain and increase the level of cortisol uh, th that will trigger stress. 
So how can we activate all these um, movements, knowing what, what was going on? So we will we talk about medication and supplements, how do they, they work, surgical methods, and also we will do, talk about physical and mechanical stimulation methods. Well, medication. Uh, we've seen that this has been good results using vitamin D, prostaglandins, interleukin, um, like, um, sorry, I'm going to close this, um, like uh, studies of Sevlac and Batsello. Uh, but uh, we've seen also that there are some studies that if you inject uh, like vitamin D directly in the ligament, periodontal ligament, you can find some root results absorption. So you have to be aware of that. What about supplements? Uh, vitamin C, vitamin E, sorry. We find vitamin E in many, I mean, um, sort of foods and also with supplements. When we are talking about supplements, we will talk about uh, not food, uh, but uh, the ingest of uh, Food is changing a lot, and we don't really know what uh, what vitamins we have really in our in our daily basis. So the studies I have uh, shown us that we can reduce stress caused by orthodontic force due to tooth movement. Sernop, uh, 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 with rats studies uh, using vitamin C. And you can have a better movement, especially the third day, and increased number of osteoblasts. It is shown also that these studies, they started like 15 days before they uh, did any tooth um, movement. And I, I think that's a really important point. Um, also, there are studies that show that systemic is better than injected. Um, it's better to, as we will explain later, to move um, the to treat the, the cells in, inside the cell, the systemic cells, rather than do it locally. What about vitamin C? Vitamin C, you have it in a lot of fruits, also uh, in uh, in uh, supplements. Be careful with supplements when uh, I really recommend powder powder or uh, really good absorption pills. Sometimes you can have kidneys uh, problems because people have supplements, but they don't drink water. So you can have a lot of, of, of kidney problems. Um, vitamin C uh, is better and faster movement in com in com combined with vitamin E. You can see the studies of Bolat. And also, it's seen that the vitamin C fasters the bone healing, and make it faster. So if we know that the, the healing is faster, uh, it would be a good thing to have it as a retention or prevention of relapse. Um, other studies uh, shown that the level of saliva vitamin C is lower in patients that have periodontal problems and ischemic heart disease. So the supplements there should be, of course, um, uh, given to the patient in case we are doing any, any treatment. What about antioxidants? We know what the cell happens, uh, when normal cell, when, when we have oxidative stress, there's very little antioxidants like lycopen or verta um, studies uh, with ortho, um, but we've seen uh, that the daily in the studies that and there's two or three studies that says that during the orthodontic uh, with braces mainly uh, treatment, um, the daily the dietary intake of of vitamin C and antioxidants is reduced in comparison with normal people. Here, here you have a study. So, what about stress? Um, 
um, stress is caused by a lack of balance between the production of a species reactive to oxygen and the capacity of the biology system to decodify the intermediate regions of, of repair the resilient, resilient damage. So we have stress not only when we're moving or we are doing our procedures, but we have stress because many things we have around. And we have to take note of that because it can affect our treatments. Uh, well, the epigenetic is a study of the changes in the genes, expressions, and we don't obey uh, uh, an alteration of the MBE sequence and heritage. Uh, the epigenetic is mostly affects 90% of the diseases. So if we have an imbalance in the normal redox, uh, can, this can cause toxic effects to the uh, peroxidase, free radicals, and damage all the cell components. So we have to have this balance. I will show you quickly two studies. One is really interesting. Um, Ambati, he, um, he gave lycopene uh, for uh, two months to the patients. And you will see the values of clinical attachment loss and modified index uh, that really were reduced without any, doing anything else. Then he stopped and he measured the values uh, without any, any supplementation. And you see that the, the scamming back, but it's lower than normal. Uh, but only, only something is going back really fast. That's the serum MBA. This is a measure uh, stress. Uh, this is also measured in sport, uh, uh, sportman uh, basically to know how muscles are, are not only teeth, of course, but muscles and everything are affected because of, of, of this serum. So you see it's reduced uh, mostly in two months, really a lot. And in six months, it's almost coming back. So it's really nice, this study, um, to, to show you how the effect of lycopene works in, in people that really have a, um, chronic uh, periodontal patients. What about surgical methods? Surgical methods, we do uh, direct lesion on bone and you accelerate ortho response uh, as, a, as a response of, of an inflammatory process. So we have four, we have, we have corticotinins, pietointhesians, micro, we call, we'll call it MOPs, micro osseo perforations, and micro implants. Of course, as uh, doc, Dr. Kapahavahali said, it is really important to have a good diagnosis before we do any of the tri these treatments to avoid any root damage. Um, you will see that nowadays, before we plan our uh, orthodontic treatments, we can have our intraoral scan and we can have also our CVCT together. So we know exactly the root positions and we, we need to move the, the root Outside the outside, or we we need surgery like this, and uh, here when we do a corticomy, is really we need to do a flap. Uh, this flap, of course, uh, sometimes needs some bone regeneration, and so um, this uh, this. Uh, Wilco was one of the first that we had the tomographies uh, about this this. Team. And then we have Pieth incision, sorry. I have to move backwards. I will show you a, a, a quick video of how this works. Normally, we will do as less invasive than the corticomy. We will have some tips, and I will, and you'll see. Sorry. You see, we use the blade, we do the incisions. I'm sorry. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time. And we, we do the incisions, and then we, we mark, um, we go like three millimeters inside the roots, 
and, um, and weaving. So we go to the mobs. Mobs. What about the mobs? Mobs were invented by Propel. And these are micro perforations that can be done in three, five, and seven millimeters. Um, this, um, this these are the instruments that normally you happen to use, but you can also use them. This is a um, uh, mist um, burr, initial burr, and with uh, three, 30 Newton and 50 RPM, we can um, short, a small video. It's very easy. You have to do in the anterior region like two um, two micro holes, no two mops. And if you go to the posterior, you need three holes in each side, mesial and distal of, 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 of the teeth. Here you see a clinical case where um, you uh, need a lot of expansion. Um, and we, it was treated with Invisalign and the mobs. Uh, it was a difficult case because it also had um, posterior crossbite, as you see. And of course, uh, using the mobs uh, helped us a lot to to um, help this this patient. Other physical and stimulation methods are laser, LED, vibration, electromagnetic fields, and electric currents. I didn't talk about micro implants because we were running out of time and it was short time, so we couldn't. But there are many lectures about that, and you will you will see that they're really useful when 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 we when we do orthodontic treatments. Laser, um, it's very um, reduces. Uh, I've been using laser for giving lectures uh, since two years ago. Um, Firstly, maybe we will use it as um, as um, a stimulate healing bone um, by stimulation mainly reduces pain, and that was that will be the effect of the of the most of the physical mechanical stimulation methods. So we the problem with laser nowadays is that we have many studies um, and there's many protocols. There's not a standard protocols. There's different lasers. There's different there's, there's different um, um, times of exposure. Um, you have to see the patient. Of, of course, it's very good to reduce pain. And we we when you start treating a patient with uh, razors and and the patients on the pain, if you place the laser, uh, that laser for for sure is gonna. We are talking about low, low level lasers. Then we have, uh, I think this is this something that will be the future. Uh, starting right now is the LED light. Uh, this, um, this LED light uh, really, uh, what happens is uh, this is like a infrared LED that is gonna um, go directly and uh, affect the mitochondria, so um, will increase uh, both both is, uh, the remodeling of the bone. Um, you can use it in many, uh, as you will see in, in later in other cases. I will I will show you, and um, and it's very practical because normally when we treat patients with Invisalign, there's many values that we do control the patient how much is he wearing the aligners. If you are using an accelerator tool. Or, advice, or device, you don't really know if he's wearing the, the, tool, the device or not. Nowadays, we can see that uh, we can control if he, the patient is, uh, is wearing this device or not. And so we know the compliance of the patient with the, with the treatment. Uh, that's something that when we do Invisalign, we know that the, we have no control of what the patient is doing. And, and we just, uh, have uh, we trust in the compliance of it. The other one is the vibration. Vibration uh, has been working for many years. It was uh, was used for hockey players to reduce them, them 
to, the, to increase the, the healing uh, treatment time of the, of the fractures, reduces pain. And especially with the liners, we, uh, I see that uh, the aligners fit better, so we would have more productivity. I'm just going to use some cases can combine with implants. And it was surprisingly when we saw the dental scan, uh, the CBCT, that we found some findings that I will want to share to you, with you. Um, this is the case. This is when we finished. Um, it went uh, something that works also well is that we have more productivity with using all these devices. So we have less refinement, refinements. So after the, we finished the, the root, and my brother Antonio placed the, the implants, we, we needed to do um, as usual sinus lifts. Uh, you will see the, the implant placed, everything very nice, but here's the beginning, the ending. But I want to show to you something really interesting. Sorry? Go back. Well, you see the bone and the to the left side, uh, there's more bone uh, surrounding the implant, um, the more condensation of the bone. Um, this could be due to the lead. This can be due to the implant placed, but you really see that the, 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 the condensation of the bone is much higher on the right side and the left side. The patient used the, the um, Orthopulse method for, for a lot of for all the for all the treatment. I want to show you this really impact impressive case. This is a patient that came to me uh, like uh, two or three days after she had an accident. She lost her four front teeth, and she went to the hospital and they replaced the, the teeth and they they fixed them with a wire. Uh, the tooth, as you see, uh, the teeth were with a lot of mobility. You, here you see the, the um, CVCT with very little bone to the upper left, right, where, where the tooth was placed is outside the bone. And so we uh, started to use the orthopulse device. This is one month after the treatment, then we changed the wire and, and she wanted to, to, to look better because the wire was in front and was horrible. And so we move it and we do some composite, not uh, looking for a lot of, of um, aesthetic. She wanted a little bit wider her teeth, but see the, the, the um, gum problem we have on the front, right? The other ones uh, stayed uh, in, in the mouth. So we, after six months, you will see the healing. So we decided as the teeth were outside the bone to start moving the, the teeth uh, backwards with Invisalign. There was, uh, after one month, there was a complete healing of the, of the bone and there was no mobility. So we were happy to try and to move them back. Here's the um, CBCT at the beginning. This is one year after the accident. And I want to share to you the same, um, uh, you see the bones surrounding the central incisors is uh, the width and the condensation is much uh, higher than 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 in the other teeth. And this is uh, something that really is impressive. So the the teeth are really holding well. We have to do some aesthetic and gum procedures afterwards, but um, I think it's a really interesting case because the teeth were loosened. And it was really complicated. We need to do the um, we need to do the root canal and the uh, lateral right and central incisors. But uh, aesthetically, she's working well. You see the attachments in the lower right. Um, and in the future, uh, we'll see. We are seeing, um, as you see, um, a lot of mask with lead like this. Uh, this induces collagen. Um, mostly people use it to, to avoid aging. Um, that is something um, that we can think about because I think there's a, um, a big opportunity, a big chance to, to study in this, in this line. 
Um, these are the studies, uh, some of the studies I've used. Um, and um, I'm just finishing. As I said, I was, uh, I'm chairman of the uh, European Society of, Cosme of Cosmetic Dentistry. With, this is one of our, our uh, congresses, uh, international congresses. I definitely um, join, uh, I would like you, if you will join us, it will be great. And the final conclusions is that supplements, yes, they optimize and accelerate our orthodontic treatment in surgical procedures. We really have to pay attention, especially in periodontal disease patients. I think this will be very, really helpful. Uh, as you've seen, vitamin C, E, lycopene, and beta carotene. In surgical procedures uh, are needed also to improve productivity and will, of course, course, accelerate. And physical and medical stimulations will also reduce pain and speed, uh, well, increase the speed and reduce pain. Uh, and it should be focused also to be uh, treated in multidisciplinary cases. Um, of course, there's still lack of studies. Uh, there's no study at all of combining all the So, Thank you all very much, and I think I'm on time. Um, if there, is there any questions that I can answer you. Hello? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm done. Is there any okay. questions? Is there any questions to ask to sir? Okay, sir. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, I would like to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Roberto Caridu, Clinical Supervisor, Department of Endodontics, Dunedin College, Dublin, Ireland. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. You are audible, sir. Yeah, we are not Sir, uh, kindly unmute your microphone, sir. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Great. Okay, thanks. So I, I was saying that uh, um, I'm very happy and thank you for the invitation to, to be with you today. Today, we're going to talk about the endodontic evolution. My name is Roberto Careddu, and let me introduce myself. I was... Uh, uh, Sorry, just one second. Okay, yeah. I was uh, born and raised in, uh, in Italy, in Sardinia, where I got my primary degree and uh, my master in endodontics. Then I moved to Spain for a diploma in microendodontics. And now I'm working and living in, uh, in Dublin, where uh, I work uh, privately as an endodontist and I do research uh, at the Trinity College of Dublin. But let's stop talking about me and focus on our topic, that is uh, the modern endodontics. And when we're talking about modern endodontics, we're basically talking about uh, minimally invasive in endodontics. Um, there is a trend in dentistry and definitely in endodontics uh, to be uh, more conservative, to try to preserve as much uh, uh, tooth structure as possible, just because um, this uh, um, the, the the tooth is the best uh, uh, thing that the nature can uh, can give uh, to our mouth, uh, and we don't have a substitute that is uh, as good as the nature. So um, we we are called to be more conservative, keeping the same objectives that are shaping, cleaning, and obturating correctly our, uh, our root canal space. But whenever we are approaching a root canal treatment, there is always uh, uh, an obstacle in our road towards success, which is the anatomy. The anatomy is a variable that we cannot control and, uh, um, and that we have to master if we want to reach the, the right results. Uh, 
And this is an important article from Schaffer. They examined a lot of routes, finding out that at the end of the day, almost all routes, especially in molars, are curved with different degrees of curvatures. And uh, uh, basically, this is just to say that whenever we are approaching uh, a tooth, we have to expect some, uh, some difficulties, something that is not so straightforward. So what has changed in endodontics? In 2007, this was the recommendation for uh, a cavity access opening. So a cavity access, so access opening that can allow us to see all the orifices without moving them out mirror. Today, I would say that these treatments are overly aggressive for the tooth. So what was said before was an error? Definitely not. It was just uh, coming from a, a rational that uh, uh, that has some value because if you open more you improve the visibility you reduce the fatigue uh, of the instrument and so the risk of breakage and uh, uh, the risk of creating ledges stripping and perforation but all of this comes from some compromises that often there was no magnification that our instrument had poor uh, resistance and they were particularly stiff so if I keep an axis very small and I go with an, um, a very stiff instrument, when I go down, in this case, on the mesial route, I will create either a ledge or I will stre stress the tooth so much that, uh, the, the sorry, the instrument so much that it's going to break. So if I open more like this, I can actually uh, make an easier path for my for my instrument to work uh, to work on the tooth so that was the rationale and uh, it, all of this came to uh, overcome two problems problem number one our instrument were quite stiff so if you have a, a, a stiff instrument uh, you can straighten the curvatures you can create ledges you can create zipping and perforation and then the problem number two which is the the main fear who, who for whoever does endo and is the instrument separation then if something like this if an instrument separates uh, uh, we can always uh, deal with it I deal with a lot of cases that are referred to me for instrument separation and we can deal with it uh, uh, as in the first case uh, with uh, uh, with a bypass or as in the second case for uh, um, with the extraction of the instrument but of course it's something that we want to avoid because it's stressful for us it's stressful for the patients and uh, it can be even a legal issue so having said that how comes that today we can perform a root canal treatment of a rapper molar finding mb1 mb2 all the canals through an axis that is as small as this smaller than a uh, an apical stopper well definitely the anatomy didn't change what has changed is the materials the knowledge and the skills that we have in endo the main changes in endodontics are three, magnification, alloys, and the materials for obturation. Of course, it takes ages to talk about all these topics, uh, but today we will focus a bit on the alloys. So uh, the stainless steel instrument, the manual stainless steel instrument, are they still useful since now we have the nickel titanium? I would say yes. I use the K files. I use the number six, the number eight, and the number 10 for scouting. I don't like the number 15. I don't like the number 15 because it's an instrument that is uh, rigid enough to uh, create ledges. And uh, whenever um, there are small curvatures, the, the number 15 can create issues. Uh, I like a lot the C plus files that are uh, ultra stiff instrument. Uh, that I use for bypassing instruments or in very calcified canals. And they like a lot this instrument, the 12.5. I call it the lifesaver because it's usually the instrument that allows me to uh, bypass an instrument or a ledge. Now, uh, 
we had stainless steel, but since uh, uh, since the eighties, now we have the nickel titanium or nitinol, uh, that is uh, the the main uh, um, material used for uh, for our files. And uh, the, the nickel titanium uh, has been proved to be better than uh, the stainless steel uh, instrument because it's easier to achieve a good quality root canal. Uh, it stays more centered in the canal. There is less risk of fracture. So basically, we we have um, a way to try to overcome the problems of the, the classic instrument, the classic manual instrument that was the creation of ledges, perforation and zipping. And this was thanks to the, uh, to the fact that they are more resistant and more flexible due to the fact that they, are so, they, they have this uh, super elasticity so they can bend much more and they have a memory shape so the, the instrument um, doesn't deform uh, as much as uh, the stainless steel. I don't want to enter in the material science, but uh, it is important to understand how the nickel titanium works. The classic nickel titanium has three uh, phases. So the same alloy can go through three phases. The first phase is the austenitic uh, phase. That is when the instrument is stiff. Uh, but if, you, if we stress the instrument, uh, uh, we reach an R phase that is an intermediate phase. So the instrument becomes softer until we reach the martensitic phase, which is the softest form of our alloy, the, the form that we want to use uh, inside our canals because um, the, the instrument can curve more. So if we take an old, uh, an old instrument like a pro taper universal, uh, an austenitic instrument, I take it from out from the box and uh, uh, I have it in austenitic phase. But in so it is the stiffest form. But whenever I put it inside the canal and put it in rotation, this um, this kind of stress that we create on the instrument uh, allow us to reach the R phase and then the martensitic phase. So the instrument becomes softer and softer as soon as uh, it's stressed inside the canal. And whenever we are removing the instrument from the canal, little by little, it comes back to the austenitic phase. So it becomes stiff again. So it is a material, the nickel titanium, that changes its nature, let's say, during the treatment. So... Uh, this is valid for the first generation of uh, um, nickel titanium files and for the second generation of nickel titanium file, the so-called M wire. Uh, so from the first generation, there was a neat treatment and we got the M wire, which is uh, an alloy that is stronger and more flexible. But today we are in the uh, third generation of heat treated nickel titanium files, the so called martensitic files. They are called martensitic because already at room temperature, so whenever we take it out from the box, they are already in a martensitic file, uh, in a martensitic phase, and they become even more softer. And uh, uh, these new materials are just uh, easier and better to use. Why? Because they are more flexible, um, because they are already in the soft form, and they are much more resistant than uh, the, the previous um, root canal uh, instruments, uh, even the nickel titanium, uh, the nickel titanium ones. So uh, they are safer to use. So going into an history of the uh, the root canal instrument we have uh, the martin city the austenitic fi um, files that are the first two that we can see here so the uh, the first uh, instrument created and then the m wire like the pro taper next they are m wire uh, files then the martin city uh, um, the martin city instrument like the blue alloy we probably know uh, a lot, uh, the reciproc blue, uh, then the gold alloy, that is like the wave one uh, gold, and the files that we are going to talk about today, um, that are uh, uh, the Orodeca, which is a control memory wire. And uh, the, the more the file is on the right of your screen, the more is Martin City, so the more is softer. Now, uh, why? Uh, they are they are just better because we have an increased flexibility, uh, an increased resistance, and because the files 
can bend much more they keep the center position inside of the canal allowing us to respect the anatomy much more so this is a brief video just to show you sorry uh, just to show you the difference between the alloy this is a protaper next so a austenitic file uh, can it bend yes definitely it can bend you can see there it bends without problem and then it comes back to its natural position. So there is this elastic return, and this is important for what we are doing inside the canal. If I take a martensitic file, uh, I can bend it. It bends even better. And then it doesn't come back completely straight. So because it's martensitic, because it's softer, we can bend it. There is some elastic return in this case, but it bends much more even at room temperature then an, an even more martensitic uh, file like uh, the orodeca plex v so we can bend this file and then when the 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 file is uh, is bent we can bend it even more and there is basically no elastic returns means meaning that the the instrument keeps the uh the, the position that we are uh, uh, that we are giving it uh, um, when we are inside uh, a curved canal. So the instrument doesn't want to straighten the canal. The instrument was wants just to clean it following the anatomy. And uh, you can see now I'm bending uh, the two martensitic files, and there is a difference in bending. Uh, so the difference is that uh, I can bend much more an Orodeca file. Uh, while uh, I can bend the, uh, the blue alloy, uh, but the, the bending is not the same. The curvature maintained is not the same. Now, I'm not saying that one instrument is better than the other because uh, uh, a very soft instrument is important in the very curved canals. But for instance, in a calcified canal or uh, uh, when I'm doing a retreatment, there is no point of using uh, um, a material like a very soft uh, Martin City file, uh, while uh, we can uh, uh, we can use an austenitic file that lead us better inside the canals. Uh, and you can see uh, here, I can bend the both of them without breaking them because they are very, 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 very resistant. Uh, and all these materials are are good all these files are great the important thing is that we know what we are using and what we are when we are using it uh, is uh, endo is done with our head and our hands uh, is not the, the instrument that changes so there is a lot of availability in the market uh, it is important to know the concept of endo and then adapt uh, our skills to the materials that we have. And in the past, we used to adapt the anatomy of the canal to, uh, to our file sequence, but now we're adapting the files to the anatomy that we have. Always remembering our aim, that is eliminating bacteria. Uh, this is an important article from Saini that says that size matters. What does it mean? That it does mean that uh, it has been proven that we have to enlarge our apex up to a certain point, three times more uh, than the first apical binding file, uh, in order to allow proper disinfection of the apex. And uh, um, there is a problem though that whenever we have a severe curvature if we try to to bring um to bring um a file that is uh, uh, that is quite uh, quite large we have a, an higher risk of uh, transporting the apex or fracture the instrument so uh, the the solution that was taught in curved canal was to reduce the apical preparation, which is safer, but at the same time, it causes insufficient detersion. So basically, uh, we are not cleaning enough. So what is the solution for real? Is to increase the apical diameter, decreasing the taper. So the instrument is thinner, 
even if at the apex as as a larger uh, as a larger gauging. Uh, in this way, we can uh, work even in curved canals with big apical diameters. This was uh, possible because the new alloys uh, allow us to have more resistant instrument that we can um, we can use with big taper uh, like uh, um, sorry big uh, uh, apical gauging like a 35 or a 40 but with a, a 4% taper so that means that if before all the instrument was working inside the canal uh, now with a taper that is smaller we make uh, just this part of the instrument uh, um, working so that means less stress plus the instrument uh, bends a lot so it can follow the curvature without uh, stretching uh, the canal in this way, we can adapt our preparation to the anatomy of the tooth and customize our endo. So every canal can be uh, treated in a different way in order to achieve the best, uh, um, the best shaping and the best irrigation possible. So this is a case that, uh, that shows us why uh, it is important to uh, not uh, use very thick files uh, coronally. So the importance of a, a taper that is 0 0.4 or even less in order to not uh, destroy too much uh, too much tooth. Um, this is a tooth that was sent to me because of uh, uh, a pulp necrosis due to a fracture underneath an amalgam. And the size of the, um, the, the cavity access was very small because there is a crack here. So I didn't want to over uh, stress the tooth that was already cracked. And uh, we can perform our root canal safely uh, with uh, these instruments that curve quite a lot, uh, but we are shaping the, uh, the root canal properly without <coughs> destroying too much tooth in this particular area that we see here. This area is called the pericervical <coughs> dentin, and this is a bundle of dentin that goes around uh, the CEJ, basically, and is the area where we don't want to remove too much dentin because uh, uh, this uh, pericervical dentin is the dentin that is the, the structure that maintains the strength of the tooth uh, and of the restoration. So we want to keep this um this structure nice and solid and this is why it is important not to over prepare our teeth in the coronal uh, in the coronal part because anyway the coronal part is the area where the disinfectant reaches uh, easily if we take a, a very tapered instrument so a, an instrument that is very large uh, in the coronal portion, we are treating an area of the tooth that is not of any interest for us, and we are just destroying the tooth a little bit more. Today, we're going to talk about the uh, Orodecaplex V. Uh, now, uh, we're, we're going to talk about these particular instruments, but uh, any instrument is, is good if you know how to use it. I as I was saying before, there are a lot of good instruments. I use a lot of them and uh, the endo is done with your hand and head, not with your instruments. So it's important to know what we are using. This is the basic sequence, the one on the left, uh, and then the apical finishers that are optional. Uh, well, the, the, the manufacturer says uh, they are optionals for me. They are very important and I will explain why uh, in, a, in a few moments. Uh, I like them because they are flexible, they are conservative on coronal dentin because the taper is 04 and they, they basically don't break. They are special indicated for long canals and for curved canals because they, they flex a lot. Now, coming for our root canal preparation, so uh, first of all, what we have to do is the scouting. There is a, a, a question like, should we do manual scouting? Should we do um, like mechanical scouting? I love the mechanical scouting, but I still recommend um, to, to, to go for the scouting with a number 10 file before going for the sequence with a Rodeca. Uh, and then there is the pre-flaring file, which is a, an orifice opener, is a fat file, uh, 1503, and we use it to uh, open our uh, our orifices in a way that our canals will uh, will be easier 
to clean. So this is a 226 with an acute apical abscess, and uh, uh, I treated the MB1 with the preflaring after scouting with a number 10 uh, K5. And uh, um, I went uh, pointing on the uh, canal, and then there is a brush movement. This is the only file of the sequence that has to be used in brushing because this file allow us to open the, uh, the coronal part of the canals. Then the MB2, I went before the scouting. So I pointed on the MB2 and then I went down. The file is very soft, so follows the canal. You use it in brushing movement and you see how many debris uh, uh, come up. Uh, and in uh, a few strokes, basically you have uh, ensured uh, an access to your canals that is nice uh, and clean. And in this way, you can perform the rest of your root canal with no problem. Then there is the glad pipe file, which is a 1503, a very uh, thin file, has to reach the apex passively. And uh, um, uh, basically, this is, a, this is a file that bends a lot and, uh, um, and it reaches passively the end of, of the root canal. We can alternate that with the orifice opener. So the first file that we were talking about, uh, if we see that there is some coronal interference. Then there are the shaping files, the 2004 and the 2504. These files, we have to use it in a peaking movement. So up and down, up and down um, for, uh, uh, for uh, several movement until we reach the end of the route. Gentle strokes, clean the spires and irrigate in between every step with our, um, with our shaping file. There is another shaping file that is the 2506. I use it for largest canals like an, up, an upper uh, central incisor. In this case, there was also a lateral canal here that I was able to scout uh, and this is the final uh, result. So a larger um, uh, taper, uh, is for a larger canal. And these are the finishing files. The finishing files are the files that I like better. Uh, why? Because they allow me to prepare my uh, apical part of the canal in an easy, predictable, and quick way. And because these files are so bendable, uh, even if we, we bring a 40, a 50, there is also the 55, the 45 uh, files, um, uh, even if we bring big uh, apical diameters, they follow the curvature. They don't destroy the, uh, the tooth. And in two seconds, I have my uh, root canal prepared till the apex uh, gouging, till the apical gouging that I want that ensures uh, my, my cleaning of the canal. And this is another quick video just uh, on how these, uh, uh, these files are easy to use. So... Uh, this is an upper six, uh, a normal access, and uh, I went with a 30 or four uh, for uh, the mesial canals. And you see how easy it is to go. The, the, the instrument goes nice and easy up to the end of the root, and I have a root canal prepare up to 30. Now, this is a 50 on the palette. Oh, you can see how easy it is to reach uh, um, my apical portion. And I go for another stroke, and then it's your apex prepared. You have just to irrigate and obturate, uh, and there is no problem. So it's very, very easy to, um, to, to do your root canal and to customize your endo in this way. Alternatively, you have to do it by hand. Now, uh, this is the management of the 70% of the canals. So after the scouting, uh, you go with the 1508, so the orifice opener, you open the uh, coronal part, and then you go. Uh, I always recommend to check the working length after the orifice opener, because the orifice opener, uh, removing uh, the coronal uh, interferences can have, uh, can have an issue. Um, uh, with the working length, so the working length uh, can change after we use uh, uh, we use any file. Actually, you will see a lot of drops. Uh, every time that you see a drop here is because I recommend to irrigate in every step. Irrigation is paramount for uh, our uh, success in in root canal. Then after you check the working length, you go with uh, fifteen or three, and then twenty. 
04, 25, 04, and this is the basic sequence. I always recommend to go at least uh, up to 30, 04 uh, for, um, uh, for your root canal uh, treatment. And uh, about the taper, how we decide what taper to use. In the in the top part, uh, we had large canals and a large opening um, in in this upper uh, in this lower uh, first molar. While in this upper first molar, we have uh, an axis that is much more reduced because I was doing a, a cavity driven axis, so passing through the uh, through the filling. And uh, in this case, I have canals that are much, uh, much more narrow and our um, access cavity is narrower. So in this case, I want a taper 04 and not a taper 06. Uh, so how to decide the taper, cavity design, canal size, and the way we want to obturate. Uh, the, the lower one was obturated with bioceramics. The top one was uh, obturated with a warm vertical compaction technique. So the obturation is one of the uh, key to decide which taper we should use. Now, uh, also for canals like this, it is important to know how to, to, to deal with them because if the canal is very large, in the coronal part, uh, what we have to use is a lot uh, the uh, orifice opener because with the brushing movement, we are ensuring that all this large canal at the, at the coronal portion is well cleaned. Uh, in a case like this, where the, this case was sent to me because the tutor was very damaged, the patient was in pain, and uh, uh, we wanted to preserve as much dentin as possible because the tooth was very damaged by the decay, plus there was an old um, filling. And uh, uh, even if we are preparing correctly our, our tooth, um, basically we are, uh, we are conserving and preserving the dentin at the pericervical area. And then we can restore the tooth as we want. In this case, uh, uh, I was using... Uh, um, some uh, um, reinforced uh, uh, resin, uh, resin re reinforced with fiber. And you see, even if uh, a root canal uh, is system is long as this one, these are 27 and 28 millimeters long roots, uh, but we are still preserving the anatomy. We are still doing uh, a refined job without over enlarging the coronal part. And in this case, uh, where there are the small apical curvature like the one at the uh, at the distal uh, root, uh, the 1503, so the path file uh, of Orodeca is very helpful because it cleans uh, without uh, creating ledges. Preserving dentin is also important when a problem is created. This case was referred to me because uh, they couldn't find the, um, the mesial canals and uh, they created a perforation. So there was a small perforation. Uh, then I found the MB1 orifice that was a little bit farther back. And, uh, uh, and then I performed the root canal. There were two separated canals in the mesial, uh, but you can see if we go in the coronal portion that um, the, the canals were not over overly treated. And uh, in this case, we can have MB1 and then the, the correction of the perforation and then MB2, and we are still uh, uh, preserving our dentin and we can then restore the tooth properly without, uh, uh, without problems and without uh, overstressing the remaining, uh, the remaining dentin. Uh, for the management of curved canals, every, um, Every manufacturer give us the same uh, scheme like for normal canal and they ask to add a number eight file before the number 10 for the scouting. Uh, I wish it was so straightforward, it's not like that. And uh, usually we have, uh, we have much more difficulties. So we need to, to, to know some tips and tricks. Uh, this is an upper, uh, an upper seven and uh, um, people are usually uh, afraid of the curvatures like this on the mesial, uh, on the mesial fruit. But actually this is an easy uh, curve because the curve is progressive. What is the problem in here and in many 
upper molar is the distal root that usually has a, a small hook at the end. And this is where the file manual 15 uh, can create the ledge, can create the problem. This is the difficult curvature. Of course, we can manage it, but we have to be careful. Uh, in this case, uh, I recommend a change in our um, in our scheme, let's say. So um, I recommend to go with uh, file number six for the scouting, uh, then uh, the preflating with the 1508, and then number six, eight, and 10 uh, manual file before going with the 1503, so before going mechanically. And if uh, um, then when we go to do the shaping, if we find the difficulty with the 2004, so with our first shaping file, what I recommend is to go back to the uh, orifice opener because maybe uh, with an enlargement coronally, we can uh, send the file down uh, easier. And once the 2004 has reached the, uh, the, the apex, uh, uh, well, the 25 and the 3004 will follow without any problem. This is a case of a 10 years old patient, three mesial canals, quite curves, uh, quite curved uh, mesial uh, root. And in this case, I had that problem. So my 2004 wasn't going uh, down uh, so easily. So I went back with the uh, 1508. So I uh, shaped a little bit more coronally and then uh, uh, the obturation uh, and the shaping of the, the canals uh, was, uh, was possible in an easy way. Sometimes uh, the canals are very curved. And even if you do this process, uh, the 2004, um, so your first shaping file, uh, doesn't go all the way down. In this case, uh, you have two options. Pushing the file, and I don't recommend it for any file, uh, or stop there and think what you can do. I recommend to stop there. And uh, if your canal is 20 millimeters long and you arrive till 17, uh, you stop there, you irrigate a lot, and then you go with the next file. So with a 2504 up to 17, up to the area where you arrived. And after that, after a new irrigation, you will see that because the, uh, the the file that you used is larger than the uh, the 2004, your 2004 will reach the end of the route without too many issues. And as we, we told before, uh, the after the 2004 has reached the, the, the apex, the 25 and the 3004 will just follow. And even if the canals are very curved, you can easily, um, you can easily uh, shape the canals. In a case a bit extreme like this, where a patient was sent to me with a recently cemented crown, uh, severe curvatures, and the patient wanted to keep the crown there, uh, we can still perform the root canal. We can still perform a root canal from a hole that is smaller than uh, the, the stopper, but we need to be more careful. First of all, always, 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 make sure that you work well with your uh, manual files, with your number six, your number 10, and your number eight, uh, because you need to know uh, how the canal is, how the canal is, uh, um, like how, how the curvature are. And this is a sensation that you get just with the manual files. After that, uh, we can go without problems with our, um, with our uh, files, but something that they recommend, if we look at the mesial canal, for instance, let's say that the mesial canal is uh, um, uh, as the curvature after uh, 20 millimeters. Imagine that the canal is uh, long 23 and uh, uh, we have the last millimeters of curve, but up to um, to the 20 millimeters, the root canal is more or less okay to treat. So in this case, I prepare the all with the old file system till 2504 uh, into the uh, into the first 20 millimeters, and then the last three millimeters, I do it. Uh, um, I, I redo the shaping. In this way, we are making sure that we are not overstressing our instruments. Uh, um, in the in the tough curvatures, because basically the 
the tough part of the curvature is done when the rest of the canal is nice and enlarged, light, nice and shaped. And in particular, in this tooth, there is uh, uh, a lateral canal on the palatal. And uh, uh, in this case, a trick that I recommend is to use a 15 or 3. We bend it before because it is, uh, as, it was, as we were seeing before, uh, these files can bend quite easily and they maintain the bending, I can bend the file, insert it inside the lateral canal, and then activate my motor. In this way, I can clean all the canals and I, I can ensure a nice root canal treatment. This is for the management of a curved canal as well. Um, same story, you prepare up to the 25 or four, and then you go with the other files um, in the very tough curvature and in this way you can ensure that you will have a successful mm -hmm. canal without uh, too many issues so just a few take office messages um first of all the fact that modern endodontics is done with magnification it is important to use at least loops um the new alloys uh, it is important to know what we are using um, the difference between austenitic files and martensitic files, all the files uh, are, uh, um, are usable. It is important to know why and when use one file and one, why and when use another file. Um, uh, with the martensitic files, we can decrease the taper and increase in the apical size and is easier to use. It is important to choose the files that you um that you like and uh, that works well in your hand and the obturation of the root canal is uh, another important uh, uh, important uh, uh, thing to uh, to have as a change of course we cannot talk about everything today uh, but the obturation and the obturation materials are important. Talking about the Orodeca, this is the basic sequence. They are very flexible and they respect the anatomy. And the finishing files are uh, easy for uh, controlling the apical gouging. I want to thank you for uh, your attention. Uh, these are my contacts. Uh, if you if, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, to ask. Uh, if you want uh, uh, to contact me uh, either on uh, on Instagram or via mail, uh, these are my contacts, and uh, I will be more than happy to uh, to chat with you. Thank you a lot. Thank you for the uh, for the nice meeting, for the invitation. I want to thank all the organization and all of you that are here with me uh, today. Thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful presentation. Next, I would like to welcome our next guest speaker, Dr. Manish Kumar, Professor, Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute, Rajasthan, India. We welcome you, sir. Over to you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I think uh, the screen is visible to all of you. And I'm yes, audible. Sir. Yes, sir. Audible. Sir. Okay. Screen okay. is visible, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Manish, uh, professor at uh, Surendra Dental College from Department of Oral Pathology. Today, I will be talking about a diagnostic approach in field cancerization, a current concept. So starting with oral cancer is a serious and grow, global, grow, global growing problem in many part of South Asian countries. And the main predominant site is the oral cavity. Therefore, the survival rate of the patient has substantially reduced in past 20 to 30 years because of the two reasons. The first reason is late diagnosis and the second reason is recurrence of the lesion. So here in field cancerization, the main objective is to identify the lesion before uh, it uh, turns into a malignancy and we will try to prevent the recurrence. Therefore, tumor of head and neck have been proposed to reflect a field cancerization. 
process where the tissue region is thought to be exposed to carcinogenic insult and is at increased risk for multi-step tumor development. So why field cancerization is important, we will discuss that only for the two reasons, to assess the risk of first and second primary tumor and individual, those who have already been exposed with a first primary tumor and remain at a very high risk for developing a second primary tumor. So here we will try to understand what is the concept of field cancerization. So we will go back to 1953 when Slaughter et al. has described a histologically abnormal tissue that was surrounding the oral squamous carcinoma. So that was the first time when Slaughter has given the concept of field cancerization. Later on, based on the recent molecular finding, the field cancerization was defined as the presence of one or more area of epithelial cell that have genetic alterations, monoclonal origin, and does not show invasive growth and metastatic behavior. To understand this definition, we will see the image that is present below. Okay, so there are two images from the same tissue biopsy. And on the left hand side, we can see, on the left hand, we can see that, uh, we can see that uh, it is stained with H and D uh, stain. And on the right hand side, the same tissue is stained with immunohistochemistry. Left hand side, the basic H and D stain uh, tissue shows no apparently damaged cell. It is apparently appearing normal. However, when the immunohistochemistry was done, it is exposing and it is showing that the cells are mutated, but still not reflecting the dysplastic feature. So this is the point where we have to understand how the lesion is creating and how it is generating. So there comes the role of field cancerization. So to understand how a field develops, we have to first understand what is a patch because field cancerization always begins in the form of patch. Patch is nothing but a cluster of cells that are actually mutated, but not manifesting itself in the form of dysplasia or neoplastic cells. And these cluster of cells are usually less than 200 in number. So these are genetically altered cells. So what we see over here is when these patch, which are mutil, uh, mutated, does not show any manifestations of dysplasia are left and not treated, it will usually convert all the other cell because of uh, monoclonal proliferation and convert the entire region into a, a field which are mutated. And still these cells you can see that are not uh, showing any dysplastic features. And then eventually what happens, this will get converted into a malignancy and it will become invasive. Okay, so that was the concept of patch and field cancerization. There are other terminologies also that we need to understand. And those are second field tumor and second primary tumor. We will try to understand that also. So before that, we will see how a field cancerization, cancerization manifests itself. So this is an image of a tongue. Okay, this is a uh, clinical picture of a tongue. We can see multiple tumors that are developing on the same site. Okay, at a... Uh, slight distance. So this is how a field will generate multiple tumors. And it is very important to keep in mind before performing our surgeries to eradicate or to resect all the sections that are responsible uh, for field generation. Now, with the, with the help of this image, we will try to understand what is a field cancerization, what is a primary tumor and second field tumor. Now, what we can see over here is all the blue cells that are marked over here are mutated. So this is a part of a tumor which has already been invaded. And the other part of the blue cells are mute, mutated cells. However, it is not showing any dysplastic features. The cells which are showing pink color are apparently normal cells, doesn't having any mutation in it. So what, what such type of cases, when it comes, the surgeon will try to resect these portion, keeping a safe margin. And then what happens when uh, this tumor is resected, keeping a safe margin, at times you can see on the right hand side, there is an independent feel of mutated cells, which has not yet manifested itself in dysplasia. Tumor can develop from there. If a tumor develops from an independent field, it is called a second primary tumor. On the left hand side, we can see 
there is a field there are few cells that are left over from the field which is mutated okay but are apparently appearing normal if a tumor developed from these cells it is called a second field tumor so now we have understood what is the difference between a second field tumor and second primary tumor second primary tumor is always independent in nature and field tumor is part of a field okay so uh, these are the differences that actually differentiate between second primary and second field tumor second primary tumor always develop independently the distance from the main tumor is more than 2 cm and it approximately take around 3 year to develop after the resection of the primary tumor second field tumor have a, uh, develop or origin originate from the same field however the distance is less than 2 cm from the primary tumor so now to identify or to diagnose what is the reason for the mutation in the cell we need to first understand what is actually happening in a cellular uh, cascade cellular multiplication so we can see uh, these are the uh, cellular signaling pathway okay so epithelial growth receptor basically this epithelial growth receptor comes in contact with the uh, epithelial growth factor will come in contact with the receptor and it will activate ras ras will further activate kinase cascade and this kinase cascade include raf mek and mapk so these kinase cascade are usually present in the cytoplasm of a cell once these are activated it will activate few proteins that are present in the nucleus and those are c mike and cyclin d once cyclin d is activated what it does is it enhances the level of cyclin dependent kinase so this is an important enzyme which is actually responsible for cell proliferation and how it pro helps to proliferate it will cause phosphorylation of retinoblastoma protein and these retinoblastoma protein once get phosphorylated Mama, will when will the presentation start ma'am uh, it will release e2f factor coming call from spam company it will release e2f factor and these e2f factor will cause dna replication how it does does the dna replication with the help of pcna pcna is uh, proliferating cellular nuclear antigen so this is when something goes wrong within the nucleus due to the mutation p53 gets activated and this over expression of p53 will lead to activation of p21 that will inhibit the activity of cyclin dependent kinase now we know since cyclin dependent kinase if inhibited it will prevent the release of e2f factor from the retinoblastoma so there is not going to be any cellular replication on the other hand p53 also activate bax protein and bax will cause cellular death that is apoptosis in uh, apoptosis so this was a overall idea about what are the proteins and the genes that are responsible for cellular multiplication okay so we will try to understand in diagnostic criteria about the over expressions of these protein and genes so these are the criteria that are responsible for identification histopathological immunohistochemical and molecular criteria so uh, in histopathological criteria it is impossible to identify uh mutated cells until and unless it shows a dysplastic feature or a neoplastic feature so there is no point of discussing epithelial dysplasia okay because field cancerization the main objective is to identify a cell at a such level where the dysplastic manifestations are not seen in the cell or in the tissue so let us go into the immunohistochemical criteria now all the cellular cascade just now we have seen we will try to uh find out these over expressions expressions of these uh, genes as well as proteins in immunohistochemical criteria so what we see is we will see the over expression of epithelial growth factor and its receptor in case of dysplasia and cerb2 uh, protein which is also over expressed in case of dysplasia so these are the two uh, uh, growth factors as well as uh, proteins that are responsible for normal cellular proliferation now transcription factor uh, transcription factor are those factor in this what happens the proteins and the genes that are responsible for copying the content of dna inside the nucleus 
and it is done by messenger RNA and it will then send the information to the cytoplasm where it is translated by the ribosome. So these are the protein and genes that are actually responsible for transcription factor uh, that is responsible for cell cycle. And what we observe is that we will see overexpression of all these proteins. There are n numbers of proteins that are possible that are uh, present, but however, I have discussed few of them which are extremely important. Then comes the role of prostaglandin synthesis. Now, prostaglandin synthesis is a marker of inflammation. Usually, we see uh, COX-1 and COX-2 receptors that are releasing prostaglandin. However, we have also seen there are many studies that have supported that the release of COX-2 is present in a malignant neoplasm. So the uh, COX-2 gene and COX-2 protein is also overexpressed in case of malignant cases. Now we will start to talk about the molecular criteria. Molecular criteria have permitted the description of specific molecular and phenotype event associated with oral cancer development. So in molecular under molecular criteria, we will see immortalization. Immortalization, the cell will continuously proliferate without uh, any stop. So how the immortalization process is continued? So we know that uh, every nucleus is composed of chromosome and at the end of the chromosome, there is a non-coding DNA, which is called as telomeres. So you can see the telomeres, which are uh, depicted with the pink color. These telomeres uh, uh, basically get shortened after the cell multiply itself. So maybe after 50 to 70 replication, the telomere shortens in the shape and the size. So what happens once the telomere becomes small, the cell will stop multiplying. However, there is an enzyme which is called as telomerase. If there is upregulation or excessive release of these enzymes, it will cause a continuous multiplication of a cell, which makes it um, uh, mutated or monoclonal, which shows monoclonal proliferation of a cell, and it will cause mutation. Okay, so in case of cancer, we will see uh, upregulation of telomerase enzyme. And the last one, what we will be discussing over here is loss of heterozygosity. Heterozygosity means we, as we know that chromosome has two alleles and one of the alleles, if it is mutated, there is chances that the normal uh, composition of a cell or normal functioning of a cell can be prevented by the normal allele. Okay. But however, due to a second mutation in the normal allele, or if some, uh, something goes wrong, with the carcinogenic insult to this normal allele, then the cell will transform or enter into a phase where there is going to be a, a continuous replication of a cell. Okay. And that will lead to again, uh, monoclonal proliferation and it will develop into a tumor and neoplasia will be evident. So basically these alleles are seen that you, usually goes wrong in the locus of 3P and 9P of a DNA as well as these are the locations where the allele can go wrong and it will manifest itself in the form of loss of heterozygosity. Once loss of heterozygosity is detected, uh, the patient is uh, at approximately four times uh, more risk of transforming into malignancy. So, so clinical uh, there is a high risk of multiple tumor. Why we are talking about field cancerization? because it has a high risk of multiple tumor developing into a multiple tumor. Second, there is a need for resection of the entire field rather than the tumor with the disease-free margin. I mean, like apparently appearing normal uh, sections also can have mutated cells. So the surgeon has to keep in mind uh, about those mutated cells. And because of that only we have discussed about field cancerization. And frequently we have to monitor the patient because it is possible that a tumor can also arise from second primary tumor. So finally, I would like to conclude that healthcare professional involved in the diagnosis and treatment of these patients must pay special attention to recognize the presence of pre-malignant fields, which can impact on the therapeutic approach and prognosis. These are my references. And thank you. Thank you so I'm much, done. sir. Yeah, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful presentation. 
Any questions? Um, next, we move on to the technical session, orthodontics and uh, dentofacial orthopedics. I would like to welcome our session chair for the technical session in orthodontics and uh, dental dentofacial orthopedics, Dr. Enel Barmi, a professor, Department of Orthodontics and Dentofacial Orthopedics, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute, Rajasthan, India. Dr. Ravindra Kumar Jain, professor and head Department of Orthodontics and Dentofacial Orthopedics. Savita Dental College and Hospital, India, Tamil Nadu, and Dr. Tarulata Shayagali, Professor, Department of Orthodontics and Dentofacial Orthopedics, Dr. M. M. R. Ambedkar Dental College and Hospital, Karnataka, India. Now I would like to welcome our session chair to give a presentation by Dr. Enel Bhamri, Professor, Department of Orthodontics and Dentofacial Orthopedics, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute, Rajasthan, India. The topic is Orthodontic Bonanza for Forensic Odontogia. We welcome you, ma'am. Over to you. Doctor, kindly start your presentation. Hello, ma'am. Yes, yeah, ma'am. Hello, can I present my topic, ma'am? Yeah, ma'am, sure. Dr. Enel Bamri, ma'am. Hello. Am I audible to you? Ah, yes. Dr. Enel, ma'am. Yeah. 
A very good afternoon, ma'am. Is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am, visible. I am between you and. Sorry for the inconvenience. Actually, it got disconnected. Okay, ma'am, no problem. Please start. Shall I start? Ma yeah, ma'am, sure. Please start. India monsoon floods claim 138 lives. We saw the sea coming. We all ran, but God saves little. Uttarakhand floods, 4,120 people missing, including 92 foreign nationals. Lair toll rises to 130, at least 370 injured, 600 more feared washed away. Every now and then, we encounter these kind of news in the leading newspapers claiming natural disasters and thousands of lives and unidentified victims. And according to United Nations Declaration, Every individual has the right to an identity even after death. And according to Interpol Disaster Victim Identification, DVI 2020, the established scientific methods for positive identification include fingerprints, DNA, and dental evidence. Although the dental evidence is not comparable to fingerprints or DNA, yet it is still employed as it is relatively inexpensive and gives rapid results. So the basis for dental identification is that human dentition is never the same in two individuals and the teeth, they record every information that remains for life and beyond. And this is only possible by comparing the features of the antemortem records with the postmortem records. So it is very important to have an accurate and detailed evaluation of the postmortem records so as to provide the best possible successful comparison. A very good afternoon to one and all. I, Dr. Enel Bhambri, Professor and Head, Department of Orthodontics, Surendra Dental College, Sri Ganganagar, am here to present on the topic, Orthodontic Bonanza for Forensic Odontology. So first of all, I would like to tell you about the key areas where an orthodontist plays a key role in forensic investigations. So they are the Antimortem Data Bank, Age Estimation, study model analysis, forensic facial approximation, sex determination, ethnicity determination, reconstructive profiling, and bite mark analysis. And for all these things to play and role, we require the records. And we, as orthodontists, have several records with us due to complexity of cases and considerable time spent working with the patients. Also because of the ruling by defense organizations, the treatment records, x-rays, models, they are to be retained for 11 years, for children up to 29 years, and the pre and post treatment orthodontic models, they should be retained permanently. And the routine records, they include the case history, including clinical examination, dental charts, radiographs, plaster impressions, photographs, tracings, any lab investigations, and the referral reports. So clinical examination, though the findings, they are not as conclusive and important as the radiographic findings, but they may be used as adjunct. For example, the shape of head, that is dolicocephalic, brachycephalic, shape of face, that is uroprosopic, uh, mesoprosopic, and some kind of scars on the face, they also may be used as adjunct at times in positive identification. Dental charts, they give information about the number of teeth present, missing, about the restorations, about the bases under restorations, root pieces, or periodontal status. And they also sometimes give a clue about the possible identification of the individual. Photographs are one of the best and easiest diagnostic aids, and they are routinely taken by orthodontists, the extraoral and intraoral set. Extraoral photographs are of use in the faces which are recognizable and intraoral ones, they can be used in completely disfigured faces. These are the set of extraoral photographs taken by orthodontists routinely. And the intraoral photographs, they may give us idea about the enamel decalcification, developmental anomalies like tell and cusp, amelogenesis imperfecta, atresion, abrasion. So they may be of use in telling us about the individual. Study models, they give us the three-dimensional view of maxillary and mandibular arches. Traditionally, plaster models were being used and now they have been replaced by the digital models. They, are, they help us in assessing the intracanine width, intermolar width, palatine rugae, 
or the rugoscopy can be done on these study models, which again is useful in identifying the deceased individual. Radiographs such as orthopentomogram, cephalogram, intraoral periapical radiographs, occlusal radiographs, they are routinely indicated as essential or supplemental diagnostic aids by orthodontists. Lateral cephalogram helps us in assessing the skeletal pattern of the subject, bonial angle of the subject, which further helps in identifying the person and also helps in sex determination of the individual. They also can aid in reconstruction of facial soft tissues on computer screen by software by various permutations and combinations. The digital form of radiograph or photograph can be superimposed and compared using the softwares like Adobe Photoshop and Media Systems. Orthopentomogram is usually done to assess the missing or supernumerary teeth, tooth restorations, root canal treatments, root morphology, dentition status, remal length, condylar morphology, antigonial notch, mental foramen positioning, and sometimes the classical findings on the radiograph, such as the pattern of mandibular canal, pattern of jaw bones, or condylar morphology, they too can help in assessing the individual. So IOPAs are routinely done to assess pre and post resorption periodontal membrane status. Occlusion radiographs are indicated to check for missing or impacted teeth, and they can also help in identification of the individual. CBCT images are not routinely indicated in all the cases, but whenever and wherever we have, they definitely help in assessing the individual identity. Squash bite is an occlusal record with a dental wax or some syringable material, and this can give us some precise uh, assessment of the arch form. So apart from all these orthodontic records, the orthodontic treatment also has a potential risk of causing damage to the hard or soft tissues, which we call them as orthodontic scars. They can be the white spot lesions, there can be black triangles, there can be recession in the teeth, or enamel fractures or wears. And these clear cut or concise findings can sometimes give us a clue about the identity of an individual. So to conclude my presentation, a forensic odontologist carries a considerable responsibility since his scientific opinion is frequently asked when all other parts of identification have been exhausted. In these cases, final identification may depend upon the specific odontological matching of pre and post mortem dental data. Orthodontists, they have got a huge treasure trove of anti mortem records, which can help the police and coroners in the correct identification of individuals in mass disasters. So, as we say, dentists and the patients might forget, but good quality records, they remember everything. Thank you very much. These are my references. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your wonderful presentation. Next, we move on to the technical session, orthodontics and dentofacial orthopedics. Before we move on to the session, I would like to inform the presentation timings. I request all the participants should strict on their timings, oral presentation for eight minutes, poster presentation for three minutes, and two minutes for the question and answer. I'm repeat. I request all the participants strict on their timings, oral presentation for eight minutes, poster presentation for three minutes, and two minutes for your question and answer. There is no extra time will be provided for your presentation. Now we move on to the technical session. I would like to welcome our first presenter of the day, a oral presentation by Dr. Shikalpal Karu Kaur, Dish Bangat Dental College and Hospital. Topic is nanotechnology in dentistry. Over to you, doctor. Dr. Shuka. Dr. Shukpal.
Our next presentation by Dr. Pooja Harish, Yenipoya Dental College. A topic is an orthodontic system for efficient dis dispaction and derotation of tooth. Dr. Pooja? Yes, ma'am. I'm sharing my screen now. Yeah, please. Is my screen visible? Yeah, yeah visible. Okay. So, um, can I start, ma'am? Ma'am, please start. Okay. Good afternoon, respected uh, judges and all the dignitaries present on this platform. My presentation for today is an orthodontic system for efficient disimpaction and derotation of tooth. So coming to the introduction, impacted teeth, uh, they're commonly encountered in our orthodontic practice. And as we all can recall, uh, impacted maxillary canines are more commonly encountered. They have a varied position and the long axis, uh, various uh, variations in their position when we um, analyze their uh, method of disimpaction. And this makes it difficult to apply a desired direction of force. And also this is due to the interferences from the bone and the adjacent tooth structures <laughs> as well. But uh, then, and in the literature, there are many techniques that have been introduced for the dis efficient disimpaction of a tooth. As we all know, like the open technique, closed technique, Vista technique, or many other new uh, techniques like an eyelet technique. But the type of attachment which is used for this disimpaction is explored very less. So uh, we thought of, of a design, an efficient orthodontic attachment for disimpaction of the tooth. So moving on to the design of the bracket, uh, we uh, designed a round shaped bracket. And uh, the bracket has a plus shaped slot, one horizontal slot and one vertical slot. It is a square uh, dimensional slot with the dimension of 0.6 mm into 0.6 mm. And uh, these two slots intersect e at e each other at the center. And the uh, joints here are rounded to facilitate easy passage of wire, even if we uh, require it in only one uh, quadrant, or we can pass it through and through. And uh, we also close the upper surface of the bracket with, uh, with a smooth metal finished surface. And uh, the uh, base of the bracket, we gave a bead mesh type base for bonding to the tooth, sur uh, tooth surface. And the entire diameter of this bracket is just 4 mm. So coming to the advantages of this, uh, the bracket has a very compact design with smooth metal finished outer surface and a small slot size compared to the other available attachments in the market. Uh, we are mostly using the attachments that are used for regular orthodontic tooth movement, which has a bigger slice, a sized slot and the buckle surfaces of those uh, brackets are irregular and not covered. So when we use such brackets for disimpaction, the soft tissue overgrowth uh, on them might hinder the uh, orthodontic uh, tooth movement or the disimpaction of the tooth. So this smooth metal finish will avoid the soft tissue overgrowth and aids in a faster tooth movement. The slots does not have any inbuilt tip or torque and uh, they have both horizontal and vertical slots. This allows the application of the force in the de desired direction and whatever type of force we need can be applied because of the similarity of the slots in all the directions. So the compact design of this uh, bracket with the same dimension slots without any inbuilt tip or torque uh, makes it similar makes the attachment similar in all the directions and hence it can be bonded faster on an impacted tooth because orientation of the bracket when we use a regular attachment is difficult. We all know the window of uh, bonding an attachment on a uh, 
impacted to during the surgical exposure of, of it is very small, like uh, due to the excessive contamination of the tooth surface by blood and other fluids. So uh, the smaller uh, size of the bracket and its uh, similarity in all the directions facilitates the faster bonding of the attachment on the tooth. And this is a, a slide where we have, um, we all use the Bex uh, bracket more commonly during the disimpaction procedure. We pass the ligature through this, make an eyelet and then uh, use these attachments more commonly. So comparing it with our bracket design, it has reduced thickness. The bracket thickness is a very um, less than half of the uh, Bex bracket. And also the upper surface is smooth. Whereas the buccal surface, as you can see here on a Bex bracket is irregular. So this will uh, facilitate in faster uh, disimpaction. Also the size uh, diameter of the bracket is smaller compared to the other attachments which helps in a uh, smaller exposure of a uh, impacted tooth and faster bonding. This is a picture showing a uh, passage of a O10 ligature wire. The slots are kept very minimal uh, so as to, so, so that a ligature of O10 that is of the greatest thickness that we commonly use can be passed easily and not more than that. Uh, because uh, usually we use this ligature wire, make the tags and these tags are attached to the force elements extra orally. So the slots were kept uh, to a minimal size just for the ligature to be passed through. And the second picture is uh, a depiction on the typhodont uh, where a force is applied through a night eye wire for disimpaction or any other uh, springs also can be used. Um, uh, bond, shear bond strength uh, test was done using the universal testing machine and the uh, bead mesh type had a very good bond strength. Uh, the design is also applied for uh, patent. Uh, the final patent procedure is uh, going on. So coming to the conclusion, uh, the compact design, the covered uh, buckle surface with a metal finish and the smaller sized slots just enough for the ligature makes it a good uh, option for attachment on an impacted teeth and uh, the uh, use for presence of both horizontal and vertical slot makes it similar in all the directions and force can be applied in any direction for disimpaction. So these are my references. I would like to thank, uh, extend my thanks to Dr. Nandi Shetty for the idea and concept. Uh, we both developed this together. And I would like, also like to thank the organizers of Appadent and uh, Yanapai Research Center, Mr. Rasim and uh, Mr. Namir for helping with the designing of this bracket. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pooja, for your presentation. Any questions? Okay, next we move on to the next presentation by Dr. Shweta N. Savita Dental College and Hospital. Topic is CAD, CAM, designed a framework for bone anchored pendulum appliance. Dr. Shweta. Our next presentation by Dr. Priyanka Yambim, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute. A topic is time traveling in dentistry with augmented reality. Dr. Priyanka. Dr. Priyanka. Yes. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, please start your presentation. Yes. Good morning. Your screen is visible, ma'am. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Dr. Pranka from Surinders Time Traveling in Dentistry with AR, Augmented Reality. So first let us know what is Augmented Reality. Augmented Reality is a technology that combines computer-generated images, audio, and videos on the screen with real-life settings. Virtual components or elements are needed. The AR Technology allows the user to superimpose virtual content in the real world. Thus, it supplements re reality with virtual content as a mix rather than a complete replacement. 
So the components of an augmented reality at first is the camera and a display screen and a head mounted display, which has been upgraded. So uh, first we need to register uh, on, our, uh, on our surfaces where we have to superimpose the real life and virtual. First is the registration technique, which can be, uh, the registration technique can be categorized into two main groups, marker free registration, such as laser screen, surface scanning and marker based registration such as anatomical landmarks, bone screws and skin adhesive markers. The virtual objects can be viewed from multiple angles and follow the patient and the operator's movement by the users of the tracking system. So now coming on to the dental perspective, we have the pre-operated x-rays of the patient assemble, which resemble the previously taken images that will later be used to obtain the 3D x-rays. Such x-rays can be obtained from 3D x-rays like computer tomography or from multiple 2D images. There are four main types of 3D imaging systems which have been used to capture dental and orofacial structures, which is cone beam, computed tomography system, laser scanner, structural light scanner, and stereophotogrammetry. So after, after the images were captured and analyzed, they are displayed on the operating film, which is the patient mount on the face and this, this, uh, with the superimposed objects. It allows the navigation and intraoperatively from the previously obtained preoperative x-rays directly on the patient. This can be based on the video-based display, see-through display, and the projection-based AR. The video-based display uses endoscopic camera, uh, cameras or head mountain displays to superimpose virtual objects on a stereo video strip. Thus, it increased the viewer's understanding of depth motion and the stereo parallax. With the C2 display and projection based, AR uses translucent silver microscope uh, through devices and projectors. These devices are placed between the operator and the patient to allow the projection of the virtual objects. Multiple researchers have proved the effectiveness of the AR simulators in assisting dentists by showing and displaying virtual models in the operating field. This directly contributed to the reduction in the difficulty of hand-eye coordination. Augmented reality has already been introduced in the dental research, incorporating the dental implant, oral maxillofacial surgery, orthodontic, endodontic, prosthodontics, pedodontics, operative dentistry, as well as in dental education. Now coming on to the applications in oral maxillofacial surgery. Augmented reality guidance system provide real-time intraoperative information with real surgical fields. It is ideal to offer three-dimensional presentations on the patient's body rather than a separate screen because perception of the real body is more intuitive and avoids confusion. Since the display type dominates the perception location, head mountain displays or microscopic eyepieces are typically recommended mimicking Google Glass. Generally, computer-generated additional information is overlaid into a real surgical film and thus resides between the patient's body and the surgeon's eye. Now, with uh, augmented reality in dental implant placement. During dental implant placement, augmented reality system can act as automatic information filters that selectively display only the most relevant information to surgeons, thereby helping them concentrate most fully on the implant placement. Lynn et al. has evaluated the accuracy of AR-based dental implant placement and compared it with that of planning and placing template with the AR system significantly, which reduced placement deviation. This result implies that the accuracy of AR system still needs to be improved. Interestingly, the AR system used in dental implantology is considered to be cost-effective due to its ability to reduce time and additional cost. They found that integrating the surgical template with the AR system significantly reduced placement deviation. This result implies that the accuracy of AR system still needs to be improved. Interestingly, the AR system used in dental implantology is considered to be cost effective due to its ability to reduce time and additional cost. Now, orthognatic surgery. AR assisted maxillary repositing surgery demonstrated only small errors that were within acceptable limits. The, the integration accuracy of computer-generated imaging 
was also shown to be more reliable than that of real life vision alone. Now bracket placement and orthodontics. The ideal bracket position is very vital for efficient orthodontic treatment. So using the AR assisted bracket navigation system, the accuracy of bracket placement has improved and therefore the procedure time of lab stage has been decreased. The utilization of augmented rating system increases the accuracy rate in all the spatial directions and helps the novice orthodontist guide the bracket position within a suitable clinical error of roughly 0.5 millimeter. A high accuracy in bracket positioning not only decreases the demand for first and second order bands, but also lessens the complexity and treatment span, which further reduces clinical chair time, thus giving skillful and precise outcomes. Hello, ma'am, can you hear me? Augmented reality can also be used in cephalometric. Yeah, the orthodontic cephalometric. Ma'am, kindly mute your uh, unmute yourself, ma'am. Dr. Priyanka? Yes. Yeah. Sorry for the inconvenience, ma'am. Can I continue now? Yeah, sure, ma'am. Okay. Uh, the individuality of augmented reality is that registration of virtual objects happens within the real world, granting the user to ascertain 3D virtual objects of a lab upon the real world. So due to this, the technology of augmented reality is a boon for medicine and dentistry as complex internal structures of the body are virtually recreated during a 3D format, forming a superb tool for learning cephalometrics. So this permits the scholar to see the structure and its details from various angles. The haptic feedback can impart a tactile response as soon as a landmark has been detected on the cephalogram, allowing error-free learning. The students would gain remarkably as uh, augmented reality system allows landmark identification and validation, and thus decreasing the subjective evaluation by the tutors. So augmented reality in dental education. In the delivery of dental education and training, instructor can help students and PG residents to achieve precision in preclinical and clinical skills, respectively, with 3D real-time digital stimulations as well. Learning and retaining the anatomy of the head and neck is a crucial part of dental education. Lectures and 2D images from textbooks of anatomy have been used for teaching these subjects to students. In this traditional mode of teaching, cadaveric skills are commonly employed and students are instructed through this. However, the visualization of all this associated muscle, neural, vascular, and other structures is quite challenging for students and it's not fully effective either. Now coming on to smile designing. Uh, augmented reality, reality can be used in smile designing. A recent application released for iOS 11 was evaluated, allowing for augmented reality experience to be created using a recent iPad or an iPhone. This application, which is uh, which is name is Ivo, available as Ivo Smile or Kapanu or Ivo Clear Viva Dance, it uses the capture camera integrated in a tablet to recognize the patient's face. After having determined the facials, uh, virtual facial and the oral landmarks, a second software proposes an artificial layer of smile propositions that is superimposed on the patient's smile. The software gives the possibility of the uh, to the user to modify the center of the arch according to the facial lines and it choose tooth from and proportion within the differences of the tooth. The user can also modify the incisal edge position by raising or lowering the length and width of the tooth by changing the occlusal plane or the dental arch inclination and width. Finally, the software allows the user to modify the shade and luminosity of the teeth. Users can interact and change the shape size and color of the teeth using a large range of tools. The software guides the possibility to the user to modify the center of the arch according to the facial midlines and choose to form and proportion within different catalogs of the teeth. The user can also modify the incisal edge position by raising or lowering length and width of the teeth 
or by changing the occlusal plane, the dental arch inclination, and the width. Finally, the software allows the user to modify the shade and luminosity of the tube. So coming on to the conclusion of this presentation, the co-diagnostic of uh, use of the augmented reality software may enhance the communication strategy between the clinician, dental technician, and the patient. Augmented reality systems will play an increasing role in orthodontic education, treatment planning, and treatment outcomes. It will help increase patient planning for orthodontic surgery by showing them the results. These technologies are likely to vary clinical training and increase the utilization of reflective sorts of assessment, which involves students during a self-assessment process to spot individual learning needs and self-directed learning. This innovation promises not only lower cost of the tutorial process, but also rise in quality by providing a replacement set of pedagogical tools for the orthodontics. To summarize, I would like to say that with modernization in technology, uh, mainly in technical fields, benefits the lives of the people are simplified. Similarly, augmented reality is an advanced system for learning new things, interacting with different people and places, and simplifying one's life. But if misused, the outcome can be displeasing as increased health problems and psychological issues in the present generation indicate. Nevertheless, this technology is not something everyone is capable of acquiring and with advancement over the years, it will likely be accessible to commoners as well. Despite its cost, if utilized in a more productive way, this technology can lead to a better future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Priyanka. Is there any questions? Okay. Our next presentation by Dr. Shweta in Savita Dental College and Hospital. Dr. Shweta? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Please start your presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. My topic for today's presentation is CAD CAM Design Framework for Bone Anchored Pendulum Appliance. So the contents of my presentation will include a brief introduction. Uh, we'll be discussing one case where we had done a CAD CAM design framework for a patient, the workflow involved, the future trends and conclusion. So uh, today, digital technology has touched every aspect of diagnosis and treatment planning in orthodontics, ranging from manual, uh, from the diagnosis aspect, from printing of models to supplementary analysis, and to treatment planning and uh, directly printing and delivering a uh, uh, orthodontic appliance to remote monitoring of a patient. So digitalization of orthodontic diagnosis and treatment planning involves intraoral scanners, virtual treatment planning digital appliance manufacture by use of CAD CAM designing and 3D printing, which leads to the formation of customized appliances, 3D photography, and remote monitoring of the patients. So CAD CAM technology has been in and around dentistry for almost three decades, and it has uh, come into the way into orthodontics by means of model printing, uh, direct printing of brackets, robotic wire bendings, and now Sorry to interrupt you, ma'am. Kindly unmute yourself. I request all the participants kindly mute your uh, microphones. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Audible. Okay. So uh, now I'll be discussing a, a CAD CAM application in... Uh, in bone anchored pendulum appliance, which we designed for one patient. This patient presented with a class two malocclusion, uh, had a proclined incisor and also a class two molar relationship with mild crowding. And this patient was not suitable for a conventional bone uh, pendulum appliance. So we planned for a bone anchored pendulum appliance. So few uh, weeks, few months after a uh, placement of a bone anchored pendulum, which contains routinely, conventionally contains an acrylic button, uh, supporting the uh, mini screws, the patient developed severe uh, palatal hypersensitivity and uh, uh, parietal tissue overgrowth that covered almost the entirety of the uh, uh, 
acrylic button so we had to remove the acrylic button and the appliance so that we can uh, come up with a something more hygienic and a rigid replacement for an acrylic button which is a CAD CAM printed metal framework. This did not occupy a lot of space uh, like the acrylic button and it was very rigid so that it can withstand the forces, reciprocal forces generated by the pendulum spring and also can support the implants to an extent. So this was designed uh, by means of CAD CAM. So I'll be discussing the workflow, how we designed it. So first we acquired the digital image of the uh, upper arch, the palette. And then the image was transferred to a compatible software for designing the uh, uh, framework and the appliance designing once it was done. After that, it was sent to the 3D printer for printing and it was finishing. And we also added a few components after finishing. So digital image acquisition can be either done by use of a uh, scanning a cast or an impression directly, or we can do a direct intraoral scan. In this case, we did the scan of an impression, an alginate or a previous impression can be used. So this, when used in a scanner, will give you the digital model in which you can work the uh, framework design. There are plenty of uh, scanners available that can uh, digitize a cast or an impression those include a structured light scanner a laser scanner and computer tomography we used a structured light scanner which is a 3d maestro scanner uh, which uses a structured light and triangulation technique this uh, structured light or a uh, white light will be uh, uh, focused from the projector and the camera will capture uh, in the form of a triangle. This is a simple uh, principle that involves the Pythagoras theorem. So this was the technique used uh, to capture a digital cast in which we had designed the framework. So after this image was obtained, this image needs to be in the STL format. Any uh, appliance, any image uh, scanner that will give you an STL uh, file can be used. Uh, we used a, a Maestro scanner. Any other scanners available in the market but can be used. Your screen is not visible. Pardon? No. Your screen is not visible. Just a minute now. I think you will have to start from beginning now. Dr. Shweta? Dr. Shweta? 
Ma'am, is it? Am I uh, yeah, ma'am. Uh, yeah, ma'am. Please continue, ma'am. We okay. are running out of the time. Please. Sure, sure. Sorry, I'm sorry. And uh, no, no problem. Is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am, visible. Shall I start from the beginning or shall I continue? So, like I said, uh, I was discussing about the uh, scanners used, the triangulation technique that was used, and the so coming to the designing of the appliance. We first designed an appliance like this that has a, a tripod at tripod support so that the implants can be placed and distalization can be continued. However, the patient already had an implant in place because of the failed uh, acrylic button. So with the uh, acrylic implants in place, we designed uh, something like this. Uh, so that this uh, both arms that are there at the sides of the implant can be used to hold the distalizing springs. Uh, why this framework is of one point one to one point five mm thick, and the implant slot region was kept at two point five mm thick thickness. So uh, once this was done, it was sent to the three D printer. We used an SLM one twenty five three D printer, which uses additive manufacturing technique and selective laser melting to uh, uh, do the appliance uh, to print the appliance. The what happened? We used a cobalt chromium alloy, which has tungsten and selenium. It's a metal powder, which the laser selectively melts layer by layer and fuses until the appliance until the design is printed to the desired thickness. So after finishing, uh, we had uh, soldered a 1.18 gauge uh, tube into the arms so that the springs can be inserted. The springs were removable so that e even after the distalization, the pendulum springs can be removed and a, a fixed retainer spring can be used for retention period. So this is how we inserted the spring. This is the uh, tube in which the pendulum spring was attached. And this is the pendulum spring in place. And we also added a coil spring to uh, en enhance the activation of the pendulum spring. So this is uh, after distalization, the molar became class one. We also added a buckle mini screw to enhance the distalization and class one molar relationship was obtained. So uh, in few, there are, uh, this is just one uh, basic framework that we used for uh, in a patient who required a, a more hygienic and a self-cleansable appliance. There are various uh, applications to this CAD CAM design in which uh, lingual arch, pal uh, transpalatal arch, Hyrax appliances and TPA are being designed. Graph introduced this laser melting technique for printing uh, metal uh, appliances directly uh, by 3D printing technology. And to conclude, this uh, CAD CAM technology can be utilized in a proper way if uh, to design uh, specific uh, specifically this appliance is more versatile because it can be designed that we are flexible in the based of the design and also uh, it can be used in patients with a very unusual palatal morphology especially in patients with cleft uh, where we can uh, ideally uh, design according to the uh, palatal morphology or in a patient with a tori. So this uh, technology can be utilized for uh, uh, expansion as well as distalization. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shweta. Is there any questions? Our next presentation by Dr. Surai Kaibam, Mon Monica Sur Surendra Dental College and Research Institute, Speedy Orthodontics. Dr. Surai Khaibam, I request all the participants kindly uh, switch off your microphones. Dr. Surai Khaibam, we move, we move on to the next presentation by Dr. Avisha Mitha, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute. A topic is a new era as accident. Effects of supplemental vibration force on space closure. Dr. Avisha.
Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, audible. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Monica from Surinda Dental College, and I'll be presenting my paper on speedy orthodontics. So the contents of the paper are this. So let's start with the introduction. Like almost 60 to 70 percent of the population seeks for orthodontic treatment, and among them, most of the adult patients that are uh, seeking the orthodontic treatment does not have the required chair side time. So they ask for a faster way of uh, a faster way to get their uh, treatment. So in search of that, various methods have been uh, have been. Uh, uh, in search of that, various methods have been um, uh, various methods has been uh, uh, done, and among this, these are like the physical and mechanical stimulation, surgical methods, and chemical methods. In physical and mechanical stimulation, there we can give uh, direct electric currents, cyclic vibrations, or low-level laser therapy. And in surgical methods, we can give a less invasive method like piezo season or microostro perforations and a more invasive method like corticotomy and PAO that is uh, periodontally accelerated or uh, osteogenic. Or and in chemical methods, chemical and biological methods, we have all this. Um, biological agents. So uh, first, we, first is the ortho orthopus. It is a self-treatment advice device that is uh, you, that can be used by the patient himself or herself at home in just 10 minutes a day, and it uses low intensity near infrared light technology for accelerating the orthodontic tooth movement. Another <clears throat> is the lasers. Lasers are of main two types. That is the um, low level laser and uh, high level laser. The high level laser shows a very destructive potential and the low level has a comparatively low destructive potential. So what, it ha what happens is like the photobiomodulation mechanism uh, when, uh, uh, when a laser is, uh, uh, laser is inhibited, it penetrates the tissues and stimulates the um, cellular metabolism and then thereby activates our uh, remodeling processes that is uh, um, <clears throat> that is a bond remodeling and it, uh, it accelerates the orthodontic tooth movement. So it can be given. And also we can go for surgical methods as we have been idea. So surgical methods can be like more invasive and a uh, less invasive procedure, less invasive like my piezo season and MOPs, and more invasive like corticotomy and PO, which will be discussed later. So almost all the surgical methods, um, um, they uh, occur with the rare phenomenon that is a regional acceleratory, phen uh, acceleratory phenomenon. So first is the piezo season. So in, the, in this diagram, what we see is a piezotome, um, piezotome in which uh, like uh, the piezotome head is used to cut the cortical bone and it is inserted 3 mm into the cortical bone. So, um, so with this incision, we can get uh, accelerated tooth movement. And another one is micro perforation. This is actually, this literally um, translates into puncturing of bone in which the, uh, the head of the MOP can be used to um, puncture the bone, which will accelerate tooth movement. Next is corticotomy. It was introduced in 1959 and was popularized in 2001 by Wilco Brothers as Alvil uh, Osteogenic Orthodontics. So whatever, uh, so what it ha what happens here is that we give uh, incisions by raising a mucoperiosteal flap. That is why it is more invasive as compared to the uh, two procedures which we have uh, said earlier. And then after that, uh, giving uh, after giving cuts and corticotomy cuts, and then we uh, suture back the um, mucoperiosteal fold, uh, mucoperiosteum which we have raised. Another one is the. Uh, it is seen as the method, corticotomy method. The only and main difference is that there is no proper um, bone surrounding that supports the, the supports the. So in order to facilitate orthodontic, so in order to so in order to facilitate this PAO, what we have to do is place uh, place grabs, and other than that, everything is same with corticotomy.
So after that, we have drugs. These are some drugs that promote tooth movement, like prostaglandins, vitamin D3, you know. What they do is, uh, <coughs> sorry, they are the inflammatory mediators, which mediates in bone resorption and bone uh, formation, that is remodeling, and thereby it accelerates the um, tooth movement. Also, vitamin D3, that is, uh, it's, uh, it, uh, it plays a very important role in calcium, um, metabolism and um, calcitonin in, and parathyroid hormone. And these are some studies which were done in animal, te uh, animal test animal, and there are very, very less number of, uh, less number of researches than studies done in humans. So a limited amount of study is there, are there. Next, we have the biomodulator. So biomodulators are um, uh, substances that triggers the release of cytokines, growth factors, and uh, colony stimulating factors. So they mediate the rank L uh, osteoproteogen and met uh, matrix metalloproteinases. So what happens is like after inducing all the bio biomodulators, they mediate their uh, cell metabolism that will lead to acceleration of tooth movement. Next, we have the P PRP derivatives. So what PRP is platelet-rich plasma derivatives. So it is an uh, autologous concentration of the, uh, autologous concentration of platelet in a small amount of plasma. So what it is, is like uh, we take blood from our brachial vein and then we um, centrifuge it so that all the cell sediments are sedimented, all the cells are sedimented and on top of that there's a plasma so this plasma is used for various purposes and it has been introduced in our dental field also for in uh, for instance in orthodontics also we can use prp for uh, accelerating tooth movement in prp these are like first generation is our prp which is injected around the gingiva in which we want to accelerate the tooth so this is a uh, these are a few studies and this is the uh, and this is a figure of um, injection of prp around the tooth another one is the plprf plug that is the leukocyte rich plasma uh, uh, platelet rich fibrin so what it is is this is the platelet plug in uh, prp and prf are almost similar but one is in uh, one is in uh, mesh form in which uh, we can use it as a uh, material, biomaterial for uh, accelerating also. Like on the extraction socket, we can use it and we can suture it. So, um, so these are some uh, methods of accelerating tooth movement. And tooth acceleration is relative, uh, relatively a new horizon and researchers have yet to seek uh, the most ideal and the most ideal and prudent technique for the patients. Given the various methods and options that are available, none of them provided ideal results and clinician has to choose from one of these weighing the risk and the requirements. So surgical procedures are more invasive wh whether uh, and while this, um, met this methods are uh, less invasive, oh, yes. so you have to choose from which one is better for the patient. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Monica. Our next presentation by Dr. Avisha Mehta, Surendra Dental College and Research Institute. A topic is a new era accident, effects of supplemental vibra vibrational force on space closure. Over to you, doctor. Dr. Avisha. Please start your presentation. Kindly start your session, ma'am.
Good afternoon, everyone. Myself, Dr. Avisha Mida from Surindra Dental College and Research Institute. My topic is the new era Ashley Dent. This includes the success of orthodontic treatment is primarily dependent on achieving the rapid tooth movement and reducing the treatment duration. In clinical practice, the protracted orthodontic treatment period often over two to three years time in the frequent compl uh, compliant of your, uh, young adults who seek professional care. Various approaches such as application of intermittent resonance vibration, drug injections like uh, vitamin D, prostaglandins or osteocalcinin around the alveolar sockets and surgical intervention like corticocision were opted to overcome this issue. Although these methods were effective in accelerating the tooth movement, they were expensive, invasive approach with severe adverse effects like pain and discomfort following injections, a need for frequent application to get the desired benefit. The use of less expensive, non-invasive approach using low-level laser light therapy called photon biomodulation therapy. Another recently explored area involves device-assisted therapy biological enhance the orthodontic tooth movement. To this, a number of systems such as light, electrical current, cyclic uh, uh, forces and resonance vibration have been introduced. The development of commercial uh, vibrational appliances for clinical use, one of which is Asliden. This is a hands-free portable device consisting of activator unit and a removable thermoplastic occlusal wafer that the patient bites onto. The activator unit vibrates and delivers a force of 0.2 Newton at a frequency of 30 Hertz in the dentition. The manufacturer suggests that it be used for 20 minutes per day to increase the speed of tooth movement thereby reduces treatment time. This is the appliance, the physiology, the light in the red to near infrared range that is 600 to 1000 nanometer generated by using uh, energy laser or light emitting diode arrays has been reported to have been biological effects in many injury models. Such photobiomodulation has been observed, increase mitochondrial metabolism, facilitate wound healing and promote angiogenesis in skin, bone, nerve and skeletal muscle in primary neurons. Optical window between 600 to 12 nano, uh, 1200 nanometer in biological tissue allows for maximum penetration of photons. Uh, Otto Warburg, nine, in 1931, a Nobel Prize winner in physiology, discovered cytochrome C oxidase, the terminal enzyme in the mitochondrial oxidative respiration chain. He demonstrated the mitochondrial uh, cytochrome C oxidase were responsible to light stimulation. The mechanism of action include the increased cytochrome C oxidase photon pumping and ATP production. It includes the increased or normalized metabolism, then increased reactive oxygen species production and mitochondrial signal. This induces the plethora of cellular activity, induces, then induces nitric oxide production through absorption of photons by nitric oxide synthase that causes the increased micro and regional blood flow and osteoclastic activity. This diagram shows the ATP production is driven by high protein concentration in the inner mitochondrial membrane. And then stress cells have decreased metabolism, thus lower protein concentration and lower ATP production. Uh, then, photobiomodical, um, uh, then photobiomodulation increases ATP production by stimulating CCO to absorb the photons and pump protons. The clinical evidence uh, shows no clinically significant root resorption. 46% increase the rate of space closure in adults, 54% reduction in time to achieve anterior alignment. The patient benefits shows the fast and convenient self-treatment session of 10 uh, minutes per day, comfortable medical grade silicone appliance, lockable charging case with wireless charging for convenience and ease for traveling, iOS and Android app for tracking patient treatment compliance. Uh, 
conclusion we concluded that although the use of supplemental vibrational force with fixed appliance is not associated with uh, in uh, increment appliance breakage it does not provide any advantages practitioners should consider this when recommended sub, uh, supplemental vibrational force to their patients on the basis of redu reducing treatment time or any other benefits thank you thank you dr avisha any questions our next presentation by dr gaurav sharkar surendra dental college and research institute a topic is gear up sports dentistry for sports safety dr gaurav sarkar yes ma'am yes, ma yeah sir please start your presentation yes, so good afternoon everyone so today we will discuss about the sports dentistry uh, dentistry which is uh, related to uh, sports so firstly introduction so dentistry plays a significant role uh, in field of sports and uh, however due to this uh, children and uh, adolescents become more prone to uh, injury which is related to sports and uh, dentists play many important role by detecting the problems in the athletes related to their uh, oral cavities such as mouth breathing and or pole position dental arch and thereby correcting it to help them by achieving the optimal oral health condition by doing so Uh, their overall performance is greatly enhanced so uh, this is very important to stay physically active in all uh, age groups dental and facial traumas are most common in sports related injuries as we know and uh, study shows uh, st uh, many studies uh, shows that 13 to 39% of all dental injuries are sports related and of all sports acc um, accidents reported and 11 to 18% are maxillofacial injuries and males are traumatized twice are as often the females with um, the maxillary central incisors being the most commonly injured tooth so importance of sports injury to the dental professional so fortunately modern modern dentistry has developed numerous techniques and appliances to help to uh, uh, help to protect the sports participants from uh, various kind of orofacial injuries which we, which we will discuss later and uh, in fact primitive sports dentistry represents the most, uh, most important contributions and the dental professionals can make uh, to assure the sports participants welfare so prevention of sports related traumatic or facial injuries so at present helmets uh, face masks and mouth guards mainly helmets and uh, mouth guards are popular in field of sports and uh, is required to sport uh, uh, in some sports to reduce the uh, both likelihood and the severity of sports related traumatic injuries in head face and mouth like in boxing or in cricket etc so firstly mouth guard uh, an athlete uh, <coughs> mouth guards or gum shields were originally developed in 1890 by ulf cross in uh, london uh, who is a who was a dentist from london as a means of protecting boxers from the lift laceration and such injuries were common and often uh, disabling accompanied to the boxing contest <coughs> in the era so these gum shields were originally made from the gutta percha and were held in the place Uh, by clenching the teeth by 1930s mouth guards were part of the standard boxers equipments and have remained so since that time so this is the picture of helmet and this is a picture of uh, boxing mouth guard so conclusion uh, sports dentistry um, in encompass a wide range of preventive and treatment modalities of oral facial athletic uh, athletic injuries and related uh, to oral diseases and manifestations um, the pediatric dentist must uh, possess a sound clinical working knowledge regarding the sports related oral facial injuries in children and adult adolescents in various methods of prevention with the with the increasing trends of sports uh, participants in schools and colleges protective devices uh, and uh, preventive options gain significance sports related dental in injuries are not uncommon during the participants and they deserve or our uh, immediate attention and uh, in this regard the pediatric dentist must work uh, in close association with the teachers coaches and trainers uh, parents and the other health professionals to ensure the comprehensive dent dental facial care preventive programs 
should include information regarding the sports related or official injuries uh, preventive measures like helmets and mouth guards and their management resulting in the better awareness of the general population it is also our responsibility to identify and educate and provide the athletes to prevent uh, to uh, athletes to uh, preventive measures like mouth guards so these are the references thank you thank you dr gaurav is there any questions yes. our next presentation by dr heman surendra dental college and research institute a topic is a mini screw for upper molar distillation dr heman Dr. Heyman. Doctor, please start your presentation. Doctor, please start your presentation, doctor. Doctor, your screen is visible. Doctor, your voice is not audible, doctor. Doctor Heyman? I think you have a technical issue. Your voice is not audible, doctor. Am I audible now? Yeah, ma'am. Yeah, sir. Yeah. Now audible. Yeah. Please start. Yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. No problem. Yeah, so... So, yeah. A new... A new orthodontic appliance with mini screw for upper molar distillation. So, these are the contents that we'll be discussing our topic under, the paper under. So orthodontic problems can be skeletal and uh, dental. So skeletal pro problems uh, can be originated from skeletal deviations and can be treated with uh, orthopedic corrections, fixed mechanotherapy, or even surgery. Whereas uh, dental problems uh, are categorized as class one, class two, and class three malocclusions. And class two is generally caused by, you know, early loss of uh, upper deciduous second molars. And uh, after the early uh, loss, usually the upper first molars, they erupt more mesially than their normal uh, locations or they drift more mesially. Uh, in, in such cases, extraction of the upper first uh, premolars uh, should be followed by fixed mechanotherapy, which is mostly chosen for this kind of treatment uh, and for this type of uh, mal malocclusion. On the other hand, upper molar distillation can be used as an alternative treatment ways, which could be achieved by uh, means of extraoral and intraoral uh, devices, uh, orthodontic devices or appliances. The main uh, disadvantages of uh, extraoral appliances are uh, aesthetic appearance and uh, need of uh, patient cooperation. So in order to eliminate such need, uh, intraoral appliances are designed for usage. Uh, 
So when we come to class two elastics, intermaxillary anchorage is one of the ways that correct the class two dental relationship, but uh, the lower incisor protrusion uh, and the bite opening are most probably seen uh, side effects of this elastic use. So we can also think about removable appliances, uh, which can also be used for the upper molar distillation as well. But it is difficult to provide uh, enough anchorage with removable appliances due to their retention limits. And uh, whereas the upper incisor protrusion is the possible disadvantage of these mechanics. So coming another disadvantages of these devices is the fact that they um, they have like they're directly dependent on the patient compliance, like as in seen in headgear. So for that reason, intraoral devices can be preferred. So here we have this C digitalizer that consists of eight main components, namely a mini screw, a rectangular bendable L wire, a crimpable bendable wire, a night eye open coil spring, two screw screwed stoppers, two T tubes, a molar tube and uh, lingual retainer. Excuse me. Um, can, you screen, can you see my screen? Uh, am I, is my slide uh, changing? Yes, it's changing, Dr. Heyman. Okay. So, when considering the design, um, the appliance, as we were discussing, it consists of a mini screw, mm -hmm. a rectangular bendable L wire, and uh, night eye open coil spring, a crimpable bendable wire, two screw stoppers, and two tubes a molar tube and a lingual retainer composite with its bonding agent. So these are the uh, design steps of the appliance, which are as follows. So the main structure is uh, completed by integrating the screwed stopper to the rectangular long L wire and the crimple bendable wire. In this step, crimple wire is crimpled to the small arm of the L wire with crimple hook player, as we can see in the diagram. So the open coil springs are fixed to one end of each wire. That is, the two stoppers are placed to the L wire and the crimple wire respectively. Similarly, the two open coils are located to the L wire uh, where, uh, uh, respectively. So the structures end up adding T-tubes and the molar tube to the wires. So briefly, it means that after molar tube is bonded on the upper first molar, the two tubes are inserted on the L wire then the L wire is transformed to the U wire. Finally, the appliance is bonded to the head of mini screw. So this is the appliance uh, for uh, digitalization that is without activation. So as we can see here, uh, shortly the appliance has uh, four active and uh, two passive parts. So the active part uh, includes uh, two open coil springs and two screw activated stoppers. And whereas the active, uh, the sorry, the passive uh, part uh, con contains uh, contains uh, two rectangular wirings, one of which attaches to the ortho mini screw and the other into the molar tube. So tarts could be inserted, as we can see in the right side, uh, it is inserted between the canine and the first premolar, and whereas in the left side it is being inserted in between the first premolar and the second premolar. So it is purely, as you can see, it is uh, based on patient requirement. And uh, the critical point is the location of the distal uh, surface of the upper first permanent molar teeth. When the appliance is activated, uh, the sliding of the two stoppers and uh, the strain gauge measurement is ob obtained. So we can also appreciate the strain gain gauges that are being attached to the distal surface of the uh, molar, uh, first molar here. So what happens is the two channel strain measurements are complete, completed using a microprocessor based data acquisition system. And the results of these 
measurement is given into a graph. So this is the comparison of the left and the right side under various loading, which uh, kind of results us uh, that obviously shows that the open coils produce approximately 300 gram of distillation force. And the seized distillizer, distillizer can provide totally 600 gram of distillation force. This range of force level is acceptable for distillation of upper first and second molar teeth to eliminate unwanted tooth movement. In other words, it is possible to provide optimum force level while using seized distillizer. And uh, one can also say that loading of appliance uh, provides acceptable deflection distal surface of upper first molar and strain field at the mini screw with upper first molar and second premolar region that is on the left side is higher than that of the mini screw with the upper canine and first premolar region. In other words, the design at the left side reflects more deflection since we know it is in very close proximity to the first molar. And uh, coming to the discussion part, um, if the mandibular arch crowding is mild and the molar relationship is class two, and the sagittal transverse and vertical skeletal relationships between the maxillary and mandibular bones are normal. Uh, most possible cause of the severe upper arch crowding is the major movements of the upper molars as discussed earlier. So according to the acceptable force values movement control, C's distillizer can provide molar distillation without poor aesthetics because anchorage control uh, can be complete, completed by orthodontic mini screws which are more aesthetic than extraoral appliances. And uh, the activation of the appliances is done by clinician. So there is no need for patient cooperation as, as it is seen in headgear. So second is uh, second most important point uh, is like most of the distillation appliances that we come, come across are placed in the palatine region. And with uh, orthodontic mini screws, this type of appliances possess like a very compromised uh, oral hygiene and uh, due to the fact that it is difficult to provide adequate plaque control as well. So there are high risk of aspiration, swallowing of piece of the appliances and damage of the orthodontic mini screws due to trauma. In order to decrease the risk, uh, seized distillizer with its uh, orthodontic mini screw is placed on the buccal region of the maxilla. And uh, coming to the third and most important point, many distillation appliances uh, are designed um, for two side molar movement or at least need both uh, right and um, left first molar attachment with welding molar bands. Um, C's distillation can be placed on one side and molar attachment can be made with the molar tube and uh, can be produced by a clinician at clinic and there is no need for study model, a technician and a lab to work. So this is more economic and uh, the use of like in comparison with other distillation options that we have. And also there is only monthly activation of the appliance and it is suitable for providing optimum force uh, for molar distillation. And uh, force level can be easily controlled with uh, the activation of, uh, um, activation of degree of the stoppers. And this force control is actually very important. Why? Because it is for the elimination of any unwanted tooth movement of high force level. So uh, you, by virtue of this, uh, optimal force can be given for molar distillation. So um, these differences. And uh, consequently, we also conclude that the CS distillation is uh, more hygienic and ergonomic than uh, other appliances. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amit, for your presentation. Dr. Amit, for your presentation. I request all the participants to mute your microphone while others are presenting. Any questions from the session, Cha? 
Okay, we'll move on to the next presenter. Next is oral presentation by Dr. Ananya Mukherjee from Surendra Dental College and Research Institute. The topic of the presentation is teleorthodontics, a new era of orthodontic digitalization. Dr. Ananya Mukherjee. Dr. Ananya Mukherjee, kindly unmute yourself and you can share your present. Dr. Ananya Mukherjee. Okay, we'll move on to the next presenter. Next is oral presentation by Dr. Raja Kumar from Savita Dental College and Hospital. The topic of this presentation is non-surgical management of vertical maxillary excess using modified intuition mechanics. Dr. Raj Kumar? Yeah, you can yep. start sharing your presentation. Can you see my screen, ma'am? Yes, sir. It's visible. Okay. Yeah, kindly stick to the time limit, sir. The presentation for oral presentation is 10 minutes. So, sorry, oh. 8 minutes, 2 minutes for the question and answer. Kindly stick to the time because we are running out of time. Other okay. participants are waiting. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, no. thank you, sir. Thank you. You can proceed with your presentation. Okay. okay. My topic is like non surgical management of vertical maxia exceeding using a modified intuition. Uh, mechanism. So, our topic we are discussing with a case study of a patient of 16 years old girl. You can see in that patient, she is a 16 year old female girl. She came to our clinic with a, a patient complete of following face upper front to reason. So, she is having a you can see uh, that her face is uh, her teeth is, is followed the face and she is having a gummy smile. So this case is mainly diagnosed like uh, it's a case of class two attrition orthodontic orthodontic maxia and mandible attuning the mandible on an average growth pattern of vertical maxia excretion. So her her growth is like uh, it's a class two case. So it's like angle of class two division one, which is with a broken upper anterior teeth. You can see the upper anterior teeth, which is broken and it, it's increasing the overjet and overbite with incompetent zips. Which is called as gummy smile. So how we can how we have proceeded with the treatment? The second we went to the how the skeletal features of the patient. Right? It's a skeleton of class two with a vertical maxi excision, and then they, we can say it's a broken upper incisors with a class two incision relationship with a angle class two molar relationship, class two canine relationship, overjet of twelve mm, overbite of nine mm, and spacing in the upper arch. So then we went to soft tissues. Soft tissue, you can see that the patient is having incompetent lips, acute naso labia, acute deep mental labia uh, circus, and lip uh, present and gummy smile. So you can see the patient uh, patient is It's like a five mm. So what what procedure? How to resolve it? How we can forward with this treatment without non surgery Our main uh, uh, main motive without non surgery, okay? without uh, doing an automatic surgery, how can we proceed with the treatment? So, next we can go with the treatment. So, we have divided into the phases in three parts we have uh, having and alignment phases, we have intrusion phases, and we have post intrusion phases. So, having and alignment phases, we have put it, uh, we have extracted uh, the teeth of one, four, and two from, the, uh, from that female AD. So we have put a strap of MB2 0.02 perception with the upper arch and following the Yaven alignment. In Yaven alignment, we are just seeing the changes of the position of the alignment, not too much, but uh, the alignment phase. Then we went to intrusion phases. In intrusion phases, we have put it the uh, 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 utility arches and can I, uh, can I intrusion? We are made focusing the uh, upper incisors and the uh, canine intrusion with a modified cantilever spring. So next we went to post intrusion phase, uh, interaction of upper anterior, and we have uh, used a defined T loop. You can see in the uh, post intrusion phase, uh, you, you can see the T loop. 
and setting and finishing and, and playing that game. So, goal. What was our main goal? To achieve the idea of occlusion, we have seen the Canon class one over Z and over Y to correct the expression intuition of the uh, entire and to achieve the hip competency. Aesthetically, how do we make the smile more better of uh, that uh, that uh, joy of 16 years? So uh, these are the, some photos I want to show, like pre and post op. Then these are the pre op of the. Yeah, like we have seen the frontal view and the later view and how the smile view of the uh, girl of 16 years. Then you can see the P of intuition at front right, and you have of the how it is before uh, the view of the, the 16 years old girl, how the how it's forwarding faces, uh, how the teeth are forwarding faces, and how it's a like dummy smile. Then you can see the maxi and mandible fixes view, how the spacing is here uh, of the faces. Then you can see the P radiographic images, uh, the OPG, and we have taken, taken a radiocephalogram. You can see how the, it's facing forward, and we have taken the uh, OPG of the patient. Then we uh, now we go to the how we how the step by step we went for the upper, how the intuition happened. And what is mean by intuition? Intuition means like how without the we we how we can push the date. Uh, in forward position, how like upper position, or uh, without any orthodontic, orthodontic surgery, or uh, just extracting one four and two four, we have proceeded with the treatment with the with the uh, utility arch, uh, utility arch wire. So you, you can see how the changes are happening from the uh, 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 the changes, how it's pushing the other teeth back, backward by uh, repositioning that one. So next, we are going uh, how to achieve the true canine intuition without buffer fat. So we are saying how to achieve the true intuition, how to push the canine uh, towards uh, towards uh, towards the uh, second premolar. Then you can see the force and movement. How the force uh, it's applying in the in the canine and how it's pushing to, towards the uh, toward the how it's pushing towards the can toward the uh, uh, second premolar. After we we have extracted the one four and two four, so you can see the comparison of uh, pre and post uh, intrusion. Uh, the red color marks you can see pre and post, like how much the space between the teeth, and you can see the post how much is reduced, how much is before, and how much the pre and post. You can see the right side is the pre pre one, and the left side is the post one. So next we can see the upper anterior uh, interaction with the differentiation, like how. The changes are coming with the uh, with the helping of the tube. How the changes are coming? How the it's become the intrusion? Then we go to like pre and post. You can nicely uh, you can see that treatment. How the pre and post of changes. You can see in the right side how pre of it's before. How like uh, it's over that and over over by then. How uh, without the orthodontic sur surgery, uh, we you can see the in the website how the changes came. How the Good changes. How we can create a beautiful smile without doing a uh, non uh, non surgery, like without doing the orthodontic surgery. How can we, we can change with the help of without doing the orthodontic surgery with the simple procedures? So you can see the again we have taken the post radiographic uh, of the uh, the sixteen years old girl with the radiocephalogram uh, and OPG. Then you can see the gummy uh, the uh, the gum the ginseng one. How it's reduced from 5 mm to the 2 mm without the orthodontic surgery. Then I will play one small video of that. Uh, we make that one. Okay. You can see the changes how she is before her smile and after her smile. Before it's like this, after you can see the smile. One more time, I play that video and you can see that one. This is 
free of smile is the post of after after doing the automatic procedure you can see the changes and how the face structure changes with the appearance okay ma'am thank you ma'am thank you dr thank rajkumar you. for your presentation any thank questions you. from the session sir is this your own case doctor i uh, uh, yes ma'am uh, we we have to we both uh, together we done this case that yes, and we me and my pg we guided this case and we follow up this case ma'am well don't you think the upper lip is short as well you should have done something to treat that too uh yes ma'am but uh we see uh, afterward ma'am that like many we are doing the corrections on the like, many with the gums gummies my we are doing we in future we see that upper lips also ma'am thank you thank you ma'am thank you Thank you, Dr. Rajkumar. Next, we'll move on to the next presenter. Oral presentation by Dr. Ananya Mukherjee from Surendra Dental College and Research Institute. The topic of the presentation is Tele Orthodontics: A New Era of the Orthodontic Digitalization. Dr. Ananya Mukherjee. Dr. Anand. Yes, ma'am. You are. Hello, ma'am. Am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. Uh, a very good afternoon to everyone. Myself, Dr. Anand Mukherjee, and today I'm going to present my uh, paper on the topic of teleorthodontics. So, first. Well, uh, we come to the introduction. So, orthodontics is a specialty of dentistry. deals with diagnosis, prevention, and correction of malposition, teeth, and jaw. Digital orthodontics involves use of advancement in technology in orthodontic treatment. Also, reducing uh, routine orthodontic appointments is essential during COVID-19 pandemic. Since teleorthodontics started getting more attention. So there are three main forms of virtual communication technology used in orthodontics. Those are virtual, virtual consultation, orthodontic review of the patient's self-loaded dental smile photos at a later time, and the third most important artificial intelligence assisted treatment monitor, monitoring with photos or videos taken by the patients. So in this respect, we aim to discuss the lights and shadows of this new communication healthcare system and its application in the field of orthodontics. Now, diagnosis, treatment planning, and patient screening. Diagnostic process in orthodontics is based on. the analysis of specific records such as intraoral and extraoral images extraoral images radio clinical evaluation is essential process to generate a dental uh, then deep analysis of the diagnostic records uh, occurred for the example of hard tissue and soft tissue uh, cephalometric and profile analysis now this is a dental monitoring system this smartphone based app allow patient to scan directly to their teeth and provide instantaneous feedback of the treatment progress to the clinician and orthodontic office this patient insert a smartphone into the scan box and allows a more predictable scan procedure now general guidelines when considering teleorthodontics select the teleorthodontic system that meets the need of the practice set up a dedicated computer in a secure area that maintains the protection of patient's information equip with a microphone headset speaker webcam for telecommunication purpose 
establish step by step instruction for patients explaining how to use the software to communicate with the providers to obtain a share photograph and video perform a trial run to test the setup schedule patients for a virtual appointment schedule follow up care for appointment before closing and document all teledentistry patient we should we have to document all the details about the uh, of the teledentistry patients now this is an example of conventional digital diagnostic uh, 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 photos the clinician usually make decision i'm sorry uh, and plan treatment strategies in front of the monitor taking all the skeletal soft tissue and dental alveolar components all the photos we have to take and this files can also be shared in a multidisciplinary approach now the most important thing patient orthodontist relationship from psychological perspective to ethical concern so first question is how do teleorthodontics and remote monitoring affect the patient orthodontist relationship and is teleorthodontics is the final incentive driven by the market do it yourself or direct to consumer orthodontic so firstly since teleorthodontics reduce the fees to fee and also there are few comments to the patient the patient can take decision at the their home and the uh, they uh, delivered uh, their so patient that is there any importance of this so this is the most important thing and nowadays for this there is a most important accessible thing that patient we have to maintain a, a good relationship with the patients so there are uh, so this is the a good relationship between patient and doctor can imply the a good uh, treat a successful treatment right so uh, this is this is the most uh, we can think this is the disadvantages of tele ortho but for this how we can overcome this there is some direct we should, uh, there is some direct messenger app uh, which can usually can ask a doctor and there is some feedback also so that uh, there is a patient doctor can e easily communicate now what are the advantages and disadvantages what are the advantages provide they provide treatment opportunity in rural area where orthodontists couldn't visit convenient treatment and less treatment time patient don't have to wait in the dental what what thank you dr rananya thank you ma'am any questions our next presentation is dr swapna srinivasagan savita dental college and hospital a topic is widening the horizon of knowledge through clinical practice and research skeletal anchorage device dr swapna dr swapna yeah Dr. Swapna. Dr. 
we just move on to the next presentation by dr harish harsha savita dental college and hospital the topic is a newly designed spring for disimpaction of bulkly placed canines dr harsha yes ma'am yeah ma'am please start your presentation yeah okay uh, can you please give me access to share my screen now you can uh, share your screen ma'am yes ma'am is it visible ma'am yeah visible ma'am so good afternoon everyone uh, my presentation is on a newly designed spray for buccal canine disimpaction it's a finite element study uh talking about the introduction part we know that canine impactions are the second most commonly impacted teeth and they remain unerupted uh usually uh, with a frequency of 1 to 3% uh the maxillary permanent canines have the longest eruption course and that is reported to be one of the major causes for uh, impactions of uh, canines uh in literature it has been shown that parietal canine impactions account for 85% of impactions and buccal canine impactions account for 15% of reported impactions and females are reported to have more canine impactions when compared to males usually the treatment options which are uh, advocated are either if the canine either disimpaction of the canine orthodontically if they are favorable if not surgical extraction of the impacted tooth is indicated so why is this impaction essential so it provides a uh, uh, a canine guided occlusion as canine has the longest root so there will be better stress bearing capacity uh, canine is the cornerstone of the maxillary arch hence it forms a transition between the anterior and the posterior teeth and in terms of function uh, canines are the only teeth that allow tearing of food so as much as possible it's highly essential that if the canine is impacted in a favorable position we disimpact that tooth so methods of disimpaction uh, a lot of literature has been reported where different kind of springs have been uh, utilized for disimpaction of uh, impacted teeth uh like these include the ballista spring or uh, the canine spring or any other methods of traction using nitai coil springs etc but the limitations of these springs are that most of these springs are for palatal canine impactions and uh, not many springs in fact there are no springs which are advocated in literature for buccal canine impactions so the aim of the present study was to develop a new spring a new disimpaction spring for buccal canine impactions so this is a spring design where it consists of a u loop with a helix of 3 mm uh, diameter the u loop has arms of 5 mm in uh, length and there is a 5 mm anterior and posterior arm from the u loop in the posterior arm uh, there is another helix of 3 mm which uh, has a distal extension arm which enters into the auxiliary slot of the molar tube so the u loop with the helix will help in controlling the sagittal movement of the tooth the second helix which is located post posterior to the u loop will help in the vertical as well as the buccolingual control of the tooth the impacted tooth so the objective was to analyze and evaluate the efficiency of this spring for canine disimpaction which is made using th three different wire dimensions and the objective was also to compare the efficiency of the spring with t loop for canine disimpaction so in the methodology the cbct of the patient was taken and uh, the 3d model was rendered on mimix 8.11 software uh, and the 3d version was constructed uh, the spring was constructed using a solid work software and the entire uh, model was then trans uh, like it was uh, transferred to the software for uh, fem finite element analysis so the study groups included four groups the first group included the spring which is made using a 1622 stainless steel wire the second group included the uh, 
has a spring made in 1725 TMA wire. The third group has a spring made in 1825 TMA wire. And the fourth group has a spring, uh, which is not the spring, but the T-loop made in 1725 TMA wire. So the outcomes that were evaluated were the rate of root movement or the rate of disimpaction in the sagittal vertical and transverse plane in all four involved groups. The stress acting on the bone and teeth with activation of spring by 3 mm in all four groups. And uh, what will be the total number of activations needed for disimpaction with the spring and with the loop? So the results are as follows. Uh, when evaluating the stress of the bone along with the teeth assembly, it can be observed that in the three groups where the spring has been used, the stress uh, is equivalently the same across the three groups, whereas the stress uh, for the for group four, which is the TLO group, is more when compared to the other three groups. In terms of displacement magnitude, uh, the pictorial representation shows that the displacement uh, using the spring is more when compared to that of the T loop. I will uh, show the numerical data later in the slides. So displacement in the X direction, again, uh, the spring shows a favorable result when compared to T loop. X direction is the vertical direction in the vertical plane. Y is in the transverse plane. So again, the results are more favorable for the spring. And Z is the sagittal direction. So this is the tabulation of the amount of uh, movement of uh, the tooth in across the four groups. So on an average, the HCD springs across the different Y dimensions uh, provide a tooth movement of 0.8 in the X direction, 0.4 in the Y and 0.1 in the Z direction. Whereas for T loop, it's nearly half of what is experienced with the spring. So uh, coming to the discussion, uh, why use a TMA wire over a stainless steel? Because of its high spring back property, the modulus of elasticity of uh, TMA is supposed to be um, lesser than that of stainless steel, but greater than that of nitai. So this has an advantage of uh, producing lesser force when compared, like TMA has an advantage of producing lesser force when compared to stainless steel, and it can give a more controlled tooth movement during deactivation when compared to nitai alloys. Uh, TMA uh, lacks edge bevel effect, so it is more effective in bringing about a better tooth movement and a precise tooth movement when compared to stainless steel. Talking about the design of the spring, uh, it has a greater length of wire, so there is an increased range of action which generates a greater moment to force ratio, and there's a very minimal activation that is needed every appointment. I do rotating room no pre-activation bends are needed for the spring. On comparison with uh, T-loop, the range of disimpaction of uh, the spring is more when compared to the T-loop. So uh, for the spring on an overall evaluation in the X direction, we need at least 12 to 13 activations for the spring, whereas 25 activations for T-loop. Uh, in the y direction, you need 0.5 uh, activation yeah, and 1 to 1.5 activation for the table. Uh, and for the uh, z direction, we need around 89 to 90 activations when compared to T loop, which is quite less. Uh, from this study, we can say that on an average, we need 12 to 13 activations for good displacement in the for good displacement of the tooth. Uh, but in the Z direction, uh, we need to provide some additional force for the vertical movement of the, or the vertical disimpaction of the kinet. So the limitations is that it's an in vitro study on an FEM model. So clinical reliability has to be assessed. Additional clinical factors such as periodontal health of the tooth, post disimpaction, tissue response during disimpaction, the ease of fabrication of the spring and activation of the spring needs to be evaluated. Evaluation of the action of spring with pre-activation bends also need to be evaluated, whether they are favorable or unfavorable. And movement of the tooth through attached gingiva, it needs to be evaluated as uh, uh, usually in cases of buccal canal impaction, there are very high chances where uh, we lose the attached gingival uh, position. And there are high chances of poor periodontal health post disimpaction. So this needs to be clinically evaluated and validated. So HCD spring can be used as an aid to bring about effective therapy 
therapeutic disinfection of buccally impacted maxillary canines. Uh, the present study was an in vitro study, which was conducted on a finite animal, elemental model. So a clinical correlation should be carried out to substantiate the obtained results. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Any questions? Session chairs, any questions? Our next presentation is Dr. Ankita Komal Lab, Savita Dental College and Hospital. The topic is treatment of severe crowding in the upper anterior segment by application of segmental mechanism. Dr. Ankita. Next presentation by Dr. Akshaya A. Savita Dental College and Hospital. Dr. Akshaya. Hello, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Am I yeah. audible? Yes, ma'am. Audible. Please uh, share your presentation. Is my screen visible, ma'am? Yes, ma'am, visible. Yeah, okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Akshaya from uh, Savita Dental College. Uh, I'm here to present about modified spring for uprighting uh, mesial angular impacted molars. Uh, why do molars get blocked out? Uh, molars blocked out mainly due to crowding, arch length, uh, tooth material discrepancy. Uh, it, uh, arch length and tooth material discrepancy can cause uh, uh, mainly uh, dental caries, periodontal issues, and then uh, distal root resorptions. Uh, why do uh, we look into it? Uh, uh, we, we can easily extract it, right? But then, uh, on note of saving it, uh, we. It, it may provide a more occlusal antagonist for the upper arch. Uh, we fabricated a spring, a conventional uh, simple spring, uh, using a 16-22 eye wire. Uh, use, uh, we used a clinching uh, plier. Steps in fabrications like uh, there were four bends were made, uh, first 90 degree and then four, four were 90 degree bends. Uh, we got like uh, uh, three uh, horizontal arm and two vertical arm. On uh, insertion of the spring, um, there were like two, one horizontal arm of the spring is inserted into the axillary tube of the molar 36 and then other arm into the uh, buccal tube of 37. Uh, on activation of it, um, 36 may exert uh, an operating force on the 37. Uh, you all can ask me like uh, there are like other methods, why, why should we opt for a uh, spring? But then uh, while looking into the conventional orthodontic treatment, uh, treatment that uh, arch wire, it may cause uh, over expansion of the arch, which, which may cause an arch distortion also. I mean, while looking into the mini screws, uh, it is more invasive procedure when compared to the uh, normal conventional uh, spring. Uh, the advantages of using springs where it can be easily uh, uh, fabricated, minimi minim minimizing the charge side time and then patient's inconvenience. Uh, and then no additional loops, bends or complex biotechnics were utilized here. Uh, application of the springs uh, have like uh, light and constant forces, which may uh, hasten the rate of tooth movement and uh, improve its efficiency. Um, it the re redirecting the forces distally while the entire arch as an entire arch will be used uh, used as an anchorage here. There will be no uh, reciprocal uh, effects well compared to that of the mini screws. Uh, what is the disadvantage of using the conventional orthodontic treatment? Means because it will cause a uh, buckle rolling of molars and then outward expansion. Um, this is the case we did in, we did here. Uh, like uh, here, the normal uh, uh, arch wire was placed up to 3.6 and then by 3.7, uh, we placed a screw. Uh, we, we placed a, a spring uh, we are, where we inserted a say, horizontal arm into the axillary tube and then, uh, um, and then uh, the horizontal arm into the buckle tube of 3.7. This is the first month review. Uh, and then the... Uh, first month, it was like slightly mesioangulated. Uh, in the second month, you can see the much differences. Uh, this is the post-operative effect, uh, effect that uh, that after came after the three months. Uh, here, the only problem faced here is uh, uh, while using more uh, uh, spring for more time, it can also uh, cause some sort of uh, uh, arch distortion. Uh, we also conducted another uh, case like uh, where he play, uh, where he placed the. Uh, uh, lingual orthodontic braces on the orthodontic treatment on the lingual side and then uh, um, spring on the buccal side uh, where you can approach this. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Akshaya. Yeah. Any uh, questions? Dr. Akshaya? Yes, sir. Can you explain us how does it work? How does the spring work? Sir, uh, wait. Sir, it's basically like uh, uh, when we place the horizontal harm and there is an axillary tube here, no, sir, like in three, six, and the horizontal harm will be placed there. And then the the other horizontal loop will be placed on the three sevens buckle tube, sir. Uh, while uh, on the, the three six will exert an uh, uh, uprighting clenching effect on the three seven, sir. Uh, over a period of time, it will. Uh, How do you prepare the anchorage for the spring? Sorry, sir. But well, the anchorage is uh, bought from the whole entire uh, arch, uh, arch, uh, lower arch, sir. That uh, three, three six, and then other arch bombs, sir. Okay, fine. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you for your presentation. Our next presentation by Dr. Shivani N. Savita Dental College and Hospital. Dr. Shivani. Next presentation by Dr. Mohammad Ab Ab Abrara, Savita Dental College and Hospital. Dr. Mohammad. Dr. Mohammad. Dr. Mohammad. We move on to the next presentation by Dr. Reepa, Savita Dental College and Hospital. Dr. Reepa. Dr. Rebecca. It's Rebecca. Uh, yes, um, it's uh, Rebecca, ma'am. Okay. Yes. Okay, ma'am. Please start your presentation. Yes, ma'am. Doctor, uh, uh, yes, ma'am. I'm, uh, I'm not able to share my screen. Okay. Okay, doctor, uh, you check for that. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, we will have a next presentation by Dr. Yes, Sharada Jadav, Adi Aditya Dental College, Bead. We move on to the next presentation by Dr. Mohammad Abrar. Savita Dental College and Hospital. A topic is unwrap a smile. Dr. Mohammed. Uh, am I audible, ma'am? Yes, yes, sir. Audible. Start your presentation, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Today, my topic is unwrap a smile. Uh, I'm Mohammed Abra, from Savita Dental College, fellow in the uh, Department of Aesthetic Dentistry. I want, this is my introduction. Dental veneers. Uh, crowns are uh, used to help to improve the aesthetic appearance of your smile. Both cover your teeth to mask imperfections such as discoloration, spacing, misshaped, and chipped tooth. Uh, porcelain veneer is just basically bonded to the front surface of the tooth, while a dental crown covers your entire tooth. This tends to make veneers more aesthetically pleasing than crowns because 
uh, they show less gum margins. Now the following presentation uh, is a case, generally a case presentation. It take you uh, through three different discoloration cases and space closures done using combination of both veneers and crowns or just veneers. Now this is the first case. This uh, patient is aged 33, female patient. Her uh, chief complaint was discoloration in the upper front tooth region for past maybe 10 years. She wanted uh, to go with dental venous. The, usually the treatment modality is dental venous or you can give crowns, uh, sometimes uh, tooth whitening treatments. So we went on with uh, dental venous of six rings, one, 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 two, one, three, two, one, two, two, and two, three. So you see in this image, initially we gave her a, a depth grooves using a depth cut bar. Uh, we, then we did a label reduction, maybe 1.2 mm to 0.5 mm reduction. Uh, then we did a cord and gave her a temporary compression and gave her a temporary. Uh, we had sent a temporary to the lab and when that came back, as you see here, this is the tabletop image of the <coughs> venous that came uh, that came from the lab. Uh, then we, did, we uh, proceeded with the venous drying for that patient, as you see in this image. Then we, we then we did etch, uh, etching and uh, bonding of the two uh, tooth surface of the patient, as well as etch, etching on the venous. Then we proceeded with the cementation. Here, as you see in that uh, advice, this is the post op of cementation of the patient. Immediate cementation. So in this slide, you clearly see the pre-op of the patient and the post-op. This is a pre-op closer smile as well as the post-op closer smile of the patient. And we are able to appreciate the disc uh, mass discoloration of the tooth surface of uh, uh, maxillary anterior. We proceed on with the second case presentation. As you see, this is a patient of uh, age 56. She's a female patient as well. She had a spacing in the upper maxillary anterior. Uh, since she did not want to go through an orthodontic treatment, we proceeded with the uh, uh, veneers for the space closure here. This is the pre-op of the patient, as you see, intramaxillary cuspation as well as a close-up smile. So, uh, the diagnosis was uh, diastema in relation to 11123 and 2122 and 23. Now, proceeding on with this case, we had to do a zenith correction for this patient, as you can see in the uh, presentation. We did a zenith correction over one one and two region, and we proceeded with the uh, depth giving burst and uh, depth grooves, and then uh, label reduction. Then we had placed the retraction cords. Then uh, taken after, after taking impression, we have given a temporary for this patient. Now in this photo, as you see, we have receiving the venous in the lab. We did a trying for the patient here and uh, proceeded with the etchant and bonding of the tooth surface as well as the etching and uh, sanitization of the venous. Now, in this uh, picture, you can clearly appreciate the uh, uh, post cementation photo, how clearly it has masked the spacing. As you see here, this is the pre-op and post-op of the same patient, as well as a pre-op closer smile and post-op closer, closer smile of the patient. Now, moving on with the last case, and this is a particularly interesting one. Since uh, this patient is actually an um, ortho rehab patient, there was space again after ortho treatment. So, uh, we decided to go with no preparedness. As you see in this particular image, this is the area of concern of the patient. Uh, here is the intramaxillary pre of uh, patient and the closest point of this patient. Yeah, you can clearly appreciate the diastema in relation to 11123, all six anterior, maxillary anteriors. So, we, we plan to do no prep venous. There was a slight preparation only on the canines of both the uh, maxillary anterior canines. The, other than that, there was no spacing of this, uh, do no preparation was done on this patient. Then we went on to do labial reduction on both of the canines. And then we did a cord packing of this patient for taking impression to reflect margins. Then we took the impression, sent it to a lab and gave him a temporary. Now, after receiving uh, the uh, venous from the lab, this is the tabletop photo I have seen. And uh, we proceeded with as usual as the etchant and the tooth bonding on tooth surfaces, as well as the etchant uh, and the sanitization process on the venous. Now, this is the photo we are seeing for isolation, trying photo. And uh, this is the immediate uh, post op uh, cementation of the patient you are seeing in the screen. 
this is the pre op and post op of the simul equation as as i told you before there is a, there was no prep done on uh, uh, 11 and 12 and 2122 just slight preparation was done on uh, uh, 13 and 23 and we have given all vinyas six vinyas this is the pre op and post op you can see here as well as pre op smile and post op smile so in conclusion not too long ago people be it common man or celebrities wanted to show that they have dental processes the diamond studs or golden crowns etc but now bright beautiful smiles are much in demand and this is not just among celebrities but it is also common nowadays in uh, ordinary people as well the aim of the aim of a dentist is not just to restore the aesthetics but to provide a restoration that provides the functional biological as well as mechanical integrity thereby enhancing the general health and welfare of the patient uh, so i'll finally finish my presentation with a quote the greatest self is a peaceful smile that always sees the world smiling back thank you any questions doctor thank you dr mohammad dr rebecca yes ma'am can you able to uh, start your presentation now yes ma'am yeah one minute uh ma'am i think i will have to come back uh, join again it is showing uh, an option like that only then i'll be able to share is it fine ma'am yeah okay ma'am yeah, uh, i will join in a minute ma'am meanwhile uh, we have an another presentation oh. next presentation by uh, shraddha jad dau aditya dental college b dr shraddha dr shraddha dr shraddha shraddha jadav dr shraddha we move on to the next presentation by havisha nukala shavita dental college and hospital dr havisha um, i think uh, dr yes. reba now you Rebecca. can able to yes are you able Rebecca. to see this yeah yeah ma'am yeah ma'am please start your presentation you. yes sorry yes. for the delay no problem a very good afternoon to all of you uh can you see ma'am yes ma'am okay a very good afternoon to all of you i am uh, uh, dr rebecca from savita dental college i am a post graduate resident and i'm here to present an e poster on a study of mine uh, which is uh, titled as the reliability of photographic fsa angle as a diagnostic aid for determining the anterior posterior discrepancies in malocclusion subjects uh, so this is a prospective study that we conducted in our department uh, in the hospital setup where we included uh, patients and uh, their photographic and cephalometric uh, records in order to obtain a new soft tissue angle which is named as the fsa angle fsa determines the frankfurt plane subnasal pogonion angle uh, which is a soft tissue angle that we determined using uh, profile photographs of the patient uh, the aim of this study was to assess whether the soft tissue fsa angle could be used as a diagnostic parameter in determining the maxillo mandibular like anterior posterior relationships so starting with the study the rationale of the study involved that the soft tissue evaluation is important in orthodontic diagnosis and treatment planning so the every orthodontist must treat patients within the limits of their soft tissue adaptation 
we all know that the heart tissue morphology is influenced by soft tissue function and adaptation. Hence, anteroposterior discrepancies can be evaluated more efficiently using soft tissue analysis. So this new soft tissue angle called the FSA angle could be used to assess the anterior posterior mal relationships. Moving on to the materials and methods of the study. So this study again included uh, about uh, the records of about 200 patients and after the inclusion and exclusion criteria, it was cut down to a sample size of 20 in each of the groups and these groups were divided into class 1, class 2 and class 3 malocclusion patients. The inclusion criteria involved orthodontic patients requiring orthodontic treatment with the age range of about 18 to 40 years uh, without any uh, pre-treatment or previous orthodontic treatment conditions or any other malrelations. So the photographic setup, again, a DSLR camera with a 100 mm macro lens was used, mounted on a tripod, which was used for the photographs. The camera was used in manual mode with a shutter speed of about uh, 1 by 125 with an ISO 100 and magnification ratio of 1.1. Uh, the subjects were in natural head position with lips and soft tissue at rest. And the natural head position was determined by placing a mirror in front of them. And they were asked to tilt their head up and down until they felt relaxed. A 30 centimeter steel ruler was attached to the wall vertically. And the patients were made to stand in front of the wall in a natural head position, looking at their eye level. Uh, so these photographs were taken and then they were transferred to a software, which is the FACAD orthodontic tracing software of version 3.1. This software helped us to uh, do all the measurements and uh, determine the angles, and uh, both the soft tissue as well as the cephalometric angles. Moving on to the radiographic procedure. The lateral cephalometric radiographs were taken under standard conditions and exposure parameters of about uh, 78 kilovolt with a 10 milliampere and 0.6 uh, seconds. It was taken with teeth at maximum intercuspation with the lips at rest and the patient in the natural head position. Uh, as we can see, there is a picture which depicts how a patient's profile photograph was taken and the same uh, patient's cephalometric radiographs were also taken accordingly. Uh, again, now with the FACAD software, these uh, new FSA angle as well as standardized anterior posterior angles, which is the A and B angle, the beta angle, were uh, determined eventually. Under results and discussion, the statistical analysis for this study was done using the SPSS software. Uh, mainly, this was done to estimate the mean and standard deviation of the measured angles. And again, later the correlation between these angles were done using Pearson correlation tests. Uh, the table actually uh, depicts about all the parameters that are included, the FSA and beta angle, the A and B angle values, their uh, standard deviation, mean, and the number of uh, angles that were determined. The table above, again, is a correlation table, which depicts about the FSA angle Pearson correlation coefficient, uh, which states that there is a correlation between the soft tissue FSA angle uh, and the beta angle and A and B angle. Uh, when we see the graph, uh, it represents that there is a correlation, but there is a high positive correlation between FSA and the beta angle, which says that an increase in the FSA angle, there is an increase in the beta angle as well. And there is a high negative correlation between the FSA angle and the A and B angle, which states that a high FSA angle uh, would have a decrease in the A and B angle. So comparing all these angular cephalometric and photographic parameters of these three types of malocclusion, there is a statistical significance between these values. And uh, so again, in Sorry conclusion... Sorry to interrupt you, doctor. Um, yes. You're exceeding your time limit, uh, kindly conclude. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, so to conclude, I would like to say that photographic FSA angle can be used as a diagnostic, uh, diagnostic parameter in determining the anterior posterior relationship. As we know from this study, uh, FSA angles show a high positive correlation with beta angle and a high negative correlation with A and B angle. And as we know that the soft tissue paradigm is more uh, trending in these times, even for the patient as well as for the dentist, it is important that we take the soft tissue parameters also into consideration. Thank you so much for your patient listening. Thank you, doctor. Any limitations for this angle, doctor? 
Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, limitation, I would say that uh, it is a soft tissue angle. So there are uh, times when there is soft tissue compensation in certain patients, so which can be a limitation in this study. Uh, but more generalized, uh, this uh, we have taken only for 60 subjects. So if we could increase the number of samples, we could come to a more generalized uh, category of how the values could be and how it would be related to the cephalometric angles, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, doctor. Our next presentation by Dr. Shraddha Jadav, Aditya Dental College B. Dr. Shraddha, we just move on to the next presentation by Havisha Nukala, Savita Dental College and Hospital. Dr. Havisha. Dr. Havisha. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. I hear you. Start your presentation now. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, could you give me a minute to share the screen, please? Okay. Yeah. Your screen is visible, ma'am, actually. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Avisha Nukula from Savita Dental College, a second year postgraduate student. And I'm presenting an e-poster on the effect of rhodium coating on um, um, effect of rhodium coating on uh, night eye wires, uh, effect of rhodium coating on surface and mechanical properties of night eye wires, uh, which is a systematic review of in, in vitro studies. Now we know in that in recent times with advanced research in material science, versatility to orthodontic treatment is brought about by an expanding inventory of arch wires. And to keep up with this rising demand for functional aesthetics, researchers have made conscious efforts to enhance the aesthetic appearance of metallic orthodontic appliance, including the arch wires themselves. Now, however, there are a lot of studies uh, which say that these aesthetic coatings, uh, they bring about changes in the surface topography due to loss of coating while used intraorally, which might turn, uh, cause increased friction and dimensional variability. So therefore the aim of the study was to systematically review, collate and analyze the available literature that addresses and reports the effect of rhodium coating on surface and mechanical properties of nickel titanium orthodontic arch wires. Now coming to the methodology, uh, the, this systematic review was registered with the Prospero database with the registration number CRD 4202367530. And moving on to the search strategy, we identified all peer-reviewed articles pertaining to the research question and electronic databases like PubMed, Cochrane, Scopus, and Web of Science were searched. And only articles published in English language were uh, searched and uh, between published between the time period of January 2000 to April 2022 were included. And uh, the duplicates were removed by the software Ryan. And uh, as you can see, there were total 720 articles which were identified from the following databases, of which 336, uh, 386 articles were removed and 334 articles were further screened based on the eligibility criteria which is according to the PICO format would be a uh, population being the in vitro studies, intervention being the rhodium coated nickel titanium wires, control group being uncoated or other coated nickel titanium arch wires, and outcome would be the mechanical and surface properties. So in total, uh, 12 studies was included in the qualitative uh, assessment. And uh, moving on to the characteristics table, I'm really sorry because the table is not very uh, clear very blurry um, but uh, we found that uh, out of out of the 12 studies included um, six um, various studies had uh, various uh, testing equipments for example um, our main outcomes were surface roughness which a lot of studies used either a surface rugosimeter or an optical profilometer or a stylus instrument and the second parameter was micro or nano hardness, which was again uh, studied by either nano intent or a Vickers uh, micro hardness tester. 
third parameter was low deflection rate, which was again tested using universal testing machine. And the fourth and the final parameter was friction, which was again studied by universal testing machine or a surface profilometer. The risk of bias of the included studies was used based on uh, this, the OHAT tool, of which six studies report, were reported to have low risk of bias, and six studies were reported, uh, reported moderate risk of bias. Since there was no mention of sample size calculation, blinding of the data, and resolution of funding bias and conflict bias. And convenience sampling was reported in most of these studies, and sample size calculation was not reported in any study. Now, moving on to the results of the studies, nine articles studied surface roughness as a test parameter, of which six articles reported that rhodium coating increased the surface roughness of night eye wires. Three articles reported there was no significant difference between uh, the rhodium coated arch wires and the non coated arch wires. Three articles considered nano or micro hardness as a test parameter, of which two studies reported lesser nano hardness in rhodium coated arch wires than uncoated arch wires, whereas one study reported no difference. The three, uh, three articles studied low deflection rate, of which two articles reported similar low deflection rate between the rhodium coated and uncoated arch wires, and one study reported a greater low deflection rate in rhodium coated arch wire group. And two studies uh, uh, studied friction as the test parameter, of which one study reported greater frictional forces with rhodium coated night eye wires. And one study reported similar uh, frictional forces. Now, here I would like to say that since there was a lot of heterogeneity in the included studies, uh, which could be attributable to different testing parameters, uh, different wires tested, as well as different units of measurement, meta-analysis could not be performed for the following um, outcome measures, which include surface roughness, load deflection, friction, and uh, micro-hardness or nano-hardness. Now, coming to the conclusion part, uh, I would like to say that uh, the most of the studies included in the review had a moderate to low risk of bias. Therefore, their findings can be considered as reliable. However, due to the metholo methodological differences and inconsistencies in assessing the test parameters, uh, the clinical implication of this review would be to highlight the need for careful consideration of arch wire selection to ensure efficient aligning and to minimize the side effects like enamel decalcification due to plaque accumulation from the increased surface roughness of the wire. And based on our findings, it is suggested that the rhodium coated night eye arch wires can be used for certain cases where patients maintain good oral hygiene and where friction is not critical for the initial leveling and aligning phase. from the collected data available from the in vitro studies included in this review, the following conclusions could therefore be derived that rhodium coated arch wires were reported to have increased surface roughness, lesser nano hardness, and similar low deflection rate and frictional forces when compared to its non-coated arch wires. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for patient listening. Hello. Yes, doctor. Nice, pre nice presentation, doctor. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Any questions, doctor? No, we can move on. Okay, doctor. Thank Our you. next presentation. Thanks. Our next presentation by Dr. Swati Singh, Swetha Dental College and Hospital. Dr. Swati. We move on to the next presentation by Dr. Hello. Niharika. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Good Swati. afternoon, ma'am. I'm Swati. Yeah, ma'am. From Savita Dental College. Okay, ma'am. Start your presentation, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. So uh, today, my presentation title, research title is Comparative Digital Occlusal Analysis in Two Different Kinds of Sagittal Malocclusion in Dravidian Population. It's a prospective study which was conducted in our college. So uh, it, this is my study where the objective is to evaluate the digital occlusal parameters and compare using a tech scan version 9.1 on subjects with angles class 2 div 2 malocclusion and class 1 malocclusion in the South Indian population. So beginning with the materials and methods, 
we included sub 70 subjects with malocclusion divided in equally into two groups, 45 in each group. Uh, so we studied the posterior anterior force distribution ratio, the left to right force percentage ratio, occlusion time, disocclusion time were noted in all these subjects and the bite force ratio between the genders of both the groups were evaluated. So coming to the results, the bite force distribution ratio between the posterior region to the anterior region was statistically higher in class one subjects uh, with the p-value of less than 0 0.05 there was no significant difference in the disocclusion time between the two groups, whereas the occlusion time was high in class two diff two subjects and was statistically significant again. The left to right force percent ratio was more in class one subjects. The class one female subjects showed greater posterior to anterior ratio, whereas males in class two diff two subjects showed significant left to right ratios. Uh, so moving on to the results, the class one subjects as compared to the class two dip two subject showed lower disocclusion time. And when the occlusion parameters were compared using the T-scan, stat statistically significant difference was found with respect to the bite force ratios, occlusion times of both group, and the increase, the increase in occlusion time is suggestive of the occlusional prematurities. Uh, there was no significant difference in the disocclusion time between the both between the two groups. Uh, and uh, but it was increased in clear case of class two diff two subjects, which is again suggestive of increased muscular activity. The class one female subjects showed greater posterior to anterior ratio, whereas males in class two diff two subjects showed significant left to right ratio. So the future scope of this research can be since we have treated taken uh, non orthodontically treated patients in our uh, study, we can check after the treatment, post orthodontically treatment, orthodontic treatment, what are the changes in the occlusal parameters that are assessed, that can be assessed in the class two diff two subjects, as we know that there are uh, literature supporting that there are TMD disorders in case of class two diff two subjects. So this can be a reference as to check of post orthodontic treatment, what are the changes in the occlusal parameters? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, doctor. Any questions? Can you please tell me the possible reasons for the differences in the results? Uh, yes, ma'am. So, uh, as we know, like the in the class two diff two subjects, due to the retroclination of the incisors, the first teeth to come in contact were the anteriors. We also did a survey, like which tooth was coming co in contact first. So mostly the posteriors were coming in contact first for the class one subjects, whereas for the class two sub diff two subjects, there were more anterior contacts. So thereby the posterior to anterior ratio has been more in class one subjects as compared to class two subjects. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Our next presentation by Dr. Shadda Jadav, Aditya Dental College, B. Dr. Shraddha? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, ma'am, ma start your presentation, ma'am. Just a uh, please, just a second. Okay. Your screen is visible, ma'am. Start your presentation. Your voice is not audible, ma'am. Dr. Shraddha? Uh, ma'am, just a second. There is uh, some uh, problem, ma'am. Okay. Just give me five minutes. Okay, we will move on to the next presentation. 
A presentation by Dr. Niharika. Yes, ma'am. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, ma'am. Uh, start right. your presentation. Yes, ma'am. Just a second. Okay. Can you share? Uh, can you see my screen, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Visible. All right. So this is my study. My study topic uh, is to study the predictability of a digital testing setup. So um, to introduce my topic, the diagnostic setup proposed by H. T. Kingsley, it serves as a practical aid in treatment planning and diagnosis in orthodontics. So uh, visual setups, also known as the visual testing setup, are the new development in dentistry. The manual testing setup is a laborious process. but can be uh, can be beneficial for very complex cases where we have to do treatment planning uh, in a very difficult case so the kessling setup is a procedure done on plaster models and it involves individual individualizing the teeth and rearranging them in the required position in order to finalize the treatment plan so to do so blades are used to cut the teeth in the models So now this cutting of the teeth on the models leads to tooth material loss which hampers the accuracy of the tooth fit. Dental models provide a great deal of information on the meso distal dimension of the teeth, arch length discrepancy, dental asymmetry and arch relationship in a three dimension. A dental model can also be used to uh, to produce a 3D simulation of a treatment plan. So in my study we have used a digital version of this diagnostic setup which is called a virtual setup or a virtual testing setup which helps us to perform the same function that we do in the manual method however there is no loss of the tooth structure during the cutting of the teeth the ultimate prediction is more accurate than the manual method so through these simulations potential therapeutic objectives such as the need for tooth extraction or interproximal stripping can be evaluated since the digital setup provides more accuracy treatment plans become less speculative resembling a real treatment and providing orthodontist with reliable information along with making the process less messy and tedious so in the current study in the current study we have used the digital version of the same kessling setup to plan the treatment so the aim of my study is to analyze the accuracy of treatment outcome prediction performed using the study or uh, using the kessling setup so what did i actually do in this study was that uh, a sample size of 25 subjects was chosen uh, the inclusion criteria were both male and female with full natural permanent dentition who were to be treated with first permanent uh, premolar extraction we uh, did a complete intraoral scan uh, for every individual subject using the trios three shape intraoral scanner and these scans were then transferred to the three shape ortho analyzer software now the digital kessling setup was performed on the pre treatment digital models where the upper and lower first premolars were extracted and the teeth were repositioned in a desired angles class 1 molar relationship now post performing the digital kessling setup and keeping the prediction in mind the treatment was started using the mbt bracket prescription and after the entire course of treatment was completed the brackets were debonded and another post operative intraoral scan was again taken using the same uh, intraoral scanner five measurements were recorded namely which was the intermolar distance the inter second premolar distance inter canine distance the anterior posterior distance from the center of the incisal edge and the axial inclination of the central incisor to the occlusal plane the measurements were performed on both pre treatment and post treatment models of the kessling setup and post orthodontic treatment of the digital model and to further improve the accuracy post treatment scans were superimposed on the models achieved after performing the kessling setup to quantify and analyze the discrepancy the results that we obtained uh, the results that we obtained are shown in the table that i have given here where we can see that the distance from the central incisor to the line joining 66 or uh, to the line joint here in this table you can see uh, that that post treatment is lesser than the pre treatment uh, what can we finally conclude uh, with this uh, study was that from the present in vivo study it follows that the null hypothesis is rejected which means that the intermolar distance inter canine distance angle of the long axis were predicted virtually were more than that was achieved and the anterior posterior distance planned virtually was more 
which basically means that although the digital guessing setup can be used to do a lot of predictions it actually gives us um, how we can move the teeth and what the treatment outcome can be but we cannot 100% rely because what you get uh, using the setup is not 100% same as what you will get clinically so although it is beneficial but you cannot 100% rely on it is what my study concludes thank you so much thank you doctor any questions no questions please okay next presentation by dr arshaya a kumar savita dental college and hospital dr arshaya uh, yes ma'am can you hear me yes ma'am start your presentation ma'am yes good afternoon my name is dr arshaya kumar I'm second year postgraduate from Savita Dental College. My study topic is evaluation of the relationship between sphenoid sinus and cranial base and various malocclusion, which is a diagnostic CBCT study. The sphenoid sinus, why I consider this study is because it is a paired, it's a paired paranasal sinus that is contained within the body of the sphenoid sinus. The craniofacial growth is crucial for better diagnosis, treatment planning, and outcome evaluation. The cranial base structures are used to evaluate the craniofacial growth. The anterior cranial base is considered to have completed its most significant growth before other facial skeletal structures. Hence, the anterior cranial base has been considered as a stable craniofacial structure to be used for cephalometric superimpositions during the usual orthodontic treatment. The spheno-occipital synchondrosis is the joint between the basal portions of the sphenoid and occipital bone, which is an important center for the longitudinal growth of the human skull. The aim of my study was to predict the skeletal malocclusion by correlating the length of the cranial base and volume of the sphenoid sinus. The method was, the study was conducted using 30, 30 CBCT scans of adult patients aged between 18 to 35 years. A dolphin software was used to measure the volume of the, sphenoid, of, of the sphenoid sinus. The volume of the sphenoid sinus was evaluated. The anterior, posterior, lateral, medial, and superior, and the inferior wall of the sphenoid sinuses were defined, and the region of interest was segmented. After segmentation, the volume of the right and sphenoid sinus were reconstructed and measured in cubic millimeters by the software. The length of the cranial base was measured using cephalometric analysis, burst on analysis. There were three groups. Group 1, CBCT of patients with skeletal class 1 malocclusion. Group 2, CBCT of patients with skeletal class 2 malocclusion. And group 3, CBCT of patients with skeletal uh, class 3 malocclusion. The result of my study was the CBCT scan analysis constitute of variable, valuable resources of volumetric measurements of the sphenoid sinus and cranial base length. There was a statistically significant difference in the volume of the sphenoid sinus in group 2, that is class 2 malocclusion, while there was not much statistically significant difference in group 1 and group 3. The length of the cranial base was not statistically, not statistically significant. The class 2 skeletal, mal, uh, skeletal malocclusion had increased in, in class 2 skeletal malocclusion. There was an increase in cranial base length. The conclusion of my study was the conclusion of my study was there was a statistically significant difference in the volume of the uh, volume of the sphenoid sinus only in class 2 malocclusion but there was no change in the cranial base length between the three groups thank you what are the clinical implications of the study 
Ma'am, it is uh, basically a, just to diagnose whether we can predict the uh, malocclusion based on the volume of the sphenoid sinus and length of the cranial base. It's, it was just to correlate. No, but like to measure the volume of sphenoid sinus, uh, we need a CBCT. And from yes, the same, we can check the skeletal malocclusion as well. Uh, no, ma'am. It was to uh, suppose a patient is a young patient because the anterior cranial base, uh, uh, the growth stops at an early compared to the facial growth, facial skeletal uh, bones. We wanted to check if we could predict the further future malocclusion if we uh, have a CBCT of a young patient. If you take it for a young patient, then growth also matters. Then there would be changes no, in that too. Ma'am, we wanted to predict because uh, only the anterior cranial base is known to uh, uh, anterior cranial base growth stops first compared to the other facial uh, structures. Sure. Anyways, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, doctor. Any questions, doctor? Our next presentation by Dr. Nizlin Valerie Vas, Savita Dental College and Hospital. Dr. Nazlin. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ma'am. Start your presentation, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm just sharing my screen. Okay. Mom, is my screen visible? Visible, ma'am. Oh. Um, good afternoon. The, the uh, topic of my poster is the preparation and coating of a gingerol extract based uh, orthodontic aligner coating and um, finding out its antimicrobial activity. So aligners is nothing new. It's been around since 1945 when it was introduced by Dr. H.T. Kessling. However, it's only now recently with the accessibility of India. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I think your image is not open. You just uh, opened your image, ma'am. Um, one second. The image is not open. Uh, ma'am, is it live? Can you see my screen now? Yes, ma'am. I can see your screen, uh, but your poster is not visible. The first image is your poster, right? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, ma'am. Uh, you just uh, double click on it uh, so that uh, we can able to see. Uh, ma'am, it is on. Is it visible now? No, ma'am. I think uh, you click stop sharing and again you click uh, sharing uh, so that uh, we can able to see. Uh, ma'am, is it is yes, it? Yes, ma'am. Now, now, okay. Start, ma'am. Yeah. Well, um, Aligners has in, has existed as a concept since 1945, but it's only recently with the advancement in intraoral scanners and 3D designing so, uh, software that the use of aligners has really been taken up. So the advantages of aligners uh, is that it's more aesthetic, uh, associated with lower pain thresholds, which makes this more acceptable to patients. However, uh, just like fixed appliances, aligners also allow uh, plaque biofilm formation owing to the micro cracks and corrugations on their surface. And also there's increased surface roughness uh, after thermoforming, which leads to bacterial adhesion. Um, now bacterial uh, bioadhesion and resultant plaque formation mainly rely on surface morphology. So an easy remedy would be surface modification of the liner. This has been pre previously explored with the use of cinnamaldehyde in thermophiles and also um, gold nanoparticle-based coatings. However, um, we would want to reduce the amount of leaching of metal oxides 
in the oral cavity and also introduce um, simpler methods of coating for an appliance that is to be used every uh, used and discarded every 14 days. So um, the, uh, the solution that we introduced was a kyrosan based biopolymer um, with a gingerol uh, extract incorporated in it. Um, so coming to my methods and uh, materials, um, I would like to start first with um, the preparation of the gingerol. So for this 250 mm, uh, uh, 250 mg of uh, zingerone was dissolved in 10 ml of ethanol. And um, so this was how we got a gingerol extract. We, um, we also prepared a kyrosan solution with 0.5 mm, uh, 0.5 grams of low molecular weight kyrosan and 2% acetic acid solution. So um, following a study by Gail B. Mahadi, um, gingerol, six gingerols showed an antimicrobial activity at an MIC of 25 micrograms per ml. So using this study as reference, we uh, used an MIC of two of uh, 25 micrograms in our coating. So coming to the main coating process. So first we made it, we designed a template in order to form cubes of one uh, centimeter cube. So um, the thermoforming process was done using Biostar by Show, and uh, the liner sheet material used was 0.5 uh, mm sheet Duran by Shu. So um, after thermoforming, functionalization of the surface was carried out by subjecting it to UV irradiation for 20 minutes, following which it was uh, dip coated with a cross-linking agent uh, which we used here was polyethylene amine. After this, um, the coated cubes were kept in a hot air oven at 50 degrees Celsius for an hour, uh, following which they were dip coated again for a period of five minutes, 10 minutes, and 15 minutes um, in three different batches. And this was again baked at 50 degrees Celsius for an hour. So these uh, samples were accordingly labeled G5, G10, and G15. And uh, the next tests were continued. So the test that we had to do, uh, first of all, was to characterize the kind of gingerol. So gingerols can exist in various isomers, and we wanted to confirm the presence of six gingerol in the extract. So we did this using nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy or an NMR anal analysis. We also did an FBIR test of Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy to confirm that there was cross-linking between the coating and the liner material. Coming to the crux of our study, we carry, carried out a disk diffusion test against streptococcus mutants and E. coli over each sample of five minutes, 10 minutes, and 15 minutes. Um, uh, coming to the results, we realized that uh, sample three, that is the 15 minute sample, had the largest zone in, of inhibition against streptococcus mutants. The control as well showed, um, showed uh, activity. This is because kytosan has its own inherent um, antibacterial activity. Aside from this, we, we also realized that E. coli, uh, the coating didn't have much potency against E. coli. So I would like to conclude uh, saying that in the disk diffusion test, we observed that the antimicrobial property of gingerol coating was evident against streptococcus mutants and um, this was also confirmed by a scanning electron microscope uh, following a static uh, streptococcus mutants adhesion test. Um, I do feel that uh, we, can, we can try to see whether uh, kytosan has its own, uh, has uh, increased antibacter antibacterial potency uh, over larger periods of time, and also if there are better or more, more uh, resistant methods of coating and aligning them. Thank you, ma'am. I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, doctor. Any questions? No, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Our next presentation by Dr. Harshit Atul Kumar, Manipal College of Dental, Dental Science. Dr. Harshit. We move on to the next presentation by Dr. Chris Noor Timothy, Savita Dental College and Hospital. Dr. Chris.
Next presentation by Dr. Mohammad Arsar, Savita Dental College and Hospital. Dr. Mohammad. Dr. Mohammad. Next presentation by Dr. V. A. Murli Dharan, Savita Dental College and Hospital. Dr. Morali Daran. Dr. Morali Daran. Madam, sorry to interrupt. Can I? Yeah, yeah, sir. Name? I'm Karan Jain. Dr. Karan? Yes, ma'am. Your presentation on Hall D, sir. Hall D? Yes. So this is Hall? This is main hall. So um, how do I get in? We will assign you, sir. No problem. Okay, sir. Okay. Okay. Dr. V. Murli Dharan. Ma'am, may I present? Sorry? Uh, Swapna, may I present? I missed my session earlier. Okay. Will you able to start now, ma'am? Yes. Yes, please start now. Uh, the topic I'll be presenting on is widening the horizon of knowledge through clinical research and practice about the skeletal anchorage devices. Uh, in this study, what we had looked uh, forward to is to compare the intrazygomatic crest mini implants to the interradicular mini implant as a skeletal anchorage device, mainly in NMAS anterior retraction. For this purpose, we initially planned a finite element study. And we had also checked the traction and the bone response uh, in using an FPM study using different anterior retraction hook heights and different implants placed at the intrazygomatic crest and at the interradicular crest. So what we saw here is there was more intrusion tooth movement when the force passes below the center of resistance and more diseffective distal movement was seen in uh, both, there was no difference in the type of uh, bone response. So keeping this as the baseline, we have done a randomized control trial to compare the intrazygomatic crest implant to the interradicular mini implant in NMAS anterior retraction. So uh, the objective was to evaluate the uh, effectiveness of both the implants, to evaluate the type of tooth movement and the success rate of implants placed at these two sites and the soft tissue changes. So the null hypothesis was there will be no significant difference between the two types. Of... Uh, uh, there will be no difference in the both type of implant or null hypothesis. Our alternate was that there will be a different type of retraction or the type of tooth movement as well as success rate of implants. So this was a randomized control trial. It had got CTI registration as well as approval by the uh, review board of the college. And we had taken 11 sample per group. Our sample size was calculated based upon the article of uh, Badia et al. The inclusion criteria was any orthotic patient above 18 years of age and uh, within 35 years of age who required extraction 
in the upper arch and maximum anchorage who would require mini implant for an additional anchorage and a uh, patient with bimaxillary protrusion or even a uh, class 1 molar relationship to maintain and have a high anchorage. Any patient with uh, mixed dentition or missing teeth, systemic problems were excluded from the study. Uh, this was the consult flowchart for my RCT and these are my armamentarium. The interradicular mini implant was 1.6 into 10 mm and the infrasigmatic mini implant was 2 into 14 mm. So this is how the placement varied between the group A and B. So in group one, you see that the implant is placed at the infrasigmatic crest side and the second group, it was placed even more anteriorly. The group one, the implant is placed distal to the first molar whereas it comes between the second premolar and the first molar in group 2. And we try to keep the retraction hook height stable in all the patients. And the retraction hook was soldered uh, and kept to a height of 7 to 8 mm. So the, after the retraction was completed, these were the cephalometric landmarks we took into consideration to record the bone changes. The statistical analysis were pair T-test, independent test, and TAPA statistics. So here you would see the changes between the two groups, uh, that is infrasigmatic, and uh, in the changes between the T2 to T1, that is at the end of retraction and start of retraction. Same way for the interradicular at the end and start of retraction. So these were our findings. We can see that uh, significant findings was found for the S and A relation, meaning that the upper anterior teeth were efficiently retracted in the infrasigmatic, and the relationship of the upper incisor to the FH plane would be an indicator if there is any intrusion. So mild intrusion was actually observed in the infrasigmatic crest group. There was uh, no other significant findings that could be noted here. In the interradicular group, the upper to the FH plane, again, there was minimal intrusion, but not as much as the infrasigmatic group. And the SNA, there was uh, efficient retraction and reduction, but it, the values were not significant. This is comparing the implant in the intrasigmatic crest to that of the interradicular crest. Here we could see that there were, we got a significant p-value in the SNA, indicating that uh, there was efficient uh, or complete retraction of the anterior teeth, whereas uh, the significant difference in the upper anterior inclusion was not seen. We also took into consideration soft tissue changes, but because we only took in mild uh, cases of uh, dental proclination that could be corrected with extraction, there was no significant changes that we observed in the soft tissues. So the results of my study are in the infrasigmatic group, the SNA value, they had a significant p-value change of 0.004. The lower incisor angle, the post-retraction, there was mild change, which is again statistically significant. When it comes to linear proportion, uh, the upper incisor to the NA and the lower incisor to the NB. That uh, values also changed post-treatment and there was significant uh, reduction in the overjet indicating that all the anterior teeth were significantly retracted. Same way, the soft tissue nasolipal angle, which was acute due to proclination at the start of treatment, became more obtuse, but the soft tissue change was not statistically significant. Whereas the treatment changes in group, the interradicular implant group, showed that the SNA values, there was reduction, but no statistical significance. And uh, there was no intrusion of the incisors in the upper arch in comparison to the infrasigmatic arch. Comparing these two, the significant changes can be seen in the SNA, that is the upper anterior, upper arch incisors. And uh, the both the... Uh, type of implants, whether it is placed in the infrasigmatic crest or in the interradicular crest, or, uh, interradicular bone region, both were efficient in a skeletal anchorage and uh, there was no statistical significant difference in the soft tissue values and the PM were above 0 0.05. So, uh, the next thing is, in case of uh, orthodontic mini implant, not only as skeletal anchorage, but also for torque control and during retraction, it can be used. And if we use it in the intra, uh, infrasigmatic crest, we could to some extent prevent the deepening of the bite, which is a common side effect seen in the uh, retraction cases. So to conclude my study, I would say that this is the first study where they have uh, done a randomized control trial comparing infrasigmatic uh, mini implant with the interradicular mini implant. And there is no significant changes in the type of retraction, 
but intrazygomatic rest and interadical mini implant both can be used as efficient temporary anchorage devices and there was no mesial movement of the molar in both the groups that we found in superimpositions significant change in position could play an important role in how the upper incisor is responding so when you are placing it at a higher level there is prevention of the deepening of bite and the upper incisor mild intrusion effect is seen the soft tissue changes were significant post retraction but there is no statistical significant changes and considering mobility of the uh, implant as a failure we found that the, the intrazygomatic crest implants there was failure of mobility in some cases and 27% of the interradicular mini implant had failure during the retraction and we had go, had to go for replacement of the implants thank you any yeah, question yes, yes, thank you doctor any questions Any questions, Shashan sir? No, ma'am. Okay. We move on to the next presentation by Dr. Nandita R. Savita Dental College and Hospital. Dr. Nandita? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, please start your presentation. Yes, ma'am. Can you see my presentation, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. It's visible. Okay, uh, uh, this is Nadita from Savita Dental College and uh, my topic is about estimation of oral microbial flora during or orthodontic space closure. During orthodontic treatment, occurrence of white spot lesion are more prone. White spot lesion is nothing but the enamel subsurface porosity that present as white flaky spots which are translucent in appearance. In the present study, Streptococcus mutans and Lactobacillus were taken for colony count why? Because Streptococcus mutans initiates a white spot lesion and Lactobacillus progresses the lesion. The aim of the present study is to obtain an estimate of oral microbial flora present during orthodontic space closure. It is basically a pilot study which has been conducted for minimal uh, sample, uh, sample size without any control group. So the inclusion criteria are uh, full complement of uh, permanent dentition, extraction of premolar as a part of orthodontic treatment, uh, patient is undergoing orthodontic space closure, and PEA 0.022 MBT slot brackets uh, was used. PEA is nothing but the pre-adjustable edgewise appliance. Exclusion criteria is previous orthodontic treatment, history of habits, presence of uh, fluorosis, uh, gingival and periodontal problems, nutritional and uh, systemic uh, disorders. Uh, then collection of uh, specimen is uh, basically done by samples were uh, collected twice. First at six to eight months from the start of the treatment and again one to two months after the start of the space closure step. Why? Because during the retraction phase, that is uh, space closure step, Many auxiliaries will be used like e-chain or uh, springs, uh, which may cause more plaque accumulation. All the four quadrants were isolated with cotton rolls. Uh, uh, cotton rolls to avoid uh, saliva contamination before collecting the sample. The plaque samples were collected with the help of sterile cotton swabs. Swabs yeah. were collected yeah. at the end of, end of uh, leveling alignment phase and the start of the retraction phase. Uh, then it has been transferred immediately into the sterile tube containing 2 ml of brain heart infusion broth medium. The swab was in incubated at 37 degrees Celsius for 2 hours and after 2 hours, 10 mule of the broth was inoculated onto freshly prepared mutant sanguinous agar for the streptococcus mutants and MRS agar for lactobacillus isolation. The culture plates were then incubated at 37 degrees Celsius, uh, 24 hours for uh, Streptococcus mutants and 48 hours for uh, Lactobacillus respectively. Uh, bacterial growth was identified and evaluated directly as visible colonies in their respective agar plates. Then comes the statistical analysis. Uh, descriptive statistics were uh, used for data summarization. An independent t-test uh, t was done to determine the mean and the standard deviation between Streptococcus mutants and the lactobacillus at the four uh, evaluated sites. And the uh, conclusion for uh, present study is uh, this study showed that uh, during orthodontic space closure, uh, that is retraction phase, uh, bacterial count of uh, Streptococcus mutant showed a statistical uh, significant difference among the different site, uh, sites uh, as compared to the lactobacillus. Thank you, ma'am.
see what was the need of the study like uh, we can know about uh, we can uh, like know about the count of the bacteria which is causing the white spot lesion ma'am like to estimate but the... this is an established this is an established fact already that yes s mutants it increases during orthodontic treatment ah uh, yeah ma'am uh, like during retraction phase uh, the count uh, is higher as compared to the leveling phase ma'am so what should be done um uh, we can maintain uh, oral hygiene properly ma'am and also uh, okay thank you thank you ma'am thank you doctor our next presentation by dr preeti rajesh savita dental college and hospital uh, excuse me ma'am uh, this is dr murlidharan uh, okay. i have a question actually will i be able to do now or uh, shall i wait on second sir yeah thank you Doctor Murli Daran. Yeah, doctor. Yeah, sir. Please start your presentation, sir. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Is my screen visible? On second, doctor. Yeah. No. No, doctor. One second. Is it now visible? So uh, visible. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to one and all present here. I am Dr. V. M. Murthy from South Central College and Hospitals, and my topic is based on comparative assessment of reliability and accuracy of two different softwares used for model analysis. Now, what is the need for model analysis in order to achieve good finishing orthodontics? a uh, comprehensive diagnosis and treatment planning must be there this is achieved only based on orthodontic models these orthodontic models acts as a cornerstone in the armamentarium for classification of the malocclusion and formulation of the treatment plan <laughs> now plaster models were initially used for the uh, model analysis but due to the size the, due to the uh, damages which occurred like transportation and also like the large amount of effort used for making those models and storage space uh, makes it uh, more in inconvenient so in order to overcome this intraoral scanners have been introduced these intraoral scanners scan the teeth and underlying tissues and serve as an alternate to the plaster models and these have been a recent advancement in the, the in the department of orthodontics the commonly used or uh, softwares are orthoanalyzer cad and ortholab and orthoproof and digital models now these models scan the oral cavity and store the data into stl that is stereolithogramic format and this provides a easy storage and not any damage to the model transferring now now the main aim of the study is to comparison of the digital models with the manual model manual models and to assess the reliability of the two things which is more reliable now coming to the materials and methods we categorize the samples into three main group that is group 1 is using manual models group 2 using exocad software and group 3 is the ortho analyzer these two softwares are used in our department and now 20 pre treatment orthodontic models were collected and these are sent for scanning and the inclusion criteria are the intra premolar width which is measured intramolar width arch and bolton issue are measured and in order to check the accuracy and reliability we are using the following uh, statistical analysis to check the normality of normality of the data we use a shapirovich test reliability among the group within the group 1 group 2 and group 3 we use the cronberg alpha test and the references and the parameters across the three groups using one way and over and a post hoc for the statistical analysis these are the results which we got from the statistical analysis the various from come coming to discussion part the various parameters assessed using the three groups are subjected to the uh, following statistical analysis and the differences between individual groups studied using the 
post-hockey tests were not significant and the reliability of the intrapronal width and intramolar width and arch and was excellent. That is, it's greater than 0.9. And the anterior and overall bottom ratio was sliced between 0.5 to 0.8. What this result says is that these models, the accuracy and the reliability of the plaster models over digital models are same. And this proves that this can be used as a further analysis. And the main limitation of the study is the speed of the software just varies from time to time. And on also the usage, this must be carried out and this must be uh, rectified in the further development. Thank you. Any questions, ma'am? Do you think this sample size was sufficient for this conclusion? Uh, no, ma'am. The sample size, more, sample size would have been increased to a uh, sample size of 50 to 100, ma'am. But due to the less time we had, we have to proceed with this type of model, ma'am. Did you calculate the sample size? Yeah, ma'am. Just... 20 samples, ma'am. And in order to rectify, since the rela operative reliability is very crucial, we have to make the sample, we have to make the measurements twice, ma'am. So what was the power of the study? Ma'am? What was the power of the study? Power... Statistical power is 95%, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Next presentation by Dr. Tahura Taskin, L, Savita Dental College and Hospital. Dr. Tahura. Dr. Tahura. I think left. Okay. Next presentation by Dr. Nishita Rao Satwaji. Savita Dental College and Hospital. Dr. Nishita. Dr. Nishita. Hello. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Audible. Start your presentation, ma'am. Yes. Hello. Is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Visible. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Nishita and I'm here to present on prediction of proximal enamel thickness using interoral periapical radiographs. Interproximal tooth surface reduction is a procedure used during orthodontic treatment aimed to reduce the mesiodistal tooth size dimensions. This addresses lack of space, Bolton's tooth size discrepancy, correction of morphologic anomalies, tooth reshaping, and management of gingival papilla. Reliable measurements of tooth crown dimensions and enamel thickness would constitute a useful guide to the orthodontist during stripping procedure. Variations in proximal enamel thickness would have clinically significant ramifications in treatment planning. Thus, the aim of my study is to derive a correlation coefficient for prediction of the proximal enamel thickness using interoral periapical radiographs. This study involved patients subjected to orthodontic extraction of premolars. The inclusion criteria was completely erupted premolars with intact, undamaged crown structure. Restored teeth 
untreated, decayed, as well as hypoplastic teeth were excluded. Digital intraoral periopical radiographs of the teeth planned for extraction were taken using paralleling technique. 20 clinically sound bicuspids were considered for the study. The proximal and enamel thickness of both mesial and distal sites were measured. Analysis of the IOPS were uh, done using the analysis tool using CareStream imaging software. The extracted teeth were then sectioned along the greatest mesial distal width. The sectioned teeth were then viewed under a stereo microscope and proximal enamel thickness of the mesial and distal surfaces were measured along the heights of contour using image J analysis software. The results of my study showed that there exists a positive correlation between the proximal enamel thickness of the section T and of that measured from the intraoral periapical radiographs. It is pertinent to accurately determine the proximal enamel thickness. This could be most crucial in borderline cases which could be treated without extractions if the exact value of the proximal thickness can be determined. The mean values of the distal enamel thickness was found to be higher than the mesial enamel thickness. Regression analysis was done using IBM SPSS software and a correlation coefficient was established. I derived the formula where y is equal to 0.41 plus 0.69x, where y is the proximal enamel thickness of the section teeth and X is the proximal enamel thickness of measured on the IOPAs. With non-extraction treatment plans becoming uh, as a popular method to gain space, it is vital for the orthodontist to have greater clinical information on interproximal reduction and enamel thickness of such teeth. With this equation, it is possible to calculate the precise proximal enamel thickness of any teeth based on their uh, me thickness measured using IOPAs. Thank you. Any questions, doctor? No, thank you. Okay. Thank you. A next presentation by Shraddha Jadav, Aditya Dental College, B. Good afternoon, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, audible. Uh, today's my present. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Today's my presentation is on non pharmacological recommendations for orthodontic pain. Uh, for many patients undergoing a fixed appliance therapy, pain is common negative consequence. For 90% patient, orthodontic therapy is reported to be painful. It may be severe than uh, attributed to dental extraction and last for four to five days. Its intensity ranges from slight soreness when clenching to a constant throbbing pain. Fact factors affecting includes age, gender, degree of crowding, orthodontic treatment planning, history Where of... Where your screen, doctor? Your, Sorry, screen is, your screen is not visible. Oh, sorry. Is it visible, ma'am? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, should I start from beginning or... Current slide. No, it's okay. Continue. Um, factors affecting includes uh, age, gender, de degree of crowding, orthodontic treatment planning, history of recent oral surgery, other psychosocial factors, social culture, uh, social cultural and environmental factors. Pain um, reported to start at four hours and its peak level uh, occurs at twenty-four hours. Pain following orthodontic treatment is due to accumulation of ischemic edematous and inflammatory products like cytokines, uh, which include histamines, prostaglandin, encephaline, substance P, leukotrienes, etc. in the comp compressed periodontal ligament, which causes irritation of the nerve endings in the compressed periodontium, uh, re resulting in pain. 
stimulation of afferent a delta and c nerve fibers cause release of um, uh, causes hyperalgesia premature discontinuation of treatment was found in 12% of the orthodontic cases the uh, now uh, normally we have uh, methods of uh, pain control uh, which includes non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs uh, in that we have uh, choice uh, drug of choice for our ibuprofen aspirin and other form of mild analgesic but disadvantages of using the reduction of land uh, to use them so uh, we Uh, so we have non pharmacological aids to control pain which includes low uh, laser therapy vibratory stimulation transcutaneous elevation application of ice or cryotherapy use of white uh, bite wafers chewing gum acupuncture or acupressure advantages of using these avoids of chemical associated with nsaids because uh, we all know uh, nsaids interfere with um, tooth movement um, or orthodontics uh, this uh, is avoided by using these pharmacological aids and but it has disadvantage that post adjustment tooth pain is not systemically assessed uh, it includes first method is vibratory stimulation which includes uh, string of chewing plastic wafers according to profit pain can be reduced by low levels of force by stimulation as non invasive and non medicinal method of reducing pain dr powers uh, uh, this is the vibratory uh, stimulation apparatus dr powers first application um, he was the first to use land diastema cases elastin for this purpose a small body operated motor with two amplitude strings was coupled to a flexible detachable soft acrylic mount however the uh, um, disadvantage of this that we should uh, use this vibratory um, stimulator before the pain was even because of the manifested in uh, its uh, vibrate this vibratory effect did lead to amelioration uh, cause of orthodontic is pain is uh, and what this include uh, conclude is um, diminished blood supply and rounding issue and vibration apt to reestablish the supply and intercept the response then next method is that of bite for an avoidance of pain associated with initial orthodontic tooth movement according to profit pain reduced by repetitive chewing gum or uh, chewing of gum or plastic wafers during first eye hours after the as well as the life cell used blood flow through the compressed areas of the ligament is allowed by the temporary displacement any questions ma'am uh, wasn't it supposed to be a poster so one second ma'am yes ma'am it is pro poster presentation only yes ma'am it is poster presentation only fine uh, I, it was a paper presentation there sorry? may be presentation sorry i registered uh, sorry ma'am i have registered for paper presentation ma'am हेलो हेलो डॉक्टर शारदा हेलो डॉक्टर शारदा यस मैम 
Yes, ma'am. Uh, what's your problem, ma'am? Uh, is there any uh, issues? Ma'am, um, I have registered for paper presentation only. One second. I will uh, check with uh, Rajeshwari, ma'am, and let you know. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Meanwhile, we can move on with the next presentation. Yeah, ma'am. Okay, we move on to the next presentation by Dr. Ankita Komal Laba. Dr. Ankita? I would like to call uh, Dr. Shivani. Doctor, Doctor Harshit Atul Kumar, Doctor Harshit, Dr. Krishna is the move on. Dr. Muhammad Asad. Dr. Enal Bambri, can you hear my voice? Dr. Tahura Taske, are you ready with your presentation? Yes, ma'am. 
yes, Tabura, you can proceed with the presentation. We can start sharing your PPT and you can start. Thank you. Now, is my screen visible? Excuse me, ma'am. Is my screen visible? Yes, Tahura. Okay. Well, I'm, hello everyone. I'm El Tahura Teskin, doing my final year BBS in Savita Dental College. I'm here to present our research work on ATM technique, a novel radiographic technique to assess the position of the buccal shelf implant. You may wonder, what is this ATM technique? Basically, what are buccal shelf implant? Those are the bone screws. Bone screws are being revolutionized in such a way that we are using it in orthodontics nowadays because the envelope of discrepancies was under before with orthodontic treatment, but it has been tremendously improved because of the usage of these bone screws. So, Basically, the buccal shelf implants are being used in many indications like disimpaction of the impacted teeth or for retraction or en masse distalization, molar uprighting, intrusion and all. But this, this, the success of this buccal shelf implant depends on its proper placement. So basically, we go with many radiographic techniques to assess the placement of the buccal shelf implant like cone beam computed tomography or computed tomography and post anterior cephalogram or lateral cephalogram and all. But the uh, thing is, it has its own drawbacks like increased radiation exposure, metal artifact, less availability in dental office, and it to be more expensive. So because of which, we won't be able to assess the buccal shelf implant's position as soon as we place it. So that is why we are here to introduce a new technique called Arvind's transmandibular technique that aims to overcome this drawback by using an intraoral periapical radiograph film or the radio visiography sensor to assess the post-operative placement of the buccal shell implant. So basically, how does this technique work? We'll see that. So as you could see in this picture, the patient is asked to tilt his, uh, tilt his or her head towards the contralateral side of the buccal shelf implant in 20 to 30 degrees and the sensor is placed below the lower border of the mandible in about 20 degrees and then the x-ray tube is placed 80 to 90 degrees towards the sensor and the uh, buccal shelf implant which has been placed is assessed. So how did we come to it, uh, say that it, has, it is showing the accurate position of the implant? So basically the position of the implant is assessed with the relation of the adjacent molars. So we could see the buccal okay. surface or the molar root tips of the uh, adjacent tooth to that of the implant. So we correlated these IOPS with that of the gold standard CBCT images for the patients to whom we did this uh, buccal shelf implant. And we uh, found that the results, the accurate position as it showed in CBCT, the same thing was showed in IOP. The, we could easily find that it is in safe zone when it is about around four to five mm uh, away from that of the roots. So we could say that this IOPA can itself help us to detect the perfect uh, position of the implant. So this is how we found a new technique called Alvin's transmandibular technique, which could help us to assess the placed buccal shelf implant in chair side itself in a very simple and non-invasive way. And it has its own advantages like repeatability and easy availability in the chair side, and it's more cost effective and the uh, less radiation exposure is also found. So that is why we are, we are introducing this Arvind's transmandibular technique to overcome these drawbacks and to provide a better chair side technique to assess the placed buccal shelf implant. So this is a study done along with the guidance of our uh, professors and all. So I'm here to present this study, ma'am. This is the conclusion. Thank you. Doctor, you completed? Yes, ma'am. Yes, doctor. Any questions? No, ma'am. Okay, doctor. Next we Thank have you. next we have a video presentation by Dr. 
Shukalpal Kaur, Desh Bahad Dental College and Hospital. Topic is Nanotechnology in Dentistry. That means dwarf entity used to describe materials with molecular size in the range of 0 to 100 nanometer. And according to National Nanotechnology Initiative, nanotechnology is basically the manipulation of materials at nanoscale level that is size of less than 100 nanometer. It enables almost complete control of structure of matter at nanoscale dimensions. So, Nanotechnology provides us the ability to arrange atoms as we desire and to achieve effective, complete control of structure of matter. Now, there are various applications of this nanotechnology in our dentistry. The first is nanorobotic local anesthetics. Now, what is local anesthetic or LA? It is basically medication that causes absence of pain sensation in a particular location. A nanorobotic local anesthetic agent is composed of colloidal solution of activated nano-sized local anesthetic molecules. Then these molecules apply to gingival or oral mucosal tissue. They travel to pulp through epithelial and connective tissues and on reaching pulp they control over the nerve impulse traffic in that area. These nano robots are commanded to shut all neurosensory sensations to a particular tooth or multiple teeth as desired by the dentist. And after the completion of procedure, nano robots may again be signaled to restore the sensation. And these nano robotic local anesthetics provides greater patient comfort with minimal patient anxiety as they don't use any needle or syringe and they provide precise selectivity and controllability of the analgesic effect as well as the complete reversibility of the effect. They also avoid most of side effects and complications which usually occur in the conventional local anesthetic agents. Now next, next application is in the treatment of dental hypersensitivity. Hypersensitive teeth have 8 times higher surface density of dentinal tubules and large diameter than non-sensitive teeth. And for the treatment of this dental hypersensitivity, reconstructive dental nanorobots can be used. And these nanorobots could selectively and precisely occlude specific tubules within minutes. And thus they provide a fast and permanent treatment for dental hypersensitivity. Now next is nanorobotic dentifrice. Nanorobots delivered by dentifrice have bactericidal action against pathogenic bacteria. And these nanorobots doesn't hamper the growth of harmless oral bacteria. And these are invisible in size that is 1 to 10 micron and they crawl at speed of 1 to 10 microns per second and these nanorobots get deactivated themselves if the patient swallow them and these can identify and destroy pathogenic bacteria residing in the plaque and these nanorobots are able to reach surface inaccessible to toothbrush or floss and these devices would identify particles of food, plaque and tartar and lift these particles away from the surface of teeth. Thus these help in prevention of 
tooth decay and gingival disease so next is nanotechnology in restorative dentistry composites with nano fillers makes the dental composite material more translucent thus increasing their aesthetics and these nano fillers also increase the wear resistance of the composite material nano material sealer are also available that consist of nano sized particles of calcium silicate calcium hydroxide zirconia in addition to a thickening agent and these materials provide excellent seal dimensional stability excellent biocompatibility and excellent antimicrobial properties and now the role of nanotechnology in the orthodontic treatment during orthodontic treatment teeth are moved to a correct position in the dental arch and during this procedure the frictional forces are generated between the bracket and wire and this frictional force resists the tooth movement and to overcome this frictional force if we use heavy forces and then these heavy forces may cause loss of engrace and root resorption but coating of orthodontic wire with organic tungsten disulfide nanoparticles which provide excellent dry lubrication and also helps in reduction of friction and thus making the ortho treatment more effective as the study is continually going on in this field so it is believed that in future orthodontic nano robots can directly manipulate cementum periodontal tissues and alveolar bone and thus resulting in the rapid and painless tooth movement such as correction of irritation vertical position of teeth within minutes to hours thus making the orthodontic treatment more fast and painless now next is impression materials nano fillers are also integrated into the impression materials that results in better flow of the impression material improved hydrophilic properties of the impression material and also the enhanced reproduction of surface details no nano composite artificial teeth artificial composite teeth containing nano fillers are more superior to the conventional acrylic teeth in terms of surface smoothness abrasion resistance and color stability enhanced anti fungal property along with the increased fracture toughness is seen in the silver nano particle modified denser teeth no nano materials for the periodontal drug delivery system nano materials explored for the controlled drug delivery include nano tubes hollow spheres and core shell structure triclosan loaded nano particles were found to be effective in reducing periodontal inflammation microspheres containing tetracycline are also available and uh, which are known as acetin these are used for controlled drug delivery into the periodontal pockets an in vivo study observed that nano structure doxycycline gel preserves the periodontal surface from the experimentally induced periodontal disease in rats no next is application in implants the nano structured implant coatings are developed and there are three type of implant coatings the first is nano structured diamond coating and this coating improved the toughness of material it provides ultra high hardness low friction and also increases the good adhesion to the titanium alloys the second coating is hydroxy apatite implant coating which is manufactured using nano structured processing and this has been found to increase the osteoblastic activity in terms of its adhesion proliferation and mineralization and the third coating is nano structured metallostramic coating and this coating augments the osseointegration of the dental implants 
Now next is antimicrobial nanotherapy. Several nanoparticles like zinc oxide, silver, they have been incorporated into dental composites or dental adhesives to inhibit the bacterial growth. These nanoparticles inhibit the bacterial growth through several mechanisms. And these mechanisms include, first is disruption of bacterial cell membrane, next is inhibition of active transport and metabolism of sugars, and third is generation of reactive oxygen species, and next is disturbance of electron transportation across the bacterial cell membrane, and last is prevention of DNA replication. Now the safety issues uh, regarding to the nanotechnology, as the nanobiomaterial technology is extensively being used in healthcare services because of its various advantages. However, with increased use, concerns about the safety are also being raised. The main concern is the increased rate of absorption of nanomaterials in the human body. Nanoparticles have an increased surface area volume ratio which leads to increased absorption of these particles through the skin, lungs and digestive tract. And the non-biodegradable nanoparticles when accumulated within the body, they may be deposited in various organs of the body and they may lead to an unwanted reaction in the body. A study conducted by the Karolinska Institute revealed that iron oxide nanoparticles, they are non-toxic to the human lung epithelial cells but and also they cause no damage to the DNA. Next is zinc oxide nanoparticles, they have slight burst effect to the human tissues. Titanium dioxide nanoparticles, they cause DNA damage, carbon nanotubes, they cause DNA damage at low levels. Copper oxide nanoparticles, they were found to be highly toxic and were categorized as a health risk. So, uh, at the end we can say all the science of nanotechnology may appear as fiction in present time, but in future it holds strong promise for utilizing and maximizing this technology for the benefit of mankind. Nanotechnology will change dentistry, healthcare and human life greatly. However, at the same time, public acceptance of this nanotechnology, ethics, regulation and human safety will need to be addressed before molecular nanotechnology can enter the modern medical and dental armamentarium. Thank you and uh, I again uh, thank you for the uh, providing me in this platform to the organizing committee. Thank you again. Thank you, Doctor. Our ne next presentation by Dr. Harshit Atul Kumar, Manipal College of Dental Science. Mm -hmm. Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir, audible. Yeah, I'm going to present a poster on title uh, Need of the R, Upgradation of Dental Postgraduate Curriculum in India. This is actually a study, it's a questionnaire study done by me 
the objective of the study was knowledge attitude and practice towards orthodontic and endodontic interdisciplinary treatment approach among dental postgraduate students in india so what we did was we prepared a questionnaire of 15 questions with nine questions to assess the knowledge three questions to assess the attitude three questions to attest, uh, assess the practice based skills the questionnaire was validated and were distributed among the participants now the participants of the questionnaire where we divided them into two groups of 200 each total of 400 participants so each group constituted of 200 orthodontic pgs or the orthodontic pgs and other group consisted of 200 endodontic pgs so both the department pgs participated and the response was 100% and we made sure that we got 400 responses now the three tables on the slide on this slide are the results which uh, display knowledge knowledge uh, the results display the no knowledge based questions attitude based questions and the practice based questions the table in the center you can see the knowledge based questions out of all the, there are nine questions out of which most of the questions have a very low percentage of right answers the percentage which is indicating on the in the table are the percentage of respondents with right answers and less than less than 50 less than 25% of the uh, population uh, sample size managed to score more than 25% of the correct answers so uh, based on the knowledge we can say that the knowledge was comparatively less when com uh, compared to the attitude so when we look at the attitude of the uh, attitude of the participants the questions which we used to assess the uh, attitude are in the table below the attitude of the participants was really good with almost uh, close to 100% in two among uh, in the two questions and the other one was 89% so even though the attitude was good the knowledge was very poor when compared to the attitude now coming to the practice based questions the practice based questions were not uh, uh, the practice based questions were not very positive but neither negative it was more of a neutral response so when they were asked about the practice such the questions were uh, which were asked was if they had treated uh, orthodontic tooth uh, if they had treated patients with orthodontic tooth movement which uh, which which may undergo orthodontic or, or endodontic therapy the uh, the responses were in the neutral zone uh, mo most of them did agree to treating them but most of them did not even respond as well coming to the next practical based question was how long do you wait for the periapical healing actually this is a very uh, 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 borderline question with respect to the knowledge as well but since it's a clinical question we included it in the practice and the response was again 42% uh, next one was uh, about root resorption in uh, rheumatic tooth injuries so if uh, how do how the uh, participants manage the patients the responses were, was around 87% they were well aware of how to manage traumatic tooth injury uh, tooth injuries while undergoing orthodontic treatment so uh, overall the knowledge was reduced the attitude was good the practical based uh, questions were uh, neutrally answered so coming to the conclusion from the uh, above study we have concluded that participants displayed limited knowledge about the subject of study but the, po the the positive attitude towards it suggests that there is a need to enhance awareness and practical practice based skills by means of continuous dental education program for both the departments uh, of postgraduates and alternatively we can also suggest there is a need to upgrade the postgraduate dental curriculum in india such that interdepartmental clinical uh, clinical cases are given more importance so that they they can manage them well in their private practice or once they uh, graduate from a dental college thank you thank you doctor next we have a video presentation by dr uma maheshwari from savita dental college sorry to interrupt you uh, is there any uh, questions related to the previous presentation ma'am any uh, 
questions? Session chairs? No, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Thank you so much. A very good afternoon to one and all present here, respected chairperson and dear delegates of Fifth International Conference of Dentistry and Oral Health. It really gives me a great pleasure to share my research experience on innovative targeted local drug delivery system for management of potentially pre-malignant oral epithelial lesions. It is important to know the prevalence of epithelial precursor lesion. Globally, it is in the range of 1 to 5 percentage. Epithelial precursor lesions are now termed as potentially pre-malignant oral epithelial lesions, which has increased potential to turn into cancer. In which Indian scenario, the prevalence is even more higher, 13.7 percentage. And the most prevalent potentially pre-malignant disorder is oral submucous fibrosis associated with smokeless tobacco habit with the highest malignant transformation rate of 7% to 13%. And if it is associated with dysplasia, all potentially malignant disorder has highest malignant rate potential in the range of 36.4% if there is any association of dysplasia. This made me to th choose thrust area as oral potentially malignant disorder. And I wanted to aim on chemo prevention being an oral medicine specialist. And I found that the lacunae in the existing research is that there is no exclusive local drug delivery system for epithelial precursor lesions. Hence, I wanted to develop a mucohadesive buccal film why I had chosen mucoadhesive buccal film as a targeted drug delivery system or a local drug delivery system in my initial research period was that because it's a bilayered film technology with adheres to oral mucosa in five seconds and completely dissolves within 15 to 30 minutes. Rapid drug absorption designed to optimize delivery across the mucosa. Before even choosing the drug which I wanted to concentrate on targeted drug delivery, I did a systematic review and I found that there were a lot of studies on herbal preparations in topical therapeutics and management of potentially pellicular pre-disorders, like potentially precursor epithelial lesions, which are having increased malignant potential. And I found that based on my inclusion and exclusion criteria after searching the various databases like PubMed database, Cochrane, Science Direct, and Google Scholar, I found that there were 16 studies who had already studied various therapeutics in these potentially malignant disorders and i found that exclusively they had used gel preparations when compared to muco adhesive gel preparation and most of the lesions they had concentrated on local drug delivery systems among the potentially pre-malignant disorders were oral lichen planus followed by leukoplakia and oral submucous fibrosis was less studied comparatively and I also found that most of the gel was containing T-retinoin and most of the uh, assessment was effective in managing the pain or burning sensation followed by mouth opening in oral submucous fibrosis. Even in oral submucous fibrosis, there were a few studies where even shown improvement in tongue protrusion. This made me to identify the lacunae in the existing research in topical therapeutics for chemo prevention of potentially pre-malignant lesions, in which I found that there were six studies in Indian populations, and many studies were there in other areas also like USA, Thailand, and almost around 692 OPMD cases seen in these 16 clinical trials, where maximum number of cases were lichen planus followed by leukoplakia, and oral submucous fibrosis were studied in around 165 samples where they had mainly used aloe vera and curcumin. Similarly, what I found was that in raspberry gel, there was one study design with six months follow-up and 90% of complete response. All this made me to think that I have to incorporate these types of effective herbal preparations in my local drug delivery system. And the lacunae which I identified in the existing literature is that 
there were no exclusive drug delivery system for oral potentially malignant disorder and poly antioxidants were not available. Hence, the research question in my mind was lycopene, beta carotene, and curcumin as a combination. As a mucoadhesive film, is it effective in treatment of oral potentially malignant disorders? Because many of the oral potentially malignant disorders, around 16 to 65 percentage, definitely turned into oral squamous cell carcinoma, and there was no exclusive therapeutic for chemo prevention. This made me to think and aim in evaluating the effectiveness of lycopene, beta carotene, and curcumin as a combination as mucoadhesive film in treatment of OPMDs. And my objective is to see whether there is any reduction of burning sensation, whether the size of the lesion reduces after the topical application, the ease of the application, any adverse side effects pertaining to this mucoadhesive film, and about the chemo prevention nature. It was an interventional study, including the patients with proper ethical clearance. Around 30 OPMD cases were reported in the Department of Oral Medicine in Savita Dental College. Inclusion criteria were the most prevalent oral potentially malignant disorders, including submucous fibrosis, leukoplakia, lichen planus, especially the erosive lichen planus. And patients were willing for biopsy both at the baseline and at the end of the treatment. Patients who were not willing for biopsy were not included in the clinical trial. Various grades of oral submucous fibrosis, except the grade five, because which is turned into carcinoma patients were not taken, whereas patients which are potentially pre-malignant, either with no or mild dysplasia were taken into consideration. So based on the mouth opening, as the mouth opening decreases, it is graded from one to four. So all four grades were chosen for the clinical trial. Similarly, all four stages of leukoplakia based on the size of the lesion as well as the dysplastic state, there are different stages of leukoplakia. So all stage one to four were included in the clinical trial. Erosive lichen planus, which causes gingival manifestation as gingival desquamation as well as reticular lichen planus with areas of erosions were all included in the clinical trial. The pre-assessment was VAS score using for assessing the pain or burning sensation, mouth opening in millimeters, size of the lesion as well as the dysplastic status was evaluated. Individual proforma was prepared in which all the demographic details, the tobacco history, the clinical examination, the size of the lesion as well as the VAS score, histopathological diagnosis, mouth opening in millimeters were all recorded in every visit starting from the baseline to the sixth visit and especially any adverse reactions like discomfort, dysphagia, burning sensation, ulceration, altered taste sensation, if at all present any, were also recorded. And coming to the methodology of mucoadhesive film containing various antioxidants such as beta carotene, lycopene and curcumin, which is the active pharmacological ingredient of my mucoadhesive film. And these are the different components which are important for formulating these mucoadhesive film. Moving on to the methodology, a polymeric solution blend was prepared by ethyl cellulose. And finally, it is dissolved in ethanol as well as hydroxymethyl cellulose was added to this alcoholic solution, stirred, sonicated, plasticizer was added, 10 milligram of drug was dispersed in 5 ml of ethanol and again sonicated. Finally, the film was poured into a plastic Petri dish cut and packed in an aluminum foil like this. The composition was 1 is to 2 is to 2, lycopene, beta carotene, and curcumin. It was subjected to various physiochemical evaluations such as thickness, determination of drug content, weight uniformity, pH, folding, endurance, as well as the swelling index. And most important is in vitro drug release test to see how far the mucoadhesive film adheres to the oral potentially malignant disorder. These are the various 30 patients, demographic data, including their tobacco history. Mainly they were PAN and MAVA users as well as there were smoking and smokeless tobacco users for more than starting from five years to 20 years. And there were lesions of oral submucous fibrosis, oral submucous fibrosis with leukoplakia or isolated cases of oral leukoplakia and patients who do not have habit but who had erosive oral lichen planus were also included in the clinical trial. The majority of patients were oral submucous fibrosis 
and patients with no dysplasia to mild dysplasia was included in the clinical trial. The patient was well explained about the mucoadhesive film placement at the baseline visit. And following the applications, each visit, this, these were the post assessment tools which we had recorded, the outcome measures, namely the pain assessment using VAS score, the size of the lesion, as well as the mouth opening was measured using metric measurements and the dysplastic status also following the treatment. So mainly we were looking for clinical reduction in size as well as whether there is any improvement in the histopathological grading. VAS score showed very good improvement compared to other outcome parameters between baseline and after three months. Next to VAS score, the size of the lesion also, there were significant reduction when compared to baseline. Similarly, mouth opening in oral submucous fibrosis patients showed significant improvement when compared to the other formulations here in this particular clinical trial, we found that the mouth opening was even more effective and there was a significant improvement. These were the few cases, which were a case of an erosive lichen planus. Where can, you can see the size of the lesion is completely reduced at three months. Similarly, the size as well as the erythema has been reduced. A case of oral submucous fibrosis where mouth opening from 34 millimeter improvement was there following 28 millimeter before treatment. The vascularity of the lesion also, you can see that the in buccal mucosa has improvised after using this mucoadhesive film. So what's next? After the mucoadhesive film, I wanted to involve an in situ gel formulation. When compared to mucoadhesive film, in situ gel has more adherence capacity and hence the chemo prevention can be even more effective than the mucoadhesive film. So this made me to expand my research in formulating Dulacy aloe vera turmeric in situ gel formulation. And this was prepared with the one gram of Dulacy aloe vera and turmeric mixed with 100 ml of distilled water and boiled for 15 minutes. Antioxidant property was checked with DPPHSA. Antimicrobial activity was checked against Candida, Streptococcus, Lactobacillus, Staphylococcus. Antioxidant property was also checked and the antimicrobial activity was maximum with the zone of inhibition in streptococcus mutants. This made my research to even more expand using another combination as I found in systematic review that raspberry showed 90% of complete response when compared to other herbal preparations. And lycopene is found to be effective as per systematic review in treatment of oral potentially malignant disorder. So I wanted to mix both lycopene raspberry as a multioxidant preparation and it was in the range of 10 percentage lycopene and 25 percentage raspberry they were also subjected to anti-inflammatory antioxidant prop cytotoxicity using brine shrimp lethal assay and it was found that it was not cytotoxic spectrophotometric analysis for antioxidant property was tested just like other preparations using dppHSA and it also found that there was a significant antimicrobial activity against streptococcus mutants. I would like to end my presentation thanking my own Savita University for giving me the platform to continue research in such patients with the aim of chemo prevention, which would be really beneficial in arresting the malignant transformation rate of potentially malignant disorders. So as oral medicine specialist, it is a sole responsibility for identifying, diagnosing the early dysplastic changes as well as and preventing the malignant transformation in these potentially malignant disorder using various herbal rich, antioxidant rich herbal formulations. I thank the organizers for giving me a chance to share my research experience. I thank my mentor, Dr. Nyanasundram, and my department for always being supportive. Our last uh, person is Doctor. Our last presentation by Doctor Preeti Rajesh, Savita Dental College and Hospital. Uh, 
Uh, am I audible? Yes, Doctor, audible. Okay, I'll answer. Is anything visible on the screen? Yes, Doctor, visible. Can you see the poster? I I can't see anything. I'm I'm sorry. I'm having some difficulty. Is the poster seen? On second. Yes, doctor. Visible. You can Agent see. No. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm very sorry for the delay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Preeti Rajesh. But from uh, now Bhutan. your uh, poster is not visible. Okay. Is it visible now? No, doctor. Yes, now visible. Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Preeti Rajesh. I'm an intern from Savita Rental College, and I'll be presenting to you my topic in orthodontics called uh, "Compare Scanning Accuracy of Two Intraoral Scanners." So basically, we're using Medit and Trio scanner. The we had a very small sample size since it was a limited, uh, short period study, and the sample size was seven. Uh, basically, I'm going to talk about the accuracy between the two scanners in measuring the dimension of the brackets which we use in orthodontics. And I've used Gemini 3M Unitech brackets. And the scanners that uh, we used after bonding the brackets are basically Medit and Trios. Uh, I divided them into three control study groups, one using Vernier caliper to manually measure the bracket, and the other two are Medit and Trios scanner. So the 3D images of the uh, brackets were measured using ortho analyzer software. And the tests that we use in the statistics was one way ANOVA and uh, post hoc uh, to key. So basically the measurement areas for the bracket that we consider into the study is mesiodistal for the upper and lower and occlusal gingival for mesial and distal. The hooks, uh, the hooks of the canine and uh, premolar brackets were also included for the accuracy of the dimension. And uh, after using the scanner to measure the brackets, it was transferred to the ortho analyzer software, which was then later converted into STL files. So basically three teeth in each quadrant was considered, which means six brackets in each arch, uh, which is the central incisor, canine and premolar. So um, the advantages of using these scanners was that it reduces the discomfort of the patient in compared to the model plasters. And it also aids the practitioners in fabricating um, the surgical splint that best fit, uh, that are the best fit, fit possible. So basically in this study, we uh, using descriptive statistics, um, the, it was uh, found that there was significant difference among the three control groups. ANOVA with the post hoc test showed that TRIO's three shape showed a significant difference when compared to the other groups. And for scanning, uh, for complete arch scanning, TRIO's again showed greater significance. And uh, MEDIT, however, showed no uh, significance. And uh, I'm talking about the uh, mean statistics using SPSS software to compare the, uh, the accuracy. So after a point, it was found out that uh, Medit presented higher uh, accuracy and a better production of bracket, uh, better quality in bracket production compared to, uh, compared to TRIOS. However, TRIOS showed better accuracy for implant scanning bodies, but not when it comes to production of orthodontic brackets. So the conclusion of my uh, topic is that Medit was a better intraoral scanner, especially in scanning the tooth surfaces with ortho orthodontic brackets. Thank you. Doctor, you completed? Yes, ma'am, done. Okay. Uh, any questions, doctor? Session chairs, any questions? No, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Okay, thank you everyone for listening. On behalf of the Asia Pacific Association for Dental and Oral Health, Apadento, would like to express my gratitude to Apadento President, all speakers and the presenters for their presence and contribution for making this conference more informative and interesting. 
Asia Pacific Association for Dental and Oral Health extends our sincere gratitude to our speakers and participants to take out time for their busy schedule to grace their event. Certificate downloading procedure will be given in the chat box. Kindly check it out. Also, you will be getting the official email regarding the guidelines for the certificate downloading process. Once again, I thank you all the participants and our session, session chairs. Thank you all. Excuse me, ma'am. Yes. Uh, Do Dr. Kalpana, this side. I'm supposed to present e-poster. On second, doctor. It's pediatric sleep apnea. On second, doctor, I will check and let you know. Sure, ma'am. Dr. Kalpana? Yes, ma'am. Uh, actually, your presentation is on a hall E, ma'am. The presentation also got over and the session chair and the moderator also have winded up the sessions. But ma'am, I'm supposed to present at 5 o'clock. I don't know. Like, I have joined before, only 10 minutes before. Uh, no, they have called your name many times because uh, since uh, few participants were... Uh, unable to join due to network issue uh, we were going uh, out of time the as per agenda we didn't go so little Number 15 to 20 minutes it was our gate ma'am so so only yeah ma'am uh, can you give your presentation here yes yes ma'am hall within uh, two to three minutes because everyone yes 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 yeah, I will because the session chair also was way okay okay ma'am okay yeah. i will wind up in two minutes yes ma'am yeah you can give your presentation yeah yes yeah thank you ma'am thank you so much yeah. ma'am can you see my screen Ma'am, my screen is visible? Yes, doctor. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Kalpana Somani, third year pedo student from uh, <coughs> sorry, Surendra Dental College, Sri Ganganagar. Today, I am presenting e-poster and my topic of presentation is pediatric sleep apnea from the pedonautic perspective. Pediatric sleep apnea, it is a sleep-related breathing disorder in which upper airway obstruction leads to disruption in sleep pattern. The prevalence of pediatric sleep apnea is around 2% and unfortunately, 80% patients are undiagnosed. So we, as a pedodontist, have responsibility to our society to educate the parents about this disease. Now we come to the morbidities. The morbidities uh, associated with pediatric sleep apnea are daytime sleepiness, depression, neurological diseases, diabetes, hypertension, cardiac ailments, and sometimes it leads to death. Etiology or causes are main cause is craniofacial abnormalities like retrognathic mandible, adenotonsillar hypertrophy, which generally happens between two to eight years of ages, Neuromuscular diseases like cerebral palsy, obesity, which is more common in adult sleep apnea. Now we come to the symptoms. Symptoms are different from the adult sleep apnea. As in pediatric sleep apnea, behavioral disturbances are more common, ADHD or irritability, morning headache, 
frequent bathroom visits, restless sleeping, gas pen choking, and snoring. Now, the detailed case history and clinical examination, along with lateral CEPH and CBCT, is very uh, is required to reach the diagnosis. Apart from that, polysomnography is the choice of uh, choice of investigation in which AHI index has been taken. Now we come to the pathophysiology. Because of the airway obstruction, episodic hypoxia and intermittent hypercapnia leads to endothelial damage, which further leads to inflammatory marker uh, uh, they also raised and which causes sleep fragmentation. Now we come to the treatment. It starts from conservative to surgical, uh, uh, change in sleep posture, oral appliance therapy in retrognathic mandible, adenotonsillectomy in the enlarged uh, adenoids and tonsils, which has to be done only at the age of 12 years or more, weight loss in obese patient, and CPAP, which is uh, continuous uh, positive airway pressure. This is the uh, uh, case uh, of a 12-year boy who had the history of snoring. We took lateral CEF and we got to know the airway restriction and the retrognathic, for the retrognathic mandible, we have given him modified pin block for around nine to 12 months. You can see in the post-treatment picture, the facial profile has been uh, straight from convex and the airway spaces has also been increased. It has been seen that these oral appliances helps around 70% to help in this pediatric sleep apnea. So it should be a multidisciplinary approach. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, ma'am. Doctor, you completed? Yes, ma'am. Yes, Thank doctor. you. Thank you, doctor. Again, I thank you all the participants. Um, and the certificate downloading procedure uh, will be given in the chat box. You can check it out. And also, uh, it will be sent to your uh, official mail ID. Once again, I thank you everyone for joining today. Have a great day.
मैम हेलो हेलो हेलो
हेलो मैम 